The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 4, Terror, Chapter 1, Charlotte Corday. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 4, Chapter 1, Charlotte Corday. In the leafy months of June and July, several French departments germinate a set of rebellious paper leaves named proclamations, resolutions, journals or diurnals of the Union for Resistance to Oppression. In particular, the town of Cayenne in Calvados sees its paper leaf of Bulletin de Cayenne suddenly bud, suddenly establish itself as newspaper there, under the editorship of Girondin National Representatives. For among the proscribed Girondins are certain of a more desperate humour. Some, as Verniot, Valasse, Jean Sonnet, arrested in their own houses, will await with stoical resignation what the issue may be. Some, as Brissot, Rabot, will take to flight, to concealment, which, as the Paris barriers are opened again in a day or two, is not yet difficult. But others there are who will rush with Buzo to Calvados, or far over France to Lyon, Toulon, Nantes and elsewhere, and then rendezvous at Cayenne, to awaken as with war trumpet the respectable departments and strike down an anarchic mountain faction, at least not yield without a stroke at it. Of this latter temper we count some score or more of the arrested and of the not yet arrested. Abuzo, Ababaru, Louve, Guade, Pétion, who have escaped from arrestment in their own homes, a Sal, a Pythagorean Valadi, a Duchatel, the Duchatel that came in blanket and nightcap to vote for the life of Louis, who have escaped from danger and likelihood of arrestment. These, to the number at one time of twenty seven, do accordingly lodge here, at the intendance or departmental mansion of the town of Cayenne welcomed by persons in authority, welcomed and defrayed, having no money of their own. And the bulletin de Cayenne comes forth with the most animating paragraphs, how the Bordeaux department, the Lyon department, this department after the other, is declaring itself, sixty or, say, sixty-nine or seventy-two respectable departments, either declaring or ready to declare. Nay, Marseille, it seems, will march on Paris by itself if need be. So has Marseille town said that she will march. But on the other hand, that Montelimar town has said no thoroughfare and means even to bury herself under her own stone and mortar first, of this be no mention in Bulletin of Cayenne. Such animating paragraphs we read in this newspaper, and fervours and eloquent sarcasm, tirades against the mountain, frame pen of deputy Salles, which resemble, say friends, Pascal's provincials. What is more to the purpose, the Girondins have got a general-in-chief, one Wimfren, formerly under Dumouriez, also a secondary questionable General Puisset and others, and are doing their best to raise a force for war. National volunteers, whosoever is of right heart, gather in ye national volunteers, friends of liberty, from our Calvados township, from the Eure, from Brittany, from far and near, forward to Paris and extinguish anarchy. Thus at Cayenne, in the early July days, there is a drumming and parading, a perorating and consulting, staff and army, council, club of carabos, anti-Jacobin friends of freedom, to denounce atrocious Marat with all which and the editing of bulletins a national representative has his hands full. At Cayenne it is most animated, and, as one hopes, more or less animated in the seventy-two departments that adhere to us. And in a France begirt with Sumerian invading coalitions and torn with an internal la vendée, this is the conclusion we have arrived at, to put down anarchy by civil war. Durum et durum, the proverb says, non faciunt murum. La vende burns, Santerre can do nothing there. He may return home and brew beer. 
Sumerian bombshells fly all along the north. That siege of Mentz has become famed. Lovers of the picturesque, as Goethe will testify, washed country people of both sexes stroll thither on Sundays to see the artillery work and counterwork. You only duck a little while the shot whizzes past. Condé is capitulating to the Austrians. Royal Highness of York, these several weeks, fiercely batters Valenciennes. For alas, our fortified camp of Fermat was stormed. General Dampierre was killed. General Castine was blamed. And indeed is now come to Paris to give explanations. Against all which the mountain and atrocious Marat must even make head as they can. They, anarchic convention as they are, Publish decrees, expostulatory, explanatory, yet not without severity. They ray forth commissioners, singly or in pairs, the olive branch in one hand, yet the sword in the other. Commissioners come even to Cayenne, but without effect. Mathematical rom and prieur named of the Cote d'Or, venturing thither with their olive and sword, are packed into prison. There may rom lie under lock and key for fifty days, and meditate his new calendar if he please. Samaria and civil war, never was republic one and indivisible at a lower ebb amid which dim ferment of Cayenne and the world, history specially notices one thing. In the lobby of the mansion de l'intendance, where busy deputies are coming and going, a young lady with an aged valet, taking grave, graceful leave of Deputy Barbaroux. She is of stately Norman figure, in her twenty-fifth year, of beautiful, still countenance. Her name is Charlotte Corday, heretofore star d'Amont, while nobility still was. Barbaroux has given her a note to Deputy Dupere, him who once drew his sword in the effervescence. Apparently she will to Paris on some errand. She was a Republican before the Revolution and never wanted energy. A completeness, a decision is in this fair female figure. By energy she means the spirit that will prompt one to sacrifice himself for his country. What if she, this fair young Charlotte, had emerged from her secluded stillness suddenly like a star, cruel lovely, with half-angelic, half-demonic splendour, to gleam for a moment, and in a moment be extinguished, to be held in memory, so bright complete was she, through long centuries. Quitting Sumerian coalitions without, and the dim-simmering twenty-five millions within, history will look fixedly at this one fair apparition of a Charlotte Corday, will note whither Charlotte moves, how the little life burns forth so radiant, then vanishes, swallowed of the night. With Barbaroux's note of introduction and slight stock of luggage, we see Charlotte, on Tuesday the 9th of July, seated in the Cayenne Diligence, with a place for Paris. None takes farewell of her, wishes her good journey. Her father will find a line left, signifying that she has gone to England, that he must pardon her and forget her. The drowsy diligence lumbers along amid drowsy talk of politics and praise of the mountain in which she mingles not, all night, all day, and again all night. On Thursday, not long before noon, we are at the bridge of Neuilly. Here is Paris with her thousand black domes, the goal and purpose of thy journey. Arrived at the Inn de la Providence in the Rue de Vieux Augustin, Charlotte demands a room hastens to bed, sleeps all afternoon and night till the morrow morning. On the morrow morning she delivers her note to Dupere. It relates to certain family papers which are in the Minister of the Interior's hand, which a nun at Cayenne, an old convent friend of Charlotte's, has need of, which Dupere shall assist her in getting. This, then, was Charlotte's errand to Paris? She has finished this in the course of Friday, yet says nothing of returning. She has seen and silently investigated several things. The convention in bodily reality she has seen, what the mountain is like. The living physiognomy of Marat she could not see, he is sick at present and confined to home. At eight on the Saturday morning she purchases a large sheath knife in the Palais Royal. 
then straightway in the Place des Victoires takes a hackney coach to the Rue de la Colle de Médecine, number 44. It is the residence of the Citoyen Marat. The Citoyen Marat is ill and cannot be seen, which seems to disappoint her much. Her business is with Marat, then? Hapless, beautiful Charlotte, hapless, squalid Marat. From Cayenne in the utmost west, from Neuchâtel in the utmost east, they two are drawing nigh each other. They two have, very strangely, business together. Charlotte, returning to her inn, dispatches a short note to Marat, signifying that she is from Cayenne, the seat of rebellion, that she desires earnestly to see him, and will put it in his power to do France a great service. No answer. Charlotte writes another note, still more pressing, sets out with it by coach about seven in the evening herself. Tired day labourers have again finished their week. Huge Paris is circling and simmering, manifold according to its vague want. This one fair figure has decision in it, drives straight towards a purpose. It is yellow July evening, we say, the 13th of the month, eve of the Bastille day, when Monsieur Marat, four years ago, in the crowd of the Pont Neuf, shrewdly required of that Bessonval hussar party, which had such friendly dispositions, to dismount and give up their arms then, and became notable among patriot men. Four years. What a road he has travelled and sits now, about half-past seven of the clock, stewing in slipper-bath, sore afflicted, ill of revolution fever, and of what other malady this history had rather not name. Excessively sick and worn, poor man, with precisely eleven pence halfpenny of ready money in paper, with slipper-bath, strong three-footed stool for writing on, the while, and a squalid washerwoman, one may call her, that is his civic establishment in Medical School Street, thither and not elsewhere has his road led him. Not to the reign of brotherhood and perfect felicity, yet surely on the way towards that, Hark, a rap again, a musical woman's voice refusing to be rejected. It is the citoyenne who would do France a service. Marat, recognising from within, cries, Admit her! Charlotte Corday is admitted. Citoyen Marat, I am from Cayenne, the seat of rebellion, and wish to speak with you. Be seated, mon enfant. Now what are the traitors doing at Cayenne? What deputies are at Cayenne? Charlotte names some deputies. Their head shall fall within a fortnight, croaks the eager people's friend, clutching his tablet to write. Barbaro, Pétion, writes he with bare shrunk arm, turning aside in the bath. Pétion and Louvet, and Charlotte has drawn her knife from the sheath, plunges it with one sure stroke into the writer's heart. A moi, cher ami, help, dear! No more could the death-choked say or shriek. The helpful washerwoman running in, there is no friend of the people or friend of the washerwoman left, but his life with a groan gushes out, indignant to the shades below. And so Marat, people's friend, is ended. The lone Stalites has got hurled down suddenly from his pillar. Witherward, he that made him, does know. Patriot Paris may sound triple and tenfold in dole and wail, re-echoed by Patriot France and the Convention. Chabot, pale with terror, declaring that they are to be all assassinated, may decree him pantheon honours, public funeral, Mirabeau's dust making way for him, and Jacobin societies in lamentable oratory, summing up his character, parallel him to one whom they think it honour to call the good sans culotte whom we name not here. Also a chapel may be made for the urn that holds his heart in the Place du Carousel, and newborn children be named Marat, and Lago de Como hawkers bake mountains of stucco into unbeautiful busts, and David paint his picture or death scene, and such other apotheosis take place as the human genius in these circumstances can devise. But Marat returns no more to the light of this sun. One sole circumstance we have read with clear sympathy in the old Moniteur newspaper. 
Almara's brother comes from Neuchâtel to ask of the convention that the deceased Jean-Paul Marat's musket be given him. For Marat too had a brother and natural affections, and was wrapped once in swaddling clothes and kept safe in a cradle like the rest of us. Ye children of men, a sister of his, they say, lives still to this day in Paris. As for Charlotte Corday, her work is accomplished, the recompense of it is near and sure. The cher ami and neighbours of the house flying at her, she overturns some movables, entrenches herself till the gendarmes arrive, then quietly surrenders, goes quietly to the Abbey prison, she alone quiet, or Paris sounding in wonder, in rage or admiration round her. Dupere is put in arrest on account of her, his papers sealed, which may lead to consequences. Fauchet in like manner, though Fauchet had not so much as heard of her. Charlotte, confronted with these two deputies, praises the grave firmness of Dupere, censures the dejection of Fauchet. On Wednesday morning, the thronged Palais de Justice and Revolutionary Tribunal can see her face, beautiful and calm. She dates it, fourth day of the preparation of peace. A strange murmur ran through the hall at sight of her. You could not say of what character. Tanville has his indictments and tape papers. The cutler of the Palais Royal will testify that he sold her the sheath knife. All these details are needless, interrupted Charlotte. It is I that killed Marat. By whose instigation? By no one's. What tempted you then? His crimes. I killed one man, added she, raising her voice extremely, extrêmement, as they went on with their questions. I killed one man to save a hundred thousand, a villain to save innocence, a savage wild beast to give repose to my country. I was a republican before the revolution. I never wanted energy. There is therefore nothing to be said. The public gaze is astonished. The hasty limners sketch her features, Charlotte not disapproving. The men of law proceed with their formalities. The doom is death as a murderess. To her advocate she gives thanks, in gentle phrase, in high-flown classical spirit. To the priest they send her she gives thanks, but needs not any shriving or ghostly or other aid from him. On this same evening, therefore, at half-past seven o'clock, from the gate of the concierge to a city all on tiptoe, the fatal cart issues. Seated on it, a fair young creature, sheeted in red smock of murderess, so beautiful, serene, so full of life, journeying towards death, alone amid the world. Many take off their hats, saluting reverently, for what heart but must be touched? Others growl and howl. Adam Lux of Mentz declares that she is greater than Brutus, that it were beautiful to die with her. The head of this young man seems turned. At the Place de la Révolution, the countenance of Charlotte wears the same still smile. The executioners proceed to bind her feet. She resists, thinking it meant as an insult. On a word of explanation, she submits with cheerful apology. As the last act, all being now ready, they take the neckerchief from her neck. A blush of maidenly shame overspreads that fair face and neck. The cheeks were still tinged with it when the executioner lifted the severed head to show it to the people. It is most true, says Foster, that he struck the cheek insultingly, for I saw it with my eyes. The police imprisoned him for it. In this manner have the beautifulest and the squalidest come in collision and extinguished one another. Jean-Paul Marat and Marie-Anne Charlotte Corday both suddenly are no more. Day of the preparation of peace. Alas, how are peace possible or preparable while, for example, the hearts of lovely maidens in their convent stillness are dreaming not of love paradises and the light of life, but of codrous sacrifices and death well earned? The twenty-five million hearts have got to such temper. This is the anarchy. The soul of it lies in this. Whereof not peace can be the embodiment. The death of Marat, wetting old animosities tenfold, will be worse than any life. 
O ye hapless two, mutually extinctive, the beautiful and the squalid, sleep ye well in the mother's bosom that bore you both. This was the history of Charlotte Corday, most definite, most complete, angelic, demonic, like a star. Adam Lux goes home, half delirious, to pour forth his apotheosis of her in paper and print, to propose that she have a statue with this inscription, greater than Brutus. Friends represent his danger. Lux is reckless, thinks it were beautiful to die with her. End of Book 4, Chapter 1《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 4, Terror, Chapter 2, In Civil War. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book 4, Chapter 2, In Civil War. But during these same hours, another guillotine is at work on another. Charlotte, for the Girondins, dies at Paris today. Chalier, by the Girondins, dies at Lyon tomorrow. From rumbling of cannon along the streets of that city, it has come to firing of them, to rabid fighting. Nievre Chol and the Girondins triumph, behind whom there is, as everywhere, a royalist faction waiting to strike in. Trouble enough at Lyon, and the dominant party carrying it with a high hand. For indeed the whole South is astir, incarcerating Jacobins, arming for Girondins. Wherefore we have got a Congress of Lyon, also a Revolutionary Tribunal of Lyon, and anarchists shall tremble. So Chalier was soon found guilty of Jacobinism, of murderous plot, a dress with drawn dagger on the 6th of February last, and on the morrow he also travels his final road, along the streets of Lyon, by the side of an ecclesiastic with whom he seems to speak earnestly, the axe now glittering high. He could weep in old years, this man, and fall on his knees on the pavement, blessing heaven at sight of federation programs or like. Then he pilgrimed to Paris to worship Marat and the mountain. Now Marat and he are both gone. We said he could not end well. Jacobinism groans inwardly at Lyon, but dare not outwardly. Chalier, when the tribunal sentenced him, made answer, My death will cost this city dear. Montelimar town is not buried under its ruins, yet Marseille is actually marching under order of a Lyon congress, is incarcerating patriots, the very royalists now showing face against which a General Carteau fights, though in small force, and with him an artillery major of the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. This Napoleon, to prove that the Marseillaise have no chance, ultimately, not only fights, but writes, publishes his Supper of Beaucaire, a dialogue which has become curious. Unfortunate cities with their actions and their reactions violence to be paid with violence in geometrical ratio, royalism and anarchism both striking in, the final net amount of which geometrical series what man shall sum. The bar of iron has never yet floated in Marseille's harbour, but the body of Rebecca was found floating, self-drowned there. Hot Rebecca, seeing how confusion deepened and respectability grew poisoned with royalism, felt that there was no refuge for a republican but death. Rebecca disappeared, no one knew whither, till one morning they found the empty case or body of him risen to the top, tumbling on the salt waves, and perceived that Rebecca had withdrawn forever. Toulon, likewise, is incarcerating patriots, sending delegates to Congress, intriguing in case of necessity with the Royalists and English. Montpellier, Bordeaux, Nantes, all France that is not under the swoop of Austria and Samaria seems rushing into madness and suicidal ruin. The mountain labours, like a volcano in a burning volcanic land, Convention committees of surety, of salvation, are busy night and day. Convention commissioners whirl on all highways, bearing olive branch and sword, or now perhaps sword only. 
Chomet and municipals come daily to the Tuileries demanding a constitution. It is some weeks now since he resolved in town hall that a deputation should go every day and demand a constitution till one were got, whereby suicidal France might rally and pacify itself, a thing inexpressibly desirable. This, then, is the fruit your anti-anarchic Girondins have got from that levying of war in Calvados? This fruit, we may say, and no other whatsoever. For indeed, before either Charlotte's or Chalier's head had fallen, the Calvados war itself had, as it were, vanished, dreamlike, in a shriek. With seventy-two departments on one side, one might have hoped better things. But it turns out that respectabilities, though they will vote, will not fight. Possession is always nine points in law, but in lawsuits of this kind one may say it is ninety and nine points. Men do what they will want to do, and have immense irresolution and inertia. They obey him who has the symbols that claim obedience. Consider what in modern society this one fact means. The metropolis is with our enemies. Metropolis, mother city, rightly so named, all the rest are but as her children, her nurslings. Why, there is not a leathern diligence with its post-bags and luggage boots that lumbers out from her, but is as a huge life pulse. She is the heart of all. Cut short that one leathern diligence. How much is cut short? General Wimfen, looking practically into the matter, can see nothing for it but that one should fall back on royalism, get into communication with Pitt. Dark innuendos he flings out to that effect, whereat we Girondins start horror-struck. He produces, as his second-in-command, a certain ci devant, one Comte Puisset, entirely unknown to Louvet, greatly suspected by him. Few wars, accordingly, were ever levied of a more insufficient character than this of Calvados. He that is curious in such things may read the details of it in the memoirs of that same ci devant Pissuay, the much-enduring man and royalist. How our Girondin national forces, marching off with plenty of wind music, were drawn out about the old chateau of Brecourt in the wood country near Vernon to meet the mountain national forces advancing from Paris. How on the 15th afternoon of July they did meet and, as it were, shrieked mutually and took mutually to flight without loss. How we say thereafter, for the mountain nationals fled first, and we thought ourselves the victors, was roused from his warm bed in the castle of Brecourt, and had to gallop without boots, our nationals in the night watches having fallen unexpectedly into Sauve-Quipo, and in brief the Calvados war had burnt priming, and the only question now was whether would to vanish, in what hole to hide oneself. The national volunteers rush homewards faster than they came. The seventy-two respectable departments, says Mayan, all turned round and forsook us in the space of four and twenty hours. Unhappy those who, as at Lyon, for instance, had gone too far for turning. One morning we find placarded on our intendant's mansion the decree of convention which casts us hors la loi into outlawry placarded by our Cain magistrates, clear hint that we also are to vanish. Vanish indeed, but whither would? Gossard has friends in Rennes, he will hide there, unhappily he will not lie hid. Guadet, Langevinet are on crossroads making for Bordeaux. To Bordeaux, cries the general voice, of valour alike and of despair. Some flag of respectability still floats there, or is thought to float. Thitherward, therefore, each as he can. Eleven of these ill-fated deputies, among whom we may count as twelfth friend Riouf, the man of letters, do an original thing. Take the uniform of national volunteers and retreat southward with the Breton battalion as private soldiers of that corps. These brave Bretons had stood truer by us than any other. Nevertheless, at the end of a day or two, they also do now get dubious, self-divided. We must part from them, and with some half-dozen as convoy or guide, retreat by ourselves, a solitary marching detachment through waste regions of the West. 
End of Book 4, Chapter 2《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3 — The Guillotine Book 4 — Terror Chapter 3 — Retreat of the Eleven This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 4 — Chapter 3 — Retreat of the Eleven It is one of the notablest retreats, this of the Eleven, that history presents — the handful of forlorn legislators retreating there continually with shouldered firelock and well-filled cartridge box in the yellow autumn, long hundreds of miles between them and Bordeaux, the country all getting hostile, suspicious of the truth, simmering and buzzing on all sides more and more. Louvet has preserved the itinerary of it, a piece worth all the rest he ever wrote. O oh, virtuous Pétion with thy early white head, O oh, brave young Barbaroux, has it come to this? Weary ways, worn shoes, light purse, encompassed with perils as with a sea, revolutionary committees are in every township of Jacobin temper, our friends all cowed, our cause the losing one. In the borough of Montcourt, by ill chance, it is market day. To the gaping public, such transit of a solitary marching detachment is suspicious. We have need of energy, of promptitude and luck to be allowed to march through. Hasten ye, weary pilgrims, the country is getting up. Noise of you is bruited day after day. A solitary twelve retreating in this mysterious manner. With every new day, a wider wave of inquisitive pursuing tumult is stirred up till the whole west will be in motion. Cussy is tormented with gout. Buzo is too fat for marching. Lyuf, blistered, bleeding, marching only on tiptoe, Barbaru limps with sprained ankle, yet ever cheery, full of hope and valour. Light Louvet glances hair-eyed, not hair-hearted, only virtuous Pétion's serenity was but once seen ruffled. They lie in straw lofts, in woody brakes, rudest palace on the floor of a secret friend is luxury, they are seized in the dead of night by Jacobin mares and tap of drum, get off by firm countenance, rattle of muskets and ready wit. Of Bordeaux, through fiery La Vendée and the long geographical spaces that remain, it were madness to think, well, if you can get to Camper on the sea coast and take shipping there, faster, ever faster, before the end of the march, so hot as the country grown, it is found advisable to march all night. They do it under the still night canopy. They plod along, and yet, behold, rumour has outplodded them. In the paltry village of Carhay, be its thatched huts and bottomless peat bogs long notable to the traveller, one is astonished to find light still glimmering. Citizens are awake with rushlights burning. In that nook of the terrestrial planet, as we traverse swiftly the one poor street, a voice is heard saying, There they are, les voilà qui passent. Swifter, ye doomed lame twelve, speed ere they can arm, gain the woods of camper before day, and lie squatted there. The doomed twelve do it, though with difficulty, with loss of road, with peril, and the mistakes of a night. In camper are Girondin friends, who perhaps will harbour the homeless till a Bordeaux ship way. Way-worn, heart-worn, in agony of suspense, till camper friendship get warning, they lie there, squatted under the thick, wet boskage, suspicious of the face of man. Some pity to the brave, to the unhappy. Unhappiest of all legislators, oh, when ye packed your luggage some score or two score months ago, and mounted this or the other leathern vehicle to be conscript fathers of a regenerated France, and reap deathless laurels, did ye think your journey was to lead hither? The camp of Samaritans find them squatted, lift them up to help and comfort, will hide them in sure places. Thence let them dissipate gradually, or there they can lie quiet and write memoirs till a Bordeaux ship sail. And thus, in Calvados, all is dissipated. Rom is out of prison, meditating his calendar. Ringleaders are locked in his room. 
At Cayenne, the Corday family mourns in silence. Buzo's house is a heap of dust and demolition, and amid the rubbish sticks a gallows with this inscription, Here dwelt the traitor Buzo, who conspired against the Republic. Buzo and the other vanished deputies are hors la loi, as we saw, their lives free to take where they can be found. The worse fares it with the poor arrested visible deputies at Paris. Arrestment at home threatens to become confinement in the Luxembourg to end where? For example, what pale-visaged thin man is this journeying towards Switzerland as a merchant of Neuchâtel whom they arrest in the town of Moulin? To Revolutionary Committee he is suspect. To Revolutionary Committee, on probing the matter, he is evidently Deputy Brissot. Back to thy arrest, mon poor Brissot, or indeed to straight confinement, whither others are fed to follow. Rabot has built himself a false partition in a friend's house, lives in invisible darkness between two walls. It will end this same arrestment business in prison and the revolutionary tribunal. Nor must we forget Dupere and the seal put on his papers by reason of Charlotte. One paper is there fit to breed woe enough, a secret, solemn protest against that supreme dies of the 2nd of June. This secret protest our poor Dupere had drawn up the same week, in all plainness of speech, waiting the time for publishing it, to which secret protest his signature, and that of other honourable deputies, not a few, stands legibly appended. And now, if the seals were once broken, the mountain still victorious? Such protesters, your Merciers, Bayeux, seventy-three by the tail, what yet remains of respectable Girondism in the Convention may tremble to think these are the fruits of levying civil war. Also we find that in these last days of July the famed siege of Mentz is finished, the garrison to march out with honours of war, not to serve against the coalition for a year. Lovers of the picturesque and Goethe standing on the chaussee of Mentz saw with due interest the procession issuing forth in all solemnity. Escorted by Prussian horse came first the French garrison. Nothing could look stranger than this latter. A column of Marseillaise, slight, swarthy, parti-coloured, in patched clothes, come tripping on, as if King Edwin had opened the dwarf hill and sent out his nimble host of dwarfs. Next followed regular troops, serious, sullen, not as if downcast or ashamed. But the remarkablest appearance which struck everyone was that of the chasers, chasseurs. Coming out mounted, they had advanced quite silent to where we stood when their band struck up the Marseillaise. This revolutionary te diem has in itself something mournful and bodeful, however briskly played, but at present they gave it in altogether slow time, proportionate to the creeping step they rode at. It was piercing and fearful, and a most serious-looking thing, as these cavaliers, long, lean men of a certain age, with mien suitable to the music, came pacing on, Singly you might have likened them to Don Quixote. In mass they were highly dignified. But now a single troop became notable, that of the commissioners or representants. Merlin of Thionville, in hussar uniform, distinguishing himself by wild beard and look, had another person in similar costume on his left. The crowd shouted out with rage at sight of this latter the name of a Jacobin townsman and clubist, and shook itself to seize him. Merlin drew bridle, referred to his dignity as French representative, to the vengeance that should follow any injury done. He would advise everyone to compose himself, for this was not the last time they would see him here. Thus rode Merlin, threatening in defeat. But what now shall stem that tide of Prussians setting in through the open northeast? Lucky of fortified lines of Wassenberg and impassibilities of Vosges mountains confine it to French Alsace, keep it from submerging the very heart of the country. Furthermore, precisely in the same days, Valenciennes siege is finished in the northwest, fallen under the red hail of York. Condé fell some fortnight since. Sumerian coalition presses on. 
What seems very notable too on all these captured French towns, there flies not the royalist fleur-de-lis in the name of a new Louis the Pretender, but the Austrian flag flies, as if Austria meant to keep them for herself. Perhaps General Castine, still in Paris, can give some explanation of the fall of these strong places. Mother Society, from tribune and gallery, growls loud that he ought to do it, remarks, however, in a splenetic manner that the messieurs of the Palais Royal are calling long life to this general. The Mother Society, purged now by successive scrutinies or épuration from all taint of Girondism, has become a great authority, what we can call shield-bearer or bottle-holder, nay, call it Fugelman, to the purged national convention itself. The Jacobins' debates are reported in the Moniteur, like parliamentary ones. End of Book 4, Chapter 3《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 4, Terror Chapter 4, Own Nature This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 4, Chapter 4, Own Nature But looking more specially into Paris City, what is this that history on the 10th of August, year 1 of Liberty, by old style, year 1793, discerns there? Praised be the heavens, a new feast of pikes. For Chaumette's deputation every day has worked out its result, a constitution. It was one of the rapidest constitutions ever put together, made, some say, in eight days, by Hero Seychelles and others, probably a workmanlike, roadworthy constitution enough, on which point, however, we are, for some reason, little call to form a judgment. Workmanlike or not, The 44,000 communes of France, by overwhelming majorities, did hasten to accept it, glad of any constitution whatsoever. Nay, departmental deputies have come, the venerablest republicans of each department, with solemn message of acceptance, and now what remains but that our new, final constitution be proclaimed and sworn to in Feast of Pikes. The departmental deputies, we say, are come some time ago, Chaumette very anxious about them, lest Girondin Monsieur's Asio jobbers, or were it even fille de joie of a Girondin temper, corrupt their morals. 10th of August, the immortal anniversary, greater almost than Bastille July, is the day. Painter David has not been idle. Thanks to David and the French genius, there steps forth into the sunlight this day a scenic phantasmagory, unexampled, whereof history, so occupied with real phantasmagories, will say but little. For one thing, history can notice with satisfaction on the ruins of the Bastille, a statue of nature, gigantic, spouting water from her two mamelles. Not a dream, this, but a fact, palpable, visible. There she spouts, great nature, dim before daybreak. But as the coming sun ruddies the east, come countless multitudes, regulated and unregulated, come departmental deputies, come mother society and daughters, comes national convention led on by handsome arrow, soft wind music breathing note of expectation. Lo, as great Sol scatters his first fire handful, tipping the hills and chimney heads with gold, Ero is at great nature's feet. She is plaster of Paris, merely. Ero lifts in an iron saucer water spouted from the sacred breasts, drinks of it with an eloquent pagan prayer, beginning, O nature! And all the departmental deputies drink, each with what best suitable ejaculation or prophetic utterance is in him, amid breathings which become blasts of wind music and the roar of artillery and human throats, finishing well the first act of this solemnity. 
Next are processionings along the boulevards, deputies or officials bound together by long, indivisible, tricolour ribbon, general members of the sovereign walking pell-mell with pikes, with hammers, with the tools and emblems of their crafts, among which we notice a plough, and ancient Borcus and Philemon seated on it, drawn by their children, many-voiced harmony and dissonance filling the air. Through triumphal arches enough, at the basis of the first of which we descry, whom thinkest thou? The heroines of the insurrection of women. Strong dames of the market, they sit there, Teronya too ill to attend, one fears, with oak branches, trickle of bedizzlement, firm seated on their cannons. To whom handsome hero, making pause of admiration, addresses soothing eloquence, whereupon they rise and fall into the march. And now, Mark, in the Place de la Révolution, what other august statue may this be veiled in canvas, which swiftly we shear off by pulley and cord? The Statue of Liberty! She too is of plaster, hoping to become of metal, stands where a tyrant Louis Cairns once stood. Three thousand birds are let loose into the whole world with labels round their necks. We are free, imitate us. Holocaust of royalist and ci devant trumpery, such as one could still gather, is burnt. Pontifical eloquence must be uttered by a handsome arrow and pagan orisons offered up. And then, forward across the river, where is new enormous statuary, enormous plaster mountain, Hercules purpler, with uplifted all-conquering club, many-headed dragon of Girondin federalism rising from fettered marsh, needing new eloquence from Hero, to say nothing of Jean de Mars and Fatherland's altar there with urn of slain defenders, carpenter's level of the law, and such exploding, gesticulating and perorating that Hero's lips must be growing white and his tongue cleaving to the roof of his mouth. Toward six o'clock, let the wearied president, let Paris patriotism generally, sit down to what repast and social repast can be had, and with flowing tankard or light mantling glass, usher in this new and newest era. In fact, is not Rom's new calendar getting ready? On all housetops flicker little trickle of flags, their flagstaff a pike and liberty cap. On all house walls, for no patriot not suspect will be behind another, there stands printed these words, Republic one and indivisible, liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. As to the new calendar, we may say here rather than elsewhere that speculative men have long been struck with the inequalities and incongruities of the old calendar, that a new one has long been as good as determined on. Maréchal the atheist almost ten years ago proposed a new calendar, free at least from superstition. This the Paris municipality would now adopt in defect of a better. At all events, let us have either this of Maréchal's or a better, the new era being come. Petitions more than once have been sent to that effect, and indeed for a year past all public bodies, journalists and patriots in general have dated a first year of the Republic. It is a subject not without difficulties, but the Convention has taken it up, and Ram, as we say, has been meditating it. Not Maréchal's new calendar, but a better new one of Rom's and our own. Rom, aided by Amange, Lagrange and others, furnishes mathematics, Fabre d'Eglantine furnishes poetic nomenclature, and so on the 5th of October 1793, after trouble enough, they bring forth this new republican calendar of theirs in a complete state, and by law get it put in action. Four equal seasons, twelve equal months of thirty days each, this makes three hundred and sixty days, and five odd days remain to be disposed of. The five odd days we will make festivals, and name the five sans colotides, or days without breaches. Festival of genius, festival of labour, of actions, of rewards, of opinion, these are the five sans colotides whereby the great circle or year is made complete. Solely every fourth year, while I'm called leap year, we introduce a sixth sans colotide and name it Festival of the Revolution. 
Now, as to the day of commencement, which offers difficulties, is it not one of the luckiest coincidences that the Republic herself commenced on the 21st of September, close to the vernal equinox? Vernal equinox at midnight for the meridian of Paris in the year Wylam Christian 1792, from that moment shall the new era reckon itself to begin. Vendemier, Brumier, Frimier, or as one might say in mixed English, Vintagerius, Foggerius, Frostarius. These are our three autumn months. Nivos, Pluvios, Ventos, or say Snowus, Rainus, Windus, make our winter season. Germinal, Florial, Prairial, or Buddle, Floral, Meadowal, are our spring season. Mesidor, Termidor, Fructidor, that is to say, door being Greek for gift, Reapidor, Heatidor, Fructidor, are Republican summer. These twelve, in a singular manner, divide the Republican year. Then, as to minuter subdivisions, let us venture at once on a bold stroke. Adopt your decimal subdivision, and instead of world-old week or senite, make it a tenite or decade, not without results. There are three decades, then, in each of the months, which is very regular, and the decadi, or tenth day, shall always be the day of rest, and the Christian Sabbath, in that case, shall shift for itself. This, in brief, is this new calendar of Rome and the Convention, calculated for the meridian of Paris and Gospel of Jean-Jacques, not one of the least afflicting occurrences for the actual British reader of French history, confusing the soul with messidors, medowals, till at last in self-defence one is forced to construct some ground scheme or rule of commutation from new style to old style and have it lying by him. Such ground scheme, almost worn out in our service, but still legible and printable, we shall now in a note present to the reader. For the ROM calendar, in so many newspapers, memoirs, public acts, has stamped itself deep into that section of time, a new era that lasts some twelve years and odd, and is not to be despised. Let the reader, therefore, with such ground scheme, help himself where needful, out of new style into old style, called also slave style, style esclave, whereof we in these pages shall, as much as possible, use the latter only. Thus, with new feast of pikes and new era or new calendar, did France accept her new constitution, the most democratic constitution ever committed to paper. How it will work in practice? Patriot deputations from time to time solicit fruition of it, that it be set a-going. Always, however, this seems questionable, and for the moment unsuitable. Till in some weeks, Salut Public, through the organ of Saint-Just, makes report that, in the present alarming circumstances, the state of France is revolutionary, that her government must be revolutionary till the peace. Solely as paper, then, and as a hope, must this poor new constitution exist, in which shape we may conceive it lying, even now, with an infinity of other things in that limbo near the moon. Further than paper it never got, nor ever will get. End of Book 4, Chapter 4《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 4, Terror, Chapter 5, Sword of Sharpness. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 4, Chapter 5, Sword of Sharpness. In fact, it is something quite other than paper theorems. It is iron and audacity that France now needs. Is not La Vendée still blazing? Alas, too literally, rogue Rossignol burning the very corn mills. General Santerre could do nothing there. General Rossignol, in blind fury, often in liquor, can do less than nothing. Rebellion spreads, grows even madder. Happily those lean, quixotic figures whom we saw retreating out of Mentz, bound not to serve against the coalition for a year, have got to Paris. 
National Convention packs them into post vehicles and conveyances, sends them swiftly by post into La Vendée. There, valiantly struggling in obscure battle and skirmish under rogue Rossignol, let them, unlaurelled, save the Republic and be cut down gradually to the last man. Does not the coalition like a fire tide pour in, Prussia through the opened northeast, Austria, England through the northwest? General Houchard prospers no better there than General Castine did. Let him look to it. Through the eastern and the western Pyrenees, Spain has deployed itself, spreads rustling with Bourbon banners over the face of the south. Ashes and embers of confused Girondin civil war covered that region already. Marseille is damped down, not quenched, to be quenched in blood. Too long, terror-struck, too far gone for turning, has flung itself, ye righteous powers, into the hands of the English. On Toulon Arsenal there flies a flag, nay, not even the fleur-de-lis of a Louis pretender, there flies that accursed St. George's Cross of the English and Admiral Hood. What remnants of sea craft, arsenals, roperies, war navy France had, has given itself to these enemies of human nature, enemy du genre humain. Beleaguer it, bombard it, ye commissioners, Barra, Freron, Robespierre, Jr., thou General Carteau, General Dugommier, above all, thou remarkable artillery major, Napoleon Bonaparte. Hood is fortifying himself, victualling himself, means apparently to make a new Gibraltar of it. But lo, in the autumn night, late night, among the last of August, what sudden red sun blaze is this that has risen over Lyon City with a noise to deafen the world? It is the powder tower of Lyon, nay, the arsenal with four powder towers, which has caught fire in the bombardment and sprung into the air, carrying a hundred and seventeen houses after it. With a light one fancies as of the noon sun, with a roar second only to the last trumpet. All living sleepers far and wide it has awakened. What a sight was that which the eye of history saw in the sudden nocturnal sun blaze. The roofs of hapless Leon and all its domes and steeples made momentarily clear, Rhone and Saon streams flashing suddenly visible, and height and hollow, hamlet and smooth stubble field and all the regions round, heights, alas, all scarped and counter-scarped into trenches, curtains, redoubts, blue artillery men, little powder devilkins plying their hell trade there through the not ambrosial night. Let the darkness cover it again, for it pains the eye. Of a truth, Chalier's death is costing this city dear. Convention commissioners, Lyon congresses have come and gone, and action there was, and reaction, bad ever growing worse, till it has come to this, Commissioner dubois Crance, with 70,000 men and all the artillery of several provinces, bombarding Lyon day and night. Worse things still are in store. Famine is in Lyon, and ruin, and fire. Desperate are the sallies of the besieged. Brave Pracy, their national colonel and commandant, doing what is in man, desperate but ineffectual. Provisions cut off, nothing entering our city but shot and shells. The arsenal has roared aloft, the very hospital will be battered down, and the sick buried alive. A black flag hung on this latter noble edifice, appealing to the pity of the besiegers, for though maddened, were they not still our brethren? In their blind wrath they took it for a flag of defiance, and aimed thitherward the more. Bad is growing ever worse here, and how will the worst stop till it have grown worst of all? Commissioner Dubois will listen to no pleading, to no speech, save this only, we surrender at discretion. Lyon contains in it subdued Jacobins, dominant Girondins, secret royalists. And now mere deaf madness and cannon shot enveloping them, will not the desperate municipality fly at last into the arms of royalism itself? Majesty of Sardinia was to bring help, but it failed. Emigrant Ottichamp, in the name of the two pretender royal highnesses, is coming through Switzerland with help, coming, not yet come. Paresi hoists the fleur-de-lis. 
at sight of which all true Girondins sorrowfully fling down their arms. Let our trickler brethren storm us then, and slay us in their wrath. With you we conquer not. The famishing women and children are sent forth. Deaf Dubois sends them back, reigns in mere fire and madness. Our redoubts of cotton bags are taken, retaken. Precy under his fleur-de-lis is valiant as despair. What will become of Lyon? It is a siege of seventy days. Or see, in these same weeks, far in the western waters, breasting through the Bay of Biscay, a greasy, dingy little merchant ship with Scotch skipper under hatches whereof sit disconsolate, the last forlorn nucleus of Girondism, the deputies from Camper. Several have dissipated themselves whithersoever they could. Boreoff fell into the talons of Revolutionary Committee and Paris Prison. The rest sit here under hatches, Reverend Pétion with his grey hair, angry Buzo, suspicious Louvet, brave young Barbaru and others. They have escaped from Campo in this sad craft, are now tacking and struggling in danger from the waves, in danger from the English, in still worse danger from the French, banished by heaven and earth to the greasy belly of this Scotch skipper's merchant vessel, unfruitful Atlantic raving round. They are for Bordeaux, if peradventure hope yet linger there. Enter not Bordeaux, old friends. Bloody convention representatives, Dalian and such like, with their edicts, with their guillotine, have arrived there. Respectability is driven underground. Jacobinism lords it on high. From that Réol landing place, or beak of Ombe, as it were, pale death waving his revolutionary sword of sharpness waves you elsewhither. On one side or the other of that beck d'ambe, the Scotch skipper with difficulty moors, a dexterous greasy man, with difficulty lands his Girondins, who, after reconnoitring, must rapidly burrow in the earth. And so, in subterranean ways, in friends' back closets, in cellars, barn lofts, in caves of Saint-Emilion and Le Bourne, stave off cruel death. Unhappiest of all senators. End of Book 4, Chapter 5《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 4, Terror Chapter 6, Risen Against Tyrants This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 4, Chapter 6, Risen Against Tyrants Against all which incalculable impediments, horrors and disasters, what can a Jacobin convention oppose? The uncalculating spirit of Jacobinism and sanscalotic sense formulistic frenzy. Our enemies press in on us, says Danton, but they shall not conquer us. We will burn France to ashes, rather. Nous brûlerons la France. Committees of sûreté or salut have raised themselves à la hauteur to the height of circumstances. Let all mortals raise themselves à la hauteur. Let the 44,000 sections and their revolutionary committees stir every fibre of the Republic and every Frenchman feel that he is to do or die. They are the life circulation of Jacobinism, these sections and committees. Danton, through the organ of Barère and Salut Public, gets decreed that there be in Paris, by law, two meetings of section weekly. Also, that the poorer citizen be paid for attending and have his day's wages of forty sous. This is the celebrated law of the forty sous, fiercely stimulant to sanscolotism, to the life circulation of Jacobinism. On the 23rd of August, Committee of Public Salvation, as usual, through Barère, had promulgated, in words not unworthy of remembering, their report, which is soon made into law, of levy in mass. All France, and whatsoever it contains of men or resources, is put under requisition, says Barère, really in Tertaian words, the best we know of his. The Republic is one vast besieged city, 250 forges shall in these days be set up in the Luxembourg garden and round the outer wall of the Tuileries to make gun barrels in sight of earth and heaven. 
from all hamlets towards their departmental town, from all their departmental towns towards the appointed camp and seat of war, the sons of freedom shall march. Their banner is to bear le peuple français debout contre les tyrans, the French people risen against tyrants. The young men shall go to the battle. It is their task to conquer. The married men shall forge arms, transport baggage and artillery, provide subsistence. The women shall work at soldiers' clothes, make tents, serve in the hospitals. The children shall scrape old linen into surgeon's lint. The aged men shall have themselves carried into public places and there, by their words, excite the courage of the young, preach hatred to kings and unity to the republic. Tatayan words which tingle through all French hearts. In this humour, then, since no other serves, will France rush against its enemies, headlong, reckoning no cost or consequence, heeding no law or rule, but that supreme law, salvation of the people. The weapons are all the iron that is in France. The strength is that of all the men, women and children that are in France. There, in their 250 shed smithies in Garden of Luxembourg or Tuileries, let them forge gun barrels in sight of heaven and earth. Nor with heroic daring against the foreign folk and black vengeance against the domestic be wanting. Life circulation of the revolutionary committees being quickened by that law of the forty sous, Deputy Merlin, not the Thionville whom we saw ride out of Mentz, but Merlin of Douai, named subsequently Merlin Suspect, comes about a week after with his world-famous Law of the Suspect, ordering all sections by their committees instantly to arrest all persons suspect and explaining with all who the arrestable and suspect especially are. Are suspect, says he, all who by their actions, by their connections, speakings, writings have, in short, become suspect. Nay, Chaumet, illuminating the matter still further in his municipal placards and proclamations, will bring it about that you may almost recognise a suspect on the streets and clutch him there, off to committee and prison. Watch well your words, watch well your looks, if suspect of nothing else you may grow, as came to be a saying, suspect of being suspect. For are we not in a state of revolution? No frightful a law ever ruled in a nation of men. All prisons and house of arrest in French land are getting crowded to the ridge tile. Forty-four thousand committees, like as many companies of reapers or gleaners, gleaning France, are gathering their harvest and storing it in these houses. Harvest of aristocrat tares, nay, lest the forty-four thousand each on its own harvest field prove insufficient, we are to have an ambulant revolutionary army, six thousand strong, under right captains. This shall perambulate the country at large and strike in wherever it finds such harvest work slack. So have municipality and mother society petitioned, so has convention decreed. Let aristocrats, federalists, messieurs vanish, and all men tremble. The soil of liberty shall be purged with a vengeance. Neither hitherto has the revolutionary tribunal been keeping holiday. Blanchelande for losing Saint Domingo, conspirators of Orléans for assassinating, for assaulting the sacred deputy Léon Baudin, these with many nameless to whom life was sweet, have died. Daily the great guillotine has its due. Like a black spectre, daily at eventide glides the death tumbrel through the variegated throng of things. The variegated street shudders at it for the moment, next moment forgets it. The aristocrats, they were guilty against the Republic. Their death, were it only that their goods are confiscated, will be useful to the Republic. Vive la République! In the last days of August fell a notable ahead, General Custine's. Custine was accused of harshness, of unskilfulness, perfidiousness, accused of many things, found guilty, we may say, of one thing, unsuccessfulness. Hearing his unexpected sentence, Custine fell down before the crucifix, silent for the space of two hours. 
He fared with moist eyes and a book of prayer toward the Place de la Révolution, glanced upward at the clear, suspended axe, then mounted swiftly aloft, swiftly was struck away from the lists of the living. He had fought in America. He was a proud, brave man, and his fortune led him hither. On the second of this same month, at three in the morning, a vehicle rolled off with closed blinds from the temple of the conciergerie. Within it were two municipals and Marie Antoinette, once Queen of France. There, in that conciergerie, in ignominious, dreary cell, she, cut off from children, kindred, friend and hope, sits long weeks, expecting when the end will be. The guillotine, we find, gets always a quicker motion as other things are quickening. The guillotine, by its speed of going, will give index of the general velocity of the Republic. The clanking of its huge axe, rising and falling there, in horrid systole, diastole, is portion of the whole enormous life movement and pulsation of the sense collotic system. Orléans conspirators and assaulters had to die, in spite of much weeping and entreating, so sacred is the person of a deputy. Yet the sacred can become desecrated. Your very deputy is not greater than the guillotine. Poor deputy journalist Gorsa, we saw him hide at Rennes when the Calvados war burnt priming. He stole afterwards in August to Paris, lurked several weeks about the Palais Cidivant Royal, was seen there one day, was clutched, identified, and, without ceremony, being already out of the law, was sent to the Place de la Révolution. He died recommending his wife and children to the pity of the Republic. It is the ninth day of October, 1793. Gossard is the first deputy that dies on the scaffold. He will not be the last. Ex-Mayor Bailly is in prison. Ex-Procureur Manuel. Brissot and our poor arrested Girondins have become incarcerated, indicted Girondins, universal Jacobinism clamouring for their punishment. Dupere's seals are broken. Those 73 secret protesters suddenly one day are reported upon, are decreed accused, the convention doors being previously shut that none implicated might escape. They were marched in a very rough manner to prison that evening. Happy those of them who chanced to be absent. Condorcet has vanished into darkness, perhaps like Rabot sits between two walls in the house of a friend. End of Book 4, Chapter 6《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 4, Terror Chapter 7, Marie Antoinette This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 4, Chapter 7, Marie Antoinette on Monday, the 14th of October, 1793, a cause is pending in the Palais de Justice, in the new revolutionary court, such as these old stone walls never witnessed, the trial of Marie Antoinette. The once brightest of queens, now tarnished, defaced, forsaken, stands here at Fouquier Tenville's judgment bar, answering for her life. The indictment was delivered her last night, to such changes of human fortune, what words are adequate? Silence alone is adequate. There are few printed things one meets with of such tragic, almost ghastly significance as those bald pages of the Bulletin du Tribunal Révolutionnaire which bear title Trial of the Widow Capé. Dim, dim, as if in disastrous eclipse like the pale kingdoms of Dis. Plutonic judges, Plutonic Tanville, encircled nine times with sticks and Lethe, with fire, Plegathon, and Cositus named of lamentation. The very witnesses summoned are like ghosts, exculpatory, inculpatory, they themselves are all hovering over death and doom. They are known in our imagination as the prey of the guillotine. Tall C. Devant Count d'Estaing, anxious to show himself patriot, cannot escape. 
Lobai, who, when asked if he knows the accused, answers with a reverent inclination towards her, Ah, yes, I know, madame. Expatriates are here, sharply dealt with, as Procure Manuel, ex-ministers shorn of their splendour. We have cold aristocratic impassivity, faithful to itself, even in Tartarus. Rabid stupidity of patriot corporals, patriot washerwomen, who have much to say of plots, treasons, August 10th, old insurrection of women. For all now has become a crime in her who has lost. Marie Antoinette, in this her utter abandonment and hour of extreme need, is not wanting to herself, the imperial woman. Her look, they say, as that hideous indictment was reading, continued calm. She was sometimes observed moving her fingers, as when one plays on the piano. You discern, not without interest, across that dim revolutionary bulletin itself, how she bears herself queen-like. Her answers are prompt, clear, often of laconic brevity. Resolution, which has grown contemptuous without ceasing to be dignified, fails itself in calm words. You persist then in denial? My plan is not denial, it is the truth I have said, and I persist in that. Scandalous Hébert has borne his testimony as to many things, as to one thing concerning Marie Antoinette and her little son, wherewith human speech had better not further be soiled. She has answered Hébert. A juryman begs to observe that she has not answered as to this. I have not answered, she exclaims with noble emotion, because nature refuses to answer such a charge brought against a mother. I appeal to all the mothers that are here. Robespierre, when he heard of it, broke out into something almost like swearing at the brutish blockheadism of this Hébert, on whose foul head his foul lie has recoiled. At four o'clock on Wednesday morning, after two days and two nights of interrogating, jury charging and other darkening of counsel, the result comes out. Sentence of death. Have you anything to say? The accused shook her head without speech. Night's candles are burning out, and with her too time is finishing, and it will be eternity and day. This hall of ten vies is dark, ill-lighted, except where she stands. Silently she withdraws from it to die. Two processions, or royal progresses, three and twenty years apart, have often struck us with a strange feeling of contrast. The first is of a beautiful archduchess and dauphiness, quitting her mother's city at the age of fifteen, towards hopes such as no other daughter of Eve then had. On the morrow, says Weber, an eyewitness, the dauphiness left Vienna, the whole city crowded out, at first with a sorrow which was silent. She appeared, you saw her sunk back into her carriage, her face bathed in tears, hiding her eyes now with her handkerchief, now with her hands, several times putting out her head, to see yet again this palace of her father's, whither she was to return no more. She motioned her regret, her gratitude to the good nation which was crowding there to bid her farewell. Then arose not only tears but piercing cries on all sides. Men and women alike abandoned themselves to such expression of their sorrow. It was an audible sound of wail in the streets and avenues of Vienna. The last courier that followed her disappeared and the crowd melted away. The young imperial maiden of fifteen has now become a worn, discrowned widow of thirty-eight, grey before her time. This is the last procession. A few minutes after the trial ended, the drums were beating to arms in all sections. At sunrise, the armed force was on foot, cannons getting placed at the extremities of the bridges, in the squares, crossways, all along from the Palais de Justice to the Place de la Révolution. By ten o'clock, numerous patrols were circulating in the streets, thirty thousand foot and horse drawn up under arms. At eleven, Marie Antoinette was brought out. She had on an undress of pique blanc. She was led to the place of execution in the same manner as an ordinary criminal, bound on a cart, 
accompanied by a constitutional priest in lay dress, escorted by numerous detachments of infantry and cavalry. These and the double row of troops all along her road she appeared to regard with indifference. On her countenance there was visible neither abashment nor pride. To the cries of Viva la Republique and Down with Tyranny, which attended her all the way, she seemed to pay no heed. She spoke little to her confessor. The trickle of streamers on the housetops occupied her attention in the streets de Rule and Saint Honore. She also noticed the inscriptions on the house fronts. On reaching the Place de la Révolution, her looks turned towards the Jardin National, Wylam Tuileries. Her face at that moment gave signs of lively emotion. She mounted the scaffold with courage enough. At a quarter past twelve, her head fell. The executioner showed it to the people. Amid universal, long-continued cries of Viva la République! End of Book 4 Chapter 7《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3 — The Guillotine Book 4 — Terror Chapter 8 — The Twenty-Two This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 4 — Chapter 8 — The Twenty-Two Whom next, O Tainville? The next are of a different colour. Our poor arrested Girondin deputies. What of them could still be laid hold of? Alvernio, Brissot, Fauché, Valaise, Jean Sonnet, the once flower of French patriotism, twenty-two by the tale. Hither at ten years bar, onward from safeguard of the French people, from confinement in the Luxembourg, imprisonment in the conciergerie, they have now by the course of things arrived. Fouquier Tenville must give what account of them he can. Undoubtedly this trial of the Girondins is the greatest that Fouquier has yet had to do. Twenty-two, all chief republicans, ranged in a line there, the most eloquent in France, lawyers too, not without friends in the auditory. How will Tanvi approve these men guilty of royalism, federalism, conspiracy against the republic? Vernio's eloquence awakens once more, draws tears, they say. And journalists report, and the trial lengthens itself out day after day, threatens to become eternal, murmur many. Jacobinism and municipality rise to the aid of Fouquier. On the 28th of the month, Hébert and others come in deputation to inform a patriot convention that the revolutionary tribunal is quite shackled by forms of law that a patriot jury ought to have the power of cutting short, of terminer les débats, when they feel themselves convinced. Which pregnant suggestion of cutting short passes itself with all dispatch into a decree. Accordingly, at ten o'clock on the night of 30th of October, the 22, summoned back once more, receive this information, that the jury, feeling themselves convinced, have cut short, have brought in their verdict, that the accused are found guilty, and the sentence on one and all of them is death with confiscation of goods. Loud natural clamour rises among the poor Girondins, tumult which can only be repressed by the gendarmes. Valaze stabs himself, falls down dead on the spot. The rest, amid loud clamour and confusion, are driven back to their conciergerie, Lazos exclaiming, I die on the day when the people have lost their reason, ye will die when they recover it. No help. Yielding to violence, the doomed uplift the hymn of the Marseillaise, return singing to their dungeon. Rioff, who was their prison mate in these last days, has lovingly recorded what death they made. To our notions it is not an edifying death. Gay satirical potpourri by Ducot rhymed scenes of tragedy wherein Barère and Robespierre discourse with Satan, death's eve spent in singing and sallies of gaiety, with discourses on the happiness of peoples, 
these things and the like of these we have to accept for what they are worth. It is the manner in which the Girondins make their last supper. Falaze, with bloody breast, sleeps cold in death, hears not their singing. Vernio has his dose of poison, but it is not enough for his friends, it is enough only for himself, wherefore he flings it from him, presides at this last supper of the Girondins, with wild coruscations of eloquence, with song and mirth. Poor human will struggles to assert itself, if not in this way, then in that. But on the morrow morning all Paris is out, such a crowd as no man has seen. The death carts, Valaise's cold corpse stretched among the yet living twenty-one, roll along. Bareheaded, hands bound, in their shirt sleeves, coat flung loosely round the neck, so fare the eloquent of France, be murmured, be shouted. To the shouts of Viva la République, some of them keep answering with counter shouts of Viva la République. Others, as Brissot, sit sunk in silence. At the foot of the scaffold they again strike up with appropriate variations, the hymn of the Marseillaise. Such an act of music, conceive it well. The yet living chant there, the chorus so rapidly wearing weak. Samson's axe is rapid, one head per minute or little less. The chorus is worn out. Farewell forevermore, ye Girondins. Tedium Fauche has become silent. Valaze's dead head is lopped, the sickle of the guillotine has reaped the Girondins all away. The eloquent, the young, the beautiful and brave, exclaims Rioff. O oh, death, what feast is toward in thy ghastly halls? Nor, alas, in the far Bordeaux region will Girondism fare better. In caves of saint Emilion, in loft and cellar, the weariest months roll on. Apparel worn, purse empty, wintry November come, and Italian and his guillotine all hope now gone. Danger drawing ever nigher, difficulty pressing ever straighter, they determine to separate. Not unpathetic, the farewell. Tall Barbaru, cheeriest of brave men, stoops to clasp his louvet. In what place soever thou findest my mother, cries he, tried to be instead of a son to her. No resource of mine, but I will share with thy wife, should chance ever lead me where she is. Louvet went with Gardet, with Salle and Valadi, Barbaru with Buzo and Pétion. Valadi soon went southward on the way of his own. The two friends and Louvet had a miserable day and night, the 14th of November month, 1793. Sunk in wet Weariness and hunger, they knock on the morrow for help at a friend's country house. The faint-hearted friend refuses to admit them. They stood, therefore, under trees in the pouring rain. Flying desperate, Louvet thereupon will to Paris. He sets forth there and then, splashing the mud on each side of him, with a fresh strength gathered from fury or frenzy. He passes villages, finding the sentry asleep in his box in the thick rain. He is gone before the man can call after him. He bilks revolutionary committees, rides in carriers' carts, covered carts and open, lies hidden in one, under knapsacks and cloaks of soldiers' wives on the streets of Orléans, while men search for him, has hairbreadth escapes that would fill three romances. Finally he gets to Paris, to his fair helpmate, gets to Switzerland, and waits better days. Bourguade and Sal were both taken ere long. They died by the guillotine in Bordeaux, drums beating to drown their voice. Valadi also is caught and guillotined. Barbaru and his two comrades weathered it longer, into the summer of 1794, but not long enough. One July morning, changing their hiding place, as they often have to do, about a league from saint Emilion, they observe a great crowd of country people, Doubtless Jacobins come to take them. Barbaru draws a pistol, shoots himself dead. Alas, and it was not Jacobins, it was harmless villagers going to a village wake. Two days afterwards, Buzo and Pétion were found in a cornfield, their bodies half-eaten with dogs. Such was the end of Girondism. 
They arose to regenerate France, these men, and have accomplished this. Alas, whatever quarrel we had with them, has not their cruel fate abolished it? Pity only survives. So many excellent souls of heroes sent down to Hades, they themselves given as a prey of dogs and all manner of birds. But here too the will of the supreme power was accomplished. As Vernio said, the revolution, like Saturn, is devouring its own children. End of Book 4, Chapter 8《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3 — The Guillotine Book 5 — Terror — The Order of the Day Chapter 1 — Rushing Down This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 5 — Chapter 1 — Rushing Down We are now therefore got to that black, precipitous abyss whither all things have long been tending where, having now arrived on the giddy verge, they hurl down in confused ruin, headlong, pell-mell, down, down, till the sans culottism have consummated itself, and in this wondrous French revolution, as in a doomsday, a world have been rapidly, if not born again, yet destroyed and engulfed. Terror has long been terrible, but to the actors themselves it has now become manifest that their appointed course is one of terror, and they say, be it so, que la terreur soit à l'ordre du jour. So many centuries, say only from Hugh Capet downwards, had been adding together, century transmitting it with increase to century, the sum of wickedness, of falsehood, oppression of man by man. Kings were sinners, and priests were, and people. Open scoundrels rode triumphant, bediademed, becoroneted, bemited, or the still fatalist species of secret scoundrels in their fair-sounding formulas, speciosities, respectabilities, hollow within. The race of quacks was grown many as the sands of the sea, till at length such a sum of quackery had accumulated itself as, in brief, the earth and the heavens were weary of. Slow seemed the day of settlement, coming on all imperceptible across the bluster and fanfaronade of courtierisms, conquering heroisms, most Christian grand monarchisms, well-beloved pompadourisms, yet behold, it was always coming, Behold, it has come, suddenly unlooked for by any man. The harvest of long centuries was ripening and whitening so rapidly of late, and now it has grown white, and is reaped rapidly, as it were, in one day. Reaped in this reign of terror, and carried home to Hades and the pit. Unhappy sons of Adam, it is ever so, and never do they know it, nor will they know it with cheerfully smoothed countenances day after day and generation after generation, they calling cheerfully to one another, well, speed ye are at work sowing the wind. And yet as God lives, they shall reap the whirlwind. No other thing we say is possible, since God is a truth and his world is a truth. History, however, in dealing with this reign of terror, has had her own difficulties. While the phenomenon continued in its primary state as mere horrors of the French Revolution, there was abundance to be said and shrieked, with and also without profit. Heaven knows there were terrors and horrors enough, yet that was not all the phenomenon. Nay, more properly, this was not the phenomenon at all, but rather was the shadow of it, the negative part of it. And now, in a new stage of the business, when history, ceasing to shriek, would rather try to include under her old forms of speech or speculation this new amazing thing, that so some accredited scientific law of nature might suffice for the unexpected product of nature, and history might get to speak of it articulately, and draw inferences and profit from it, in this new stage, history, we must say, babbles and flounders, perhaps in a still painfuler manner. 
Take, for example, the latest form of speech we have seen propounded on the subject as adequate to it almost in these months by a worthy Monsieur Roux in his Histoire Parlementaire. The latest and the strangest, that the French Revolution was a deadlift effort after 1800 years of preparation to realise the Christian religion. Unity, indivisibility, brotherhood or death did indeed stand printed on all houses of the living. Also on cemeteries or houses of the dead stood printed by order of Procureur Chaumet, here is eternal sleep. But a Christian religion realised by the guillotine and death eternal is suspect to me, as Robespierre was wont to say, mais suspect. Alas no, Monsieur Roux. A gospel of brotherhood, not according to any of the four old evangelists, and calling on men to repent and amend each his own wicked existence, that they might be saved, but a gospel rather, as we often hint, according to a new fifth evangelist, Jean-Jacques, calling on men to amend each the whole world's wicked existence, and be saved by making the constitution. A thing different and distant, toto quello, as they say, the whole breadth of the sky, and further if possible. It is thus, however, that history, and indeed all human speech and reason, does yet what Father Adam began life by doing, strive to name the new things it sees of nature's producing, often helplessly enough. But what if history were to admit, for once, that all the names and theorems yet known to her fall short? that this grand product of nature was even grand and new in that it came not to range itself under old recorded laws of nature at all, but to disclose new ones. In that case, history, renouncing the pretension to name it at present, will look honestly at it and name what she can of it. Any approximation to the right name has value. Were the right name itself once here, the thing is known thenceforth. The thing is then ours and can be dealt with. Now, surely not realisation of Christianity or of aught earthly do we discern in this reign of terror, in this French Revolution of which it is the consummating. Destruction, rather, we discern of all that was destructible. It is as if twenty-five millions, risen at length into the Pythian mood, had stood up simultaneously to say, with a sound which goes through far lands and times, that this untruth of an existence had become insupportable. O ye hypocrisies and speciosities, royal mantles, cardinal plush cloaks, ye credos, formulas, respectabilities, fair-painted sepulchres full of dead man's bones, behold, ye appear to us to be altogether a lie. Yet our life is not a lie, yet our hunger and misery is not a lie. Behold, we lift up, one and all, our twenty-five million right hands and take the heavens and the earth and also the pit of Tophet to witness that either ye shall be abolished or else we shall be abolished. No inconsiderable oath, truly, forming, as has been often said, the most remarkable transaction in these last thousand years. Wherefrom, likewise, there follow and will follow results. The fulfilment of this oath, that is to say the black, desperate battle of men against their whole condition and environment, a battle, alas, with all against the sin and darkness that was in themselves as in others, this is the reign of terror. Transcendental despair was the purport of it, though not consciously so. False hopes of fraternity, political millennium and what not, we have always seen, but the unseen heart of the whole, the transcendental despair, was not false, neither has it been of no effect. Despair, pushed far enough, completes the circle, so to speak, and becomes a kind of genuine productive hope again. Doctrine of fraternity out of old Catholicism does, it is true, very strangely in the vehicle of a Jean-Jacques Evangel suddenly plumped down out of its cloud firmament and from a theorem determined to make itself a practice. But just so do all creeds, intentions, customs, knowledges, thoughts and things which the French have suddenly plumped down. 
Catholicism, classicism, sentimentalism, cannibalism, all isms that make up man in France are rushing and roaring in that gulf, and the theorem has become a practice, and whatsoever cannot swim sinks. Not evangelist Jean-Jacques alone. There is not a village schoolmaster but has contributed his quota. Do we not thou one another according to the free peoples of antiquity? The French patriot in red Phrygian nightcap of liberty christens his poor little infant Cato, censor or else of Utica. Gracchus has become Babeuf and edits newspapers. Mutius Scaevola, cordwainer of that ilk, presides in the section. Mutia Scaevola, and in brief, there is a world wholly jumbling itself to try what will swim. Wherefore, we will at all events call this reign of terror a very strange one. Dominant sans colotism makes, as it were, free arena, one of the strangest temporary states humanity was ever seen in, a nation of men full of wants and void of habits. The old habits are gone to wreck because they were old. Men, driven forward by necessity and fierce pithy and madness, have on the spur of the instant to devise for the want the way of satisfying it. The wanted tumbles down. By imitation, by invention, the unwanted hastily builds itself up. What the French national head has in it comes out, if not a great result, surely one of the strangest. Neither shall the reader fancy that it was all blank, this reign of terror. Far from it. How many hammermen and squaremen, bakers and brewers, washers and ringers, over this France must ply their old daily work, let the government be one of terror or one of joy. In this Paris there are twenty-three theatres nightly, some count as many as sixty places of dancing. The playwright manufactures pieces of a strictly republican character, ever fresh novel garbage as of old, fodders the circulating libraries. The cesspool of Agio, now in the time of paper money, works with a vivacity unexampled, unimagined, exhales from itself sudden fortunes like Aladdin palaces, really a kind of miraculous fata morganas, since you can live in them for a time. Terror is as a sable ground on which the most variegated of scenes paints itself. In startling transitions, in colours all intensated, the sublime, the ludicrous, the horrible succeed one another, or rather in crowding tumult accompany one another. Here, accordingly, if anywhere, the hundred tongues which the old poets often clamour for were of supreme service. In defect of any such organ on our part, let the reader stir up his own imaginative organ. Let us snatch for him this or the other significant glimpse of things in the fittest sequence we can. End of Book 5, Chapter 1《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 5 Terror, the Order of the Day. Chapter 2. Death. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 5. Chapter 2. Death. In the early days of November, there is one transient glimpse of things that is to be noted. The last transit to his long home of Philippe d'Orléans Egalité. Philippe was decreed accused along with the Girondins, much to his and their surprise, but not tried along with them. They are doomed and dead some three days when Philippe, after his long half-year of durance at Marseille, arrives in Paris. It is, as we calculate, the 3rd of November, 1793. On which same day, two notable female prisoners are also put in ward there. Dame du Barry and Josephine Beauharnais. Dame Wylam Countess du Barry, unfortunate female, had returned from London. They snatched her, not only as ex-harlot of a Wylam majesty and therefore suspect, but as having furnished the emigrants with money. Contemporaneously with whom there comes the wife of Beauharnais, soon to be the widow. 
she that is Josephine Tasha Bohane, that shall be Josephine Empress Bonaparte for a black divineress of the tropics, prophesied long since that she should be a queen, and more. Likewise, in the same hours, poor Adam Lux, night turned in the head, who, according to Foster, has taken no food these three weeks, marches to the guillotine for his pamphlet on Charlotte Corday. He sprang to the scaffold, said he died for her with great joy. Amid such fellow travellers does Philippe arrive. For, be the month named Brume, year two of liberty, or November, year 1793 of slavery, the guillotine goes always. Guillotine va toujours. Enough. Philippe's indictment is soon drawn, his jury soon convinced. He finds himself made guilty of royalism, conspiracy, and much else. Nay, it is a guilt in him that he voted Louis's death, though he answers, I voted in my soul and conscience. The doom he finds is death forthwith. This present sixth dim day of November is the last day that Philippe is to see. Philippe, says Montgaillard, thereupon called for breakfast. Sufficiency of oysters, two cutlets, best part of an excellent bottle of claret, and consumed the same with apparent relish. A revolutionary judge or some official convention emissary then arrived to signify that he might still do the state some service by revealing the truth about a plot or two. Philippe answered that, on him, in the past things had come to, the state had, he thought, small claim. That, nevertheless, in the interest of liberty, he, having still some leisure on his hands, was willing, were a reasonable question asked him, to give reasonable answer. And so, says Montgaillard, he lent his elbow on the mantelpiece, and conversed in an undertone with great seeming composure, till the leisure was done, or the emissary went his ways. At the door of the conciergerie, Philippe's attitude was erect and easy, almost commanding. It is five years, or but a few days, since Philippe, within these same stone walls, stood up with an air of graciosity and asked King Louis whether it was a royal session then, or a bed of justice. Oh, heaven! Three poor blackguards were to ride and die with him. Some say they objected to such company and had to be flung in neck and heels, but it seems not true. Objecting or not objecting, the gallows vehicle gets under way. Philippe's dress is remarked for its elegance. Green frock, waistcoat of white piquet, yellow buckskins, boots clear as warren, his air as before, entirely composed, impassive, not to say easy and bromelian polite. Through street after street, slowly amid execrations, past the Palais Egalité while on Palais Royal. The cruel populace stopped him there some minutes, Dame du Buffon, it is said, looked out on him in Jezebel Hedtar. Along the Ashlar wall there ran these words in huge trickler print. Republic one and indivisible. Liberty, equality, fraternity or death. National property. Philippe's eyes flashed hellfire one instant, but the next instant it was gone, and he sat impassive, Brumelian polite. On the scaffold, Samson was for drawing of his boots. Tush, said Philippe, they will come off better after. Let us have done. Dépêchons-nous. So Philippe was not without virtue then? God forbid that there should be any living man without it. He had the virtue to keep living for five and forty years, other virtues perhaps more than we know of. Probably no mortal ever had such things recorded of him, such facts, and also such lies. For he was a Jacobin, prince of the blood. Consider what a combination. Also, unlike any Nero, any Borgia, he lived in the age of pamphlets. Enough for us. Chaos has reabsorbed him. May it late or never bear his like again. Brave young Orléans Egalité, deprived of all, only not deprived of himself, is gone to choir in the Grisson under the name of Corby to teach mathematics. The Egalité family is at the darkest depths of the Nadir. A far nobler victim follows, one who will claim remembrance from several centuries, Jean-Marie Flippon, the wife of Roland. Queenly, sublime in her uncomplaining sorrow, seemed she to Rioff in her prison. 
Something more than is usually found in the looks of women painted itself, says Rioff, in those large black eyes of hers, full of expression and sweetness. She spoke to me often at the great. We were all attentive round her in a sort of admiration and astonishment. She expressed herself with a purity, with a harmony and prosody that made her language like music of which the ear could never have enough. Her conversation was serious, not cold. Coming from the mouth of a beautiful woman, it was frank and courageous as that of a great man. And yet her maid said, Before you she collects her strength, but in her own room she will sit three hours sometimes, leaning on the window and weeping. She had been in prison, liberated once, but recaptured the same hour, ever since the first of June, in agitation and uncertainty, which has gradually settled down into the last stern certainty, that of death. In the Abbey prison she occupied Charlotte Corday's apartment. Here, in the conciergerie, she speaks with Riouf, with ex-minister Clavier, calls the beheaded twenty-two nos amis, our friends, and we are soon to follow. During these five months those memoirs of hers were written, which all the world still reads. But now, on the 8th of November, clad in white, says Riouf, with her long black hair hanging down to her girdle, she has gone to the judgment bar. She returned with a quick step, lifted her finger to signify to us that she was doomed. Her eyes seemed to have been wet. Fouquier Tanville's questions had been brutal. Offended female honour flung them back on him with scorn, not without tears. And now, short preparation soon done, she shall go her last road. There went with her a certain Lamarche, director of Assignat Printing, whose dejection she endeavoured to cheer. Arrived at the foot of the scaffold, she asked for pen and paper to write the strange thoughts that were rising in her, a remarkable request which was refused. Looking at the Statue of Liberty which stands there, she says bitterly, O oh, Liberty, what things are done in thy name! For Lamarche's sake, she will die first, show him how easy it is to die. Contrary to the order, says Samson. Pshaw, you cannot refuse the last request of a lady. And Samson yielded. Noble white vision with its high queenly face, its soft proud eyes, long black hair flowing down to the girdle, and as brave a heart as ever beat in woman's bosom. Like a white Grecian statue, serenely complete, she shines in that black wreck of things, long memorable. Honour to great nature, who in Paris city, in the era of noble sentiment and pompadourism, can make a Jean Flippon, and nourish her to clear perennial womanhood, though but on logic's encyclopédie and the gospel according to Jean Jacques. Biography will long remember that tray of asking for a pen to write the strange thoughts that were rising in her. It is as a little light beam shedding softness and a kind of sacredness over all that preceded, so in her too there was an unnameable. She too was a daughter of the infinite. There were mysteries which philosophism had not dreamt of. She left long written counsels to her little girl, she said her husband would not survive her. Still crueler was the fate of poor Bailly, first national president, first mayor of Paris, doomed now for royalism, fayettism, for that red flag business of the Champ de Mars, one may say in general for leaving his astronomy to meddle with revolution. It is the 10th of November, 1793. A cold, bitter, drizzling rain as poor Bailly is led through the streets, howling populace covering him with curses, with mud, waving over his face a burning or smoking mockery of a red flag. Silent, unpitied, sits the innocent old man. Slow faring through the sleety drizzle, they have got to the Champ de Mars. Not there vociferates the cursing populace. Such blood ought not to stain an altar of the fatherland. Not there, but on that dung heap by the river's side. So vociferates the cursing populace. Officiality gives ear to them. The guillotine is taken down, though with hands numbed by the sleety drizzle. 
is carried to the riverside, is there set up again with slow numbness, pulse after pulse still counting itself out in the old man's weary heart. For hours long amid curses and bitter frost rain. Baye, thou tremblest, said one. Mon ami, it is for cold, said Baye, c'est de foie. Crueler end had no mortal. Some days afterwards, Roland, hearing the news of what happened on the 8th, embraces his kind friends at Rouen, leaves their kind house which had given him refuge, goes forth with farewells too sad for tears. On the morrow morning, 16th of the month, some four leagues from Rouen, Paris Wood, near Bourg Bourdin, in Monsieur Norman's Avenue, there is seen sitting, leant against a tree, the figure of rigorous, wrinkled man, stiff now in the rigour of death, a cane-sword run through his heart, and at his feet this writing. Whoever thou art that findest me lying, respect my remains. They are those of a man who consecrated all his life to being useful, and who has died as he lived, virtuous and honest. Not fear but indignation made me quit my retreat on learning that my wife had been murdered. I wished not to remain longer on an earth polluted with crimes. Barnard's appearance at the Revolutionary Tribunal was of the bravest, but it could not stead him. They have sent for him from Grenoble. To pay the common smart, vain is eloquence, forensic or other, against the dumb clotho shears of Tanville. He is still but two and thirty, this Barnard, and has known such changes. Short while ago we saw him at the top of fortune's wheel, his word a law to all patriots, and now surely he is at the bottom of the wheel in stormful altercation with a Tanville tribunal which is dooming him to die. And Pétion, once also of the extreme left, a name Pétion Virtue, where is he? Civilly dead in the caves of Saint-Emilion to be devoured of dogs. And Robespierre, who rode along with him on the shoulders of the people, is in committee of salut, civilly alive, not to live always. So Giddy Swift whirls and spins this immeasurable tormentum of a revolution, wild booming, not to be followed by the eye. Barnave on the scaffold stamped his foot, and looking upward was heard to ejaculate, This, then, is my reward? Deputy ex-procureur Manuel is already gone, and Deputy Ossolin, famed also in August and September, is about to go and Rabot discovered treacherously between his two walls and the brother of Rabot. National deputies, not a few. And generals. The memory of General Castine cannot be defended by his son. His son is already guillotined. Castine, the ex-noble, was replaced by Houchard, the plebeian. He too could not prosper in the north. For him too there was no mercy. He has perished in the Place de la Révolution after attempting suicide in prison. And Generals Biron, Beauharnais, Brunet, whatsoever general prospers not, tough old Lochner with his eyes grown roomy, Alsacian Vesterman, valiant and diligent in La Vendée, none of them can, as the psalmist sings, his soul from death deliver. How busy are the revolutionary committees! sections with their forty halfpence a day. Arrestment on arrestment falls quick, continual, followed by death. Ex-Minister Clavier has killed himself in prison. Ex-Minister Lebrun, seized in a hayloft under the disguise of a working man, is instantly conducted to death. Nay, with all, is it not what Barère calls coining money on the Place de la Révolution? For always the property of the guilty, if property he have, is confiscated. To avoid accidents, we even make a law that suicide shall not defraud us, that a criminal who kills himself does not the less incur forfeiture of goods. Let the guilty tremble, therefore, and the suspect, and the rich, and in a word all manner of colotic men. Luxembourg Palace, once Monsieur's, has become a huge, loathsome prison. Chantilly Palace, too, once Condes, and their landlords are at Blankenburg, on the wrong side of the Rhine. In Paris are now some twelve prisons, in France some forty-four thousand, thitherward, thick as brown leaves in autumn, rustle and travel the suspect, 
Shaken down by revolutionary committees, they are swept through the wood as into their storehouse to be consumed by Samson and Tanville. The guillotine goes not ill. La guillotine ne va pas mal. End of Book 5, Chapter 2 The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 5, Terror, The Order of the Day, Chapter 3, Destruction. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 5, Chapter 3, Destruction. The suspect may well tremble, but how much more the open rebels, the Girondin cities of the South, Revolutionary army has gone forth under Ronsin, the playwright, 6,000 strong, in red nightcap, in tricolour waistcoat, in black shag trousers, black shag spencer, with enormous mustachios, enormous sabre, in camagnol complet, and has portable guillotines. Representative Carrier has gone to Nantes by the edge of blazing La Vendée, which Rossignol has literally set on fire. Carrier will try what captives you make, what accomplices they have, royalist or Girondin. His guillotine goes always, va toujours, and his wall-capped company of Marat. Little children are guillotined, and aged men. Swift as the machine is, it will not serve. The headsman and all his valets sink, worn down with work, declares that the human muscles can no more. Whereupon you must try fusillading, to which perhaps still frightfuler methods may succeed. In Brest, to like purpose, rules Jean Bon Saint Andre with an army of red nightcaps. In Bordeaux, rules Tallien with his Isabeau and henchmen. Guade, Cusi, Salaises may fall, the bloody pike and nightcap bearing supreme sway, the guillotine coining money. Bristly foxhead Tallien, once able editor, still young in years, is now become most gloomy, potent, a Pluto on earth, and has the keys of Tartarus. One remarks, however, that a certain Signorina Cabaru, or call her rather Signora, and wedded, not yet widow, Dame de Fontenay, brown, beautiful woman, daughter of Cabaru, the Spanish merchant, has softened the red, bristly countenance, pleading for herself and friends, and prevailing. The keys of Tartarus, or any kind of power, are something to a woman. Gloomy Pluto himself is not insensible to love. Like a new proserpine, she, by this red gloomy dis, is gathered, and they say softens his stone heart a little. Magnet at Orange in the south, Le Bon at Arras in the north, become world's wonders. Jacobin Popular Tribunal, with its national representative, perhaps where Girondin Popular Tribunal had lately been, rises here and rises there, wheresoever needed. Fouchés, Meignet, Barrasses, Frérons scour the southern departments like reapers with their guillotine sickle. Many are the labourers, great is the harvest. By the hundred and the thousand, men's lives are cropped, cast like brands into the burning. Marseille is taken and put under martial law. Lo, at Marseille, what one besmutted red-bearded corn ear is this which they cut, one gross man, we mean, with copper-studded face, plenteous beard or beard stubble of a tile colour. By Nemesis and the Fatal Sisters it is Jordan Coupdate. Him they have clutched in these martial law districts. Him too with their national razor, their rassoir national, they sternly shave away. Lo now is Jordan the headsman's own head. Lo is Deschutes and Varignies which he sent on pikes in the insurrection of women. No more shall he, as a copper portent, be seen gyrating through the cities of the south. No more sit judging with pipes and brandy in the ice tower of Avignon. The all-hiding earth has received him, the bloated tile-beard. May we never look upon his like again. Jourdain won names, and other hundreds are not named. Alas, they, like confused faggots, lie massed together for us, counted by the cartload and yet not an individual faggot twig of them but had a life and history and was cut not without pangs as when a kaiser dies. 
least of all cities, can Lyon escape. Leon, which we saw in dread sunblaze that autumn night when the powder tower sprang aloft, was clearly verging towards a sad end. Inevitable. What could desperate valour and praise do? Dubarcrans say, deaf as destiny, stern as doom, capturing their redou of cotton bags, hemming them in ever closer with his artillery lava. Never would that sea divan d'Ottichamp arrive, never any help from Blankenburg. The Lyon Jacobins were hidden in cellars, and Girondin municipality waxed pale in famine, treason and red fire. Bracy drew his sword, and some fifteen hundred with him sprang to saddle to cut their way to Switzerland. They cut fiercely, and were fiercely cut and cut down, not hundreds, hardly units of them ever saw Switzerland. Lyon, on the 9th of October, surrenders at discretion. It has become a devoted town. Abbe Lamorette, now Bishop Lamorette, whilom legislator, he of the old Bessie Lamorette or Delilah kiss, is seized here, is sent to Paris to be guillotined. He made the sign of the cross, they say, when Tanville intimated his death sentence to him, and died as an eloquent constitutional bishop. But woe now to all bishops, priests, aristocrats and federalists that are in Lyon. The manes of Chalier are to be appeased. The Republic, maddened to the Sibylline pitch, has bared her right arm. Behold, Representative Fouché, it is Fouché of Nantes, a name to become well known. He, with a patriot company, goes duly in wondrous procession to raise the corpse of Chalier. An ass, housed in priest's cloak, with a mitre on its head, and trailing the mass-books, some say the very Bible at its tail, paces through Lyon streets, escorted by multitudinous patriotism, by clangour as of the pit, towards the grave of Marthe de Chalier. The body is dug up and burnt. The ashes are collected in an urn to be worshipped of Paris patriotism. The holy books were part of the funeral pile. Their ashes are scattered to the wind. Amid cries of vengeance, vengeance, which, writes Fouché, shall be satisfied. Lyon, in fact, is a town to be abolished. Not Lyon, henceforth, but Commune Affranchi, township freed, the very name of it shall perish. It is to be raised, this once great city of Jacobinism prophesy right, and a pillar to be erected on the ruins with this inscription, Lyon rebelled against the Republic. Lyon is no more. Fouché, Couton, Collot, convention representatives succeed one another. There is work for the hangman, work for the hammerman, not in building. The very houses of aristocrats, we say, are doomed. Paralytic Couton, born in a chair, taps on the wall with emblematic mallet, saying, La loi te frappe, the law strikes thee. Masons with wedge and crowbar begin demolition. Crash of downfall, dim ruin and dust clouds fly in the winter wind. Had Lyon been of soft stuff, it had all vanished in those weeks and the Jacobin prophecy had been fulfilled. But towns are not built of soap froth. Lyon town is built of stone. Lyon, though it rebelled against the Republic, is to this day. Neither have the Lyon Girondins all one neck that you could dispatch it at one swoop. Revolutionary tribunal here and military commission, guillotining, fusillading, do what they can. The kennels of the Place des Terreaux run red. Mangled corpses roll down the Rhone. Collot de Bois, they say, was once hissed on the Lyon stage, but with what sibilation of world catcall or horse Tartarian trumpet will ye hiss him now in this his new character of convention representative not to be repeated? Two hundred and nine men are marched forth over the Rhone to be shot in mass by musket and cannon in the promenade of the Brotteaux. It is the second of such scenes. The first was of some seventy. The corpses of the first were flung into the Rhone, but the Rhone stranded some. So these now of the second lot are to be buried on land. Their one long grave is dug. They stand ranked by the loose mould ridge, the younger of them singing the Marseillaise. 
Jacobin National Guards give fire, but have again to give fire, and again, and to take the bayonet and the spade, for though the doomed all fall, they do not all die, and it becomes a butchery too horrible for speech. So that the very nationals, as they fire, turn away their faces. Collot, snatching the musket from one such national and levelling it with unmoved countenance, says, It is thus a Republican ought to fire. This is the second fusillade, and happily the last. It is found too hideous, even inconvenient. There were 209 marched out, one escaped at the end of the bridge, yet behold, when you count the corpses, they are 210. Read us this riddle, O Collo. After long guessing, it is called to mind that two individuals here in the Brotto ground did attempt to leave the rank, protesting with agony that they were not condemned men, that they were police commissaries, which two we repulsed and disbelieved and shot with the rest. Such is the vengeance of an enraged republic. Surely this, according to Barre's phrase, is justice under rough forms, sous des formes acerbes. But the Republic, as Fouché says, must march to liberty over corpses. Or again, as Barère has it, none but the dead do not come back. Il n'y a que les morts qui ne reviennent pas. Terror hovers far and wide. The guillotine goes not ill. But before quitting those southern regions over which history can cast only glances from aloft, she will alight for a moment and look fixedly at one point the siege of Toulon. Much battering and bombarding, heating of balls in furnaces or farmhouses, serving of artillery well and ill, attacking of Oliul passes, Fort Malbosque, there has been, as yet, a small purpose. We have had General Cato here, a whilom painter, elevated in the troubles of Marseille, General Dropé, a whilom medical man, elevated in the troubles of Piedmont, who, under Crancey, took Lyon, but cannot take too long. Finally, we have General Dugomier, a pupil of Washington. Convention representants also we have had. Barras, Salicetti, Robespierre the Younger, also an artillery chef de brigade of extreme diligence, who often takes his nap of sleep among the guns. A short, taciturn, olive-complexioned young man, not unknown to us, by name Bonaparte, one of the best artillery officers yet met with. And still Toulon is not taken. It is the fourth month now, December, in slave style, Frostarius or Frimaire in new style, and still their cursed red-blue flag flies there. They are provisioned from the sea. They have seized all heights, felling wood and fortifying themselves, like the coney they have built their nest in the rocks. Meanwhile, Frosterius has not yet become Snowus or Nivos when a council of war is called. Instructions have just arrived from government and Salut Public. Carnot in Salut Public has sent us a plan of siege on which plan General Dugomia has this criticism to make, Commissioner Salicetti has that, and criticisms and plans are very various. When that young artillery officer ventures to speak, the same whom we saw snatching sleep among the guns, who has emerged several times in this history, the name of him Napoleon Bonaparte. It is his humble opinion, for he has been gliding about with spyglasses, with thoughts, that a certain Fort Leguillette can be clutched as with lion spring on the sudden, where from, were it once ours, the very heart of Toulon might be battered, the English lines were, so to speak, turned inside out, and Hood and our national enemies must next day either put to sea or be burnt to ashes. Commissioners arch their eyebrows with negatory sniff. Who is this young gentleman with more wit than we all? Brave veteran Dugomier, however, thinks the idea worth a word, questions the young gentleman, becomes convinced, and there is, for issue, try it. On the taciturn bronze countenance, therefore, things being now already, there sits a grimmer gravity than ever, compressing a hotter central fire than ever. Yonder, thou seest, is Fort Leguillette, a desperate lion spring, yet a possible one, this day to be tried. Tried it is, and found good. By stratagem and valour, 
stealing through ravines, plunging fiery through the fire tempest, Fort Leguillette is clutched at, is carried, the smoke having cleared, wiser the trickler fly on it, the bronze-complexioned young man was right. Next morning, Hood, finding the interior of his lines exposed, his defences turned inside out, makes for his shipping. Taking such royalists as wished it on board with him, he weighs anchor. On this 19th of December, 1793, Toulon is once more the Republic's. Cannonading has ceased at Toulon, and now the guillotining and fusillading may begin. Civil horrors, truly but at least that infamy of an English domination is purged away. Let there be civic feast, universally over France, so reports Barrère or Painter David, and the Convention assists in a body. May it is said these infamous English, with an attention rather to their own interests than to ours, set fire to our storehouses, arsenals, warships in Toulon Harbour before weighing some score of brave warships, the only ones we now had. However, it did not prosper, though the flames spread far and high. Some two ships were burnt, not more. The very galley slaves ran with buckets to quench. These same proud ships, ships Lorient and the rest, have to carry this same young man to Egypt first. Not yet can they be changed to ashes, or to sea nymphs, not yet to sky rockets, O ship Lorient, nor become the prey of England before their time. And so, over France, universally, there is civic feast and high tide, and Toulon sees fusillading, grape-shotting in mass, as Lyon saw, and death is poured out in great floods, vomi à grand flot, and twelve thousand masons are requisitioned from the neighbouring country to raise Toulon from the face of the earth. For it is to be raised, so reports Barère, all but the national shipping establishments, and to be called henceforth not Toulon, but Port of the Mountain. There in black death cloud we must leave it, hoping only that Toulon, too, is built of stone, that perhaps even twelve thousand masons cannot pull it down till the fit pass. One begins to be sick of death vomited in great floods, Nevertheless, hearest thou not, O reader, for the sound reaches through centuries, in the dead December and January nights over Nance Town, confused noises as of musketry and tumult, as of rage and lamentation, mingling with the everlasting moan of the Loire waters there? Nance Town is sunk in sleep, but Representant Carrière is not sleeping. The wool-capped company of Marat is not sleeping. Why unmoors that flat-bottomed craft, that gabar, about eleven at night, with ninety priests under hatches? They are going to Belle-Isle. In the middle of the Loire stream, on signal given, the gabar is scuttled. She sinks with all her cargo. Sentence of deportation, writes Carrier, was executed vertically. The ninety priests with the gabar coffin lie deep. It is the first of the noyades, what we may call drownages of Carrière, which have become famous for ever. Guillotining there was at Nantes till the headsman sank worn out, then fusillading in the plain of saint mauve little children fusilladed, and women with children at the breast, children and women by the hundred and twenty, and by the five hundred, so hot is la Vendée till the very Jacobins grew sick, and all but the company of Marat cried, Hold! Wherefore now we have got Noyarding, and on the twenty-fourth night of Frosterius Year Two, which is 14th of December, 1793, we have a second Noyard, consisting of 138 persons. Or why waste a gabar, sinking it with them? Fling them out! fling them out with their hands tied, pour a continual hail of lead over all the space till the last struggler of them be sunk. Unsound sleepers of Nantes and the sea villages thereabouts hear the musketry amid the night winds, wonder what the meaning of it is. And women were in that gabar whom the red nightcaps were stripping naked, who begged in their agony that their smocks might not be stripped from them. And young children were thrown in, their mothers vainly pleading. 
Wolflings, answered the company of Marat, who would grow to be wolves. By degrees, daylight itself witnesses noyards. Women and men are tied together, feet and feet, hands and hands, and flung in. This they call mariage républicain, republican marriage. Cruel is the panther of the woods, the she-bear bereaved of her whelps, but there is in man a hatred crueler than that. Dumb, out of suffering now, as pale, swollen corpses, the victims tumble confusedly seaward along the Loire stream, the tide rolling them back. Clouds of ravens darken the river, wolves prowl on the shoal places. Carrier writes, Quel torrent révolutionnaire! What a torrent of revolution! For the man is rabid, and the time is rabid. These are the noyades of Carrier, twenty-five by the tale, for what is done in darkness comes to be investigated in sunlight, not to be forgotten for centuries. We will turn to another aspect of the consummation of Sanskalotism, leaving this as the blackest. But indeed men are all rabid, as the time is. Representative Le Bon at Taras dashes his sword into the blood flowing from the guillotine, exclaims, How I like it! Mothers, they say by his order, have to stand by while the guillotine devours their children. A band of music is stationed near, and at the fall of every head strikes up its sa ira. In the Burg of Bedouin, in the Orange region, the Liberty Tree has been cut down overnight. Representative Magnet at Orange hears of it, burns Bedouin Berg to the last dog hutch, guillotines the inhabitants or drives them into the caves and hills. Republic one and indivisible. She is the newest birth of nature's waste inorganic deep which men name Orcus, Chaos, Primeval Night, and knows one law, that of self-preservation. Digresse nationale, Meddle not with a whisker of her. Swift crushing is her stroke. Look what a paw she spreads. Pity has not entered her heart. Proudhon, the dull, blustering printer and able editor, as yet a Jacobin editor, will become a renegade one and publish large volumes on these matters, Crimes of the Revolution, adding innumerable lies with all as if the truth were not sufficient. We, for our part, find it more edifying to know, one good time, that this Republican national tigress is a new birth, a fact of nature among formulas in an age of formulas, and to look, oftenest in silence, how the so genuine nature fact will demean itself among these. For the formulas are partly genuine, partly delusive, suppositious. We call them, in the language of metaphor, regulated, modelled shapes, some of which have bodies and life still in them, most of which, according to a German writer, have only emptiness, glass eyes glaring on you with a ghastly affectation of life, and in their interior, unclean accumulation of beetles and spiders. But the fact, let all men observe, is a genuine and sincere one, the sincerest of facts, terrible in its sincerity as very death. Whatsoever is equally sincere may front it and beard it, but whatsoever is not. End of Book 5, Chapter 3《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume Three: The Guillotine, Book Five: Terror, The Order of the Day, Chapter Four: Carmagnol Complete. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book Five, Chapter Four: Carmagnol Complete. Simultaneously with this toffet black aspect, there unfolds itself another aspect which one may call a toffet red aspect, the destruction of the Catholic religion, and indeed, for the time being, of religion itself. We saw Rom's new calendar establish its tenth day of rest, and asked what would become of the Christian Sabbath. The calendar is hardly a month old till all this is set at rest. Very singularly, as Mercier observes, 
Last Corpus Christi Day, 1792, the whole world, and sovereign authority itself, walked in religious gala with a quite devout air. Butcher Legendre, supposed to be irreverent, was like to be massacred in his gig as the thing went by. A Gallican hierarchy and church and church formulas seemed to flourish, a little brown-leaved or so, but not browner than of late years or decades, to flourish far and wide in the sympathies of an unsophisticated people, defying philosophism, legislature and the encyclopédie. Far and wide, alas, like a brown-leaved Vallombrosa, which waits but one whirlblast of the November wind and in an hour stands bare. Since that Corpus Christi day, Brunswick has come, and the emigrants, and La Vendée, and eighteen months of time. To all flourishing, especially to brown-leaved flourishing, there comes, were it never so slowly, an end. On the 7th of November, a certain citoyen parrain, curate of the Boissy's Le Botron, writes to the convention that he has all his life been preaching a lie, and is grown weary of doing it. Wherefore he will now lay down his curacy and stipend, and begs that an august convention would give him something else to live upon. Mention honorable, shall we give him, or reference to committee of finances. Hardly is this got decided when Gobel, constitutional bishop of Paris, with his chapter, with municipal and departmental escort in red nightcaps, makes his appearance to do as Parens has done. Gobel will now acknowledge no religion but liberty. Therefore he doffs his priest gear and receives the fraternal embrace. To the joy of departmental Momoro, of municipal Chomets and Hébert, of Vincent and the revolutionary army. Chomet asks, ought they not in these circumstances to be among our intercalary days sans breaches, a festival of reason? Proper, surely. Let atheist Maréchal, Lalande, and little atheist Nation rejoice. Let Clute, speaker of mankind, present to the convention his evidences of the Mahometan religion, a work evincing the nullity of all religions, with thanks. There shall be universal republic now, thinks Clutes, and one God only, le peuple. The French nation is of gregarious, imitative nature. It needed but a fugal motion of this matter, and Goose Gobel, driven by municipality and force of circumstances, has given one. What curé will be behind him of Boissy's? What bishop behind him of Paris? Bishop Grégoire, indeed, courageously declines to the sound of We force no one, let Grégoire consult his conscience, but Protestant and Romish by the hundred, volunteer and assent. From far and near, all through November, into December, till the work is accomplished, come letters of renegation, come curates who are learning to be carpenters, curates with their new wedded nuns. Has not the day of reason dawned very swiftly and become noon? From sequestered townships comes addresses, stating plainly, though in Patois dialect, that they will have no more to do with the black animal called curé, animal noir, appelé curé. Above all things, there comes patriotic gifts of church furniture. The remnant of bells, except for toxin, descend from their belfries into the national melting pot to make cannon. Censers and all sacred vessels are beaten broad. Of silver they are fit for the poverty-stricken mint. Of pewter let them become bullets to shoot the enemies of du genre humain. Dalmatics of plush make breeches for him who has none. Linen stoles will clip into shirts for the defenders of the country. Old clothesmen, Jew or heathen, drive the briskest trade. Chalier's ass procession at Lyon was but a type of what went on in those same days in all towns. In all towns and townships, as quick as the guillotine may go, so quick goes the axe and the wrench. Sacristies, lutrins, ultra-rails are pulled down, the mass books torn into cartridge papers, men dance the carmagnole all night about the bonfire. All highways jingle with metallic priest-tackle beaten broad, sent to the convention, to the poverty-stricken mint. 
Good Saint de Genevieve's chassis let down, alas, to be burst open this time and burnt on the place de Grève. Saint Louis's shirt is burnt. Might not a defender of the country have had it? As Saint Denis town, no longer Saint Denis, but Franciard, patriotism has been down among the tombs, rummaging. The revolutionary army has taken spoil. This, accordingly, is what the streets of Paris saw. Most of these persons were still drunk with the brandy they had swallowed out of chalices, eating mackerel on the patinas. Mounted on asses which were housed with priests' cloaks, they reined them with priests' stoles. They held clutched with the same hand, communion cup and sacred wafer. They stopped at the doors of dram shops, held out ciboriums, and the landlord, stoop in hand, had to fill them thrice. Next came mules, high laden with crosses, chandeliers, censers, holy water vessels, hyssops, recalling to mind the priests of Sibylle, whose panniers, filled with the instruments of their worship, served at once as storehouse, sacristy and temple. In such equipage did these profaners advance towards the convention. They enter there in an immense train, ranged in two rows, all masked like mummers in fantastic sacerdotal vestments, bearing on hand barrows their heaped plunder, ciboriums, suns, candelabras, plates of gold and silver. The address we do not give, for indeed it was in strophe sung viva voce with all the parts, Danton glooming considerably in his place and demanding that there be prose and decency in future. Nevertheless, the captors of such spolia opima crave, not untouched with liquor, permission to dance the Carmagnole also on the spot, whereto an exhilarated convention cannot but accede. Nay, several members, continues the exaggerative Messier, who was not there to witness, being in limbo now as one of Dupere's seventy-three, several members, quitting their curule chairs, took the hand of girls flaunting in priest's vestures and danced the Carmagnole along with them. Such old hallowtide have they in this year, once named of Grace, 1793 out of which strange fall of formulas, tumbling there in confused welter, betrampled by the patriotic dance, is it not passing strange to see a new formula arise? For the human tongue is not adequate to speak what triviality run distracted there is in human nature. Black mumbo-jumbo of the woods and most Indian wow-wows one can understand, but this of procureur Anaxagoras, while on John Peter Chaumet, we will say only, man is born idol-worshipper, sight-worshipper, so sensuous imaginative is he, and also partakes much of the nature of the ape. For the same day, while this brave Carmagnol dance has hardly jigged itself out, there arrive procureur Chaumet and municipals and departmentals, and with them the strangest freightage, a new religion. Demoiselle Candé of the opera, a woman fair to look upon when well rouged. She, born on palanquin, shoulder high with red woollen nightcap, in azure mantle, garlanded with oak, holding in her hand the pike of the Jupiter purpler, sails in, heralded by white young women girt in tricolour. Let the world consider it. This, O oh, national convention, wonder of the universe, is our new divinity, Goddess of reason, worthy and alone worthy of revering. Nay, were it too much to ask of an august national representation that it also went with us to the seat of an cathedral called of Notre Dame and executed a few strophes in worship of her? President and secretaries give Goddess Candé, born at due height round their platform, successively the fraternal kiss, whereupon she, by decree, sails to the right hand of the President and there alights. And now, after due pause and flourishes of oratory, the convention, gathering its limbs, does get under way in the required procession towards Notre Dame. Reason, again in her litter, sitting in the van of them, borne as one judges by men in the Roman costume, escorted by wind music, red nightcaps and the madness of the world. 
And so straightway, reason, taking seat on the high altar of Notre Dame, the requisite worship, or quasi-worship, is, say the newspapers, executed. National Convention chanting, The Hymn to Liberty, Words by Chenier, Music by Gothek. It is the first of the Feasts of Reason, first communion service of the new religion of Chaumet. The corresponding festival in the Church of St. Eustache, says Mercier, offered the spectacle of a great tavern. The interior of the choir represented a landscape decorated with cottages and boskets of trees. Round the choir stood tables overloaded with bottles, with sausages, pork puddings, pastries and other meats. The guests flowed in and out through all doors. Whosoever presented himself took part of the good things. Children of eight, girls as well as boys, put hand to plate in sign of liberty. They drank also of the bottles, and their prompt intoxication created laughter. Reason sat in Asia mantle, aloft in a serene manner, cannoneers, pipe in mouth, serving her as acolytes. And out of doors, continues the exaggerative man, were mad multitudes dancing round the bonfire of chapel balustrades, of priests and cannon stalls, and the dancers, I exaggerate nothing, the dancers nigh bare of breeches, neck and breast naked, stockings down, went whirling and spinning like those dust vortexes, forerunners of tempest and destruction. At St. Gervais Church, again, there was a terrible smell of herrings. Section or municipality having provided no food, no condiment, but left it to chance. Other mysteries, seemingly of a Kabyric or even Paphian character, we heave under the veil, which appropriately stretches itself along the pillars of the aisles, not to be lifted aside by the hand of history. But there is one thing we should like almost better to understand than any other. What reason herself thought of it all the while? What articulate words poor Mrs. Momora, for example, uttered when she had become ungoddessed again, and the bibliopolist and she sat quiet at home at supper? For he was an earnest man, bookseller Momora, and had notions of agrarian law. Mrs. Momora, it is admitted, made one of the best goddesses of reason, though her teeth were a little defective. And now, if the reader will represent to himself that such visible adoration of reason went on all over the Republic, through these November and December weeks, till the church woodwork was burnt out and the business otherwise completed, he will feel sufficiently what an adoring Republic it was, and without reluctance, quit this part of the subject. Such gifts of church spoil are chiefly the work of the Armée Révolutionnaire, raised, as we said, some time ago. It is an army with portable guillotine, commanded by playwright Rancin in terrible mustachios, and even by some uncertain shadow of Asher Maillard, the old Bastille hero, leader of the Minette, September Man in Grey. Clark Vincent, of the war office, one of Pasha's old clerks, with a head heated by the ancient orators, had a main hand in the appointments, at least in the staff appointments. But of the marchings and retreatings of these six thousand, no Xenophon exists. Nothing but an inarticulate hum of cursing and sooty frenzy, surviving dubious in the memory of ages. They scour the country round Paris, seeking prisoners, raising requisitions, seeing that edicts are executed, that the farmers have thrashed sufficiently, lowering church bells or metallic virgins. Detachments shoot forth dim towards remote parts of France. Nay, new provincial revolutionary armies rise dim, here and there, as Carrier's Company of Marat, as Talien's Bordeaux Troop, like sympathetic clouds in an atmosphere all electric, Rancin, they say, admitted in candid moments that his troops were the elixir of the rascality of the earth. 
One sees them drawn up in market places, travel plashed, rough bearded, in carmagno complete. The first exploit is to prostrate what royal or ecclesiastical monument, crucifix or the like there may be, to plant a cannon at the steeple, fetch down the bell without climbing for it, bell and belfry together. This, however, it is said, depends somewhat on the size of the town. If the town contains much population, and these perhaps of a dubious choleric aspect, the revolutionary army will do its work gently, by ladder and wrench. Nay, perhaps will take its billet without work at all, and refreshing itself with a little liquor and sleep, pass on to the next stage. Pipe in cheek, sabre on thigh, in carmagnol complete. Such things have been, and may again be. Charles II sent out his highland host over the western Scotch Whigs. Jamaica planters got dogs from the Spanish main to hunt their maroons with. France, too, is bescowed with the devil's pack, the baying of which, at this distance of half a century, still sounds in the mind's ear. End of Book 5, Chapter 4《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3 The Guillotine Book 5 Terror The Order of the Day Chapter 5 Like a Thundercloud This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 5 Chapter 5 Like a Thundercloud but the grand and indeed substantially primary and generic aspect of the consummation of terror remains still to be looked at. Nay, Blinkard history has for most part all but overlooked this aspect, the soul of the whole, that which makes it terrible to the enemies of France. Let despotism and Sumerian coalitions consider. All French men and French things are in a state of requisition, Fourteen armies are got on foot. Patriotism, with all that it has of faculty in heart or in head, in soul or body or breeches pocket, is rushing to the frontiers to prevail or die. Busy sits Carnot in salut public, busy for his share in organising victory. Not swifter pulses that guillotine in dread systole diastole in the Place de la Révolution than smites the sword of patriotism, smiting Samaria back to its own borders from the sacred soil. In fact, the government is what we can call revolutionary, and some men are à la hauteur, on a level with the circumstances, and others are not à la hauteur, so much the worse for them. But the anarchy, we may say, has organised itself. Society is literally overset, its old forces working with mad activity, but in the inverse order, destructive and self-destructive. Curious to see how all still refers itself to some head and fountain. Not even an anarchy, but must have a centre to revolve round. It is now some six months since the Committee of Salut Public came into existence, some three months since Danton proposed that all power should be given it and a sum of fifty millions and the government be declared revolutionary. He himself since that day would take no hand in it, though again and again solicited, but sits private in his place on the mountain. Since that day the nine, or if they should even rise to twelve, have become permanent, always re-elected when their term runs out, Salut public, sûreté générale, have assumed their ulterior form and mode of operating. Committee of Public Salvation as supreme, of general surety as subaltern. These, like a lesser and a greater council, most harmonious hitherto, have become the centre of all things. They ride this whirlwind. They, raised by force of circumstances, insensibly, very strangely, thither to that dread height, and guide it and seem to guide it. Stranger set of cloud compellers the earth never saw. A Robespierre, a Billot, a Collot, Couton, Saint-Just, not to mention still meaner Amar, Vadier, in Surete Générale. These are your cloud compellers. Small intellectual talent is necessary, 
Indeed, where among them, except in the head of Kano, busied organising victory, would you find any? The talent is one of instinct, rather. It is that of divining aright what this great dumb whirlwind wishes and wills, that of willing with more frenzy than anyone else what all the world wills. To stand at no obstacles, to heed no considerations, human or divine, to know well that, of divine or human, there is one thing needful, triumph of the Republic, destruction of the enemies of the Republic. With this one spiritual endowment and so few others, it is strange to see how a dumb, inarticulately storming whirlwind of things puts, as it were, its reins into your hand and invites and compels you to be the leader of it. Hard by sits a municipality of Paris, all in red nightcaps since the 4th of November last, a set of men fully on a level with circumstances, or even beyond it. Sleek mayor Pache, studious to be safe in the middle. Chaumette, Hébert, Valet, and Henriot, their great commandant, not to speak of Vincent, the war clerk, or Momoro, Dobson, and such like, all intent to have churches plundered, to have reason adored, suspects cut down, and the revolution triumph. Perhaps carrying the matter too far? Danton was heard to grumble at the civics trophies and to recommend prose and decency. Robespierre also grumbles that in overturning superstition we did not mean to make a religion of atheism. In fact, your Chaumette and company constitute a kind of hyper-Jacobinism or rabid faction des enragés, which has given orthodox patriotism some umbrage of late months. To know a suspect on the streets, what is this but bringing the law of the suspect itself into ill odour? Men half frantic, men zealous over much, they toil here in their red nightcaps, restlessly, rapidly, accomplishing what of life is allotted them. And the 44,000 other townships, each with revolutionary committee, based on Jacobin daughter society, enlightened by the spirit of Jacobinism, quickened by the 40 sous a day. The French constitution spurned always at anything like two chambers, and yet behold, has it not verily got two chambers? National convention elected for one, mother of patriotism self-elected for another. Mother of Patriotism has her debates reported in the Moniteur as important state procedures, which indisputably they are. A second chamber of legislature we call this Mother Society, if perhaps it were not rather comparable to that old Scotch body named Lords of the Articles, without whose origination and signal given the so-called Parliament could introduce no bill, could do no work. Robespierre himself, whose words are a law, opens his incorruptible lips copiously in the Jacobins' hall. Smaller Council of Salut Public, Greater Council of Sûreté Générale, all active parties come here to plead, to shape beforehand what decisions they must arrive at, what destiny they have to expect. Now, if a question arose, which of those two chambers, Convention or Lords of the Articles, was the stronger? Happily, they as yet go hand in hand. As for the National Convention, truly it has become a most composed body. Quenched now the old effervescence, the 73 locked in ward, once noisy friends of the Girondins sunk all into silent men of the plain, called even Frogs of the Marsh, Crapaud du Marais. Addresses come, revolutionary church plunder comes, deputations with prose or strophes, these the convention receives. But beyond this, the convention has one thing mainly to do, to listen what Salut Public proposes and say, yay. Bazir, followed by Chabot with some impetuosity, declared one morning that this was not the way of a free assembly. There ought to be an opposition side, a côté droit, cried Chabot. If none else will form it, I will. People say to me, you will all get guillotined in your turn, first you and Bazir, then Danton, then Robespierre himself. So spake the disfrocked with a loud voice. Next week, Bazir and he lie in the abbey, wending, one may fear, towards Tanvir and the axe. And people say to me what seems to be proving true. 
Bazir's blood was all inflamed with revolution fever, with coffee and spasmodic dreams. Chabot, again, how happy with his rich Jew Austrian wife, late Fraulein Frey. But he lies in prison, and his two Jew Austrian brothers in law, the bankers Frey, lie with him, waiting the urn of doom. Let a national convention therefore take warning and know its function. Let the convention, all as one man, set its shoulder to the work, not with bursts of parliamentary eloquence, but in quite other and serviceable ways. Convention commissioners, what we ought to call representatives, representants en mission, fly like the Herald Mercury to all points of the territory, carrying your behests far and wide. In their round hat plumed with tricolour feathers, girt with flowing tricolour taffeta, in close frock, tricolour sash, sword and jack boots, these men are powerfuller than king or kaiser. They say to whomso they meet, do and he must do it. All men's goods are at their disposal, for France is as one huge city in siege. They smite with requisitions and forced loan, they have the power of life and death. Saint-Just and Le Bar order the rich classes of Strasbourg to strip off their shoes and send them to the armies where as many as 10,000 pairs are needed. Also that within four and twenty hours a thousand beds are to be got ready, wrapped in matting and sent under way. For the time presses, like swift bolts issuing from the fuliginous Olympus of Salut Public, rush these men, oftenest in pairs. Scatter your thunder orders over France. Make France one enormous revolutionary thundercloud. End of Book 5, Chapter 5《The French Revolution A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 5, Terror, The Order of the Day, Chapter 6, Do Thy Duty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 5, Chapter 6, Do Thy Duty. Accordingly, alongside of these bonfires of church balustrades and sounds of fusillading and noyarding, there rise quite another sort of fires and sounds, smithy fires and proof follies for the manufacture of arms. Cut off from Sweden and the world, the Republic must learn to make steel for itself, and, by the aid of chemists, she has learnt it. Towns that knew only iron now know steel, from their new dungeons at Chantilly, aristocrats may hear the rustle of our new steel furnace there. Do not bells transmute themselves into cannon, iron stanchions into the white weapons, arme blanche, by sword cutlery? The wheels of Langres scream amid their sputtering fire halo, grinding mere swords. The stithies of Charville ring with gun-making, what say we, Charville? Two hundred and fifty-eight forges stand in the open spaces of Paris itself, a hundred and forty of them in the Esplanade of the Invalide, fifty-four in the Luxembourg Garden. So many forges stand, grim smiths beating and forging at lock and barrel there. The clockmakers have come, requisitioned to do the touch-holes, the hard solder and file-work. Five great barges swing at anchor on the Seine stream, loud with boring, the great press drills grating harsh thunder to the general ear and heart. And deft stockmakers do gouge and rasp, and all men bestir themselves according to their cunning. In the language of hope it is reckoned that a thousand finished muskets can be delivered daily. Chemists of the Republic have taught us miracles of swift tanning. The cordwainer bores and stitches, not of wood and pasteboard, or he shall answer it to Tanvir. The women sew tents and coats, the children scrape surgeon's lint, the old men sit in the marketplace, able men are on march, all men in requisition. From town to town flutters on the heavens winds this banner, the French people risen against tyrants. All which is well. But now arises the question, what is to be done for saltpetre? Uninterrupted commerce and the English navy shut us out from saltpetre, and without saltpetre there is no gunpowder. Republican science again sits meditative, discovers that saltpetre exists here and there, though in attenuated quantity. 
that old plaster of walls holds a sprinkling of it, that the earth of the Paris cellars holds a sprinkling of it, diffused through the common rubbish, that were these dug up and washed, saltpetre might be had. Whereupon swiftly see the citoyen with upshoved bonnet rouge or with doffed bonnet and hair toil wetted, digging fiercely, each in his own cellar, for saltpetre. The earth heap rises at every door, the citoyen with hod and bucket carry it up, the citoyen pith in every muscle, shovelling and digging for life and saltpetre. Dig, my braves, and right well speed ye. What of saltpetre is essential the Republic shall not want. Consummation of Sanscolotism has many aspects and tints, but the brightest tint, really, of a solar or stellar brightness is this which the armies give it, that same fervour of Jacobinism which internally fills France with hatred, suspicion, scaffolds and reason-worship, does on the frontier show itself as a glorious Pope Patria Mori. Ever since Dumouriez's defection, three convention representatives attend every general. Committee of Salut has sent them, often with this laconic order only, Do thy duty, fais ton devoir. It is strange under what impediments the fire of Jacobinism, like other such fires, will burn. These soldiers have shoes of wood and pasteboard, or go booted in hay ropes in dead of winter. They skewer a bass mat round their shoulders and are destitute of most things. What then? It is for rights of Frenchhood, of manhood, that they fight. The unquenchable spirit, here as elsewhere, works miracles. With steel and bread, says the convention representative, one may get to China. The generals go faster the guillotine, justly and unjustly. From which, what inference? This, among others, that ill success is death, that in victory alone is life. To conquer or die is no theatrical palabra in these circumstances, but a practical truth and necessity. All Girondism, halfness, compromise, is swept away. Forward, ye soldiers of the Republic, captain and man, dash with your Gallic impetuosity on Austria, England, Prussia, Spain, Sardinia, Pitt, Coburg, York, and the devil and the world. Behind us is but the guillotine. Before us is victory, apotheosis, and millennium without end. See, accordingly, on all frontiers, how the sons of night, astonished after short triumph, do recoil, the sons of the Republic flying at them with wild serral or marseilles or arms, with the temper of catamountain or demon incarnate, which no son of night can stand. Spain, which came bursting through the Pyrenees, rustling with Bourbon banners and went conquering here and there for a season, falters at such catamountain welcome, draws itself in again. Too happy now are the Pyrenees impassable. Not only does Dugomier, conqueror of Toulon, drive Spain back, he invades Spain. General Dugomier invades it by the eastern Pyrenees. General Muller shall invade it by the western. Shall, that is the word, Committee of Salut Public has said it. Representative Cavagnac, on mission there, must see it done. Impossible, cries Muller. Infallible, answers Cavagnac. Difficulty, impossibility is to no purpose. The committee is deaf on that side of its head, answers Cavagnac. N'entend pas de cette oreille-là. How many wantest thou of men, of horses, cannons? Thou shalt have them. Conquerors, conquered or hanged, forward we must. Which things also, even as the representative spake them, were done. The spring of the new year sees Spain invaded, and redoubts are carried, and passes and heights of the most scarp description. Spanish field officerism struck mute at such cat-to-mountain spirit, the cannon forgetting to fire. Swept are the Pyrenees, town after town flies up, burst by terror or the petard. In the course of another year, Spain will crave peace, acknowledge its sins, and the Republic. Nay, in Madrid there will be joy as for a victory that even peace is got. Few things we repeat can be notabler than these convention representatives with their power more than kingly. Nay, at bottom are they not kings, able men of a sort, chosen from the 749 French kings, with this order, Do thy duty. 
representative levasseur of small stature, by trade a mere Pacific surgeon accoucheur, as mutinies to quell, mad hosts, mad at the doom of Custine, bellowing far and wide. He alone amid them, the one small representative, small but as hard as flint, which also carries fire in it. So too at Hunschutten, far in the afternoon, he declares that the battle is not lost, that it must be gained, and fights himself with his own obstetric hand, horse shot under him, or say on foot, up to the haunches in tide water, cutting staccato and passado there in defiance of water, earth, air and fire, the choleric little representative that he was whereby, as natural, Royal Highness of York had to withdraw, occasionally at full gallop, like to be swallowed by the tide, and his siege of Dunkirk became a dream, realising only much loss of beautiful siege artillery and of brave lives. General Houchard, it would appear, stood behind a hedge on this Honshuten occasion, wherefore they have since guillotined him. A new General Jourdain, late Sergeant Jourdain, commands in his stead. He, in long-winded battles of Vatigny, murderous artillery fire, mingling itself with sound of revolutionary battle hymns, forces Austria behind the Sambre again, has hopes of purging the soil of liberty. With hard wrestling, with artillerying and sa-erraing, it shall be done. In the course of a new summer, Valenciennes will see itself beleaguered, Condé beleaguered, whatsoever is yet in the hands of Austria beleaguered and bombarded. Nay, by convention decree, we even summon them all either to surrender in twenty-four hours or else be put to the sword. A high saying, which, though it remains unfulfilled, may show what spirit one is of. Representative Drouet, as an old dragoon, could fight by a kind of second nature, but he was unlucky. Him, in a night foray at Maubeuge, the Austrians took alive in October last. They stripped him almost naked, he says, making a show of him as king-taker of Varennes. They flung him into carts, sent him far into the interior of Samaria, to a fortress called Spitzberg on the Danube River, and left him there, at an elevation of perhaps a hundred and fifty feet, to his own bitter reflections. Reflections, and also devices. For the indomitable old dragoon constructs wing machinery of paper kite, soars window bars, determines to fly down. He will seize a boat, will follow the river's course, land somewhere in Crim Tartary in the Black Sea or Constantinople region, a la Sinbad. Authentic history, accordingly, looking far into Samaria, discerns dimly a phenomenon. In the dead night watches, the Spitzberg sentry is near fainting with terror. Is it a huge, vague portent descending through the night air? It is a huge national representative old dragoon descending by paper kite, too rapidly, alas. For Drouet had taken with him a small provision store, twenty pounds weight or thereby, which proved accelerative. So he fell, fracturing his leg, and lay there, moaning, till day dawned, till you could discern clearly that he was not a portent, but a representative. Or see Saint Just in the lines of Weissenberg. Though physically of a timid, apprehensive nature, how he charges with his Alsatian peasants armed hastily for the nonce, the solemn face of him blazing into flame, his black hair and trickler hat taffeta flowing in the breeze. These our lines of Weissenberg were indeed forced, and Prussia and the emigrants rolled through, but we reinforced the lines of Weissenberg, and Prussia and the emigrants rolled back again, still faster, hurled with bayonet charges and fiery sarrying. See devant Sergeant Pichegru, see devant Sergeant Hoche, risen now to be generals, have done wonders here. Tall Pichegru was meant for the church, was teacher of mathematics once at Brienne School. His remarkablest pupil there was the boy Napoleon Bonaparte. He then, not in the sweetest humour, enlisted, exchanging for ruler for musket, and had got the length of the halberd, beyond which nothing could be hoped, when the Bastille barriers falling made passage for him, and he is here. Hoche bore a hand at the literal overturn of the Bastille, he was, as we saw, a sergeant of the Garde Francaise, spending his pay in rushlights and cheap editions of books. 
how the mountains are burst and many an Enceladus is disimprisoned and captains founding on four parchments of nobility are blown with their parchments across the Rhine into lunar limbo. What high feats of arms therefore were done in these fourteen armies and how for love of liberty and hope of promotion low-born valour cut its desperate way to generalship and from the central Carno in Salut Public to the outmost drummer on the frontier men strove for their republic. Let readers fancy. The snows of winter, the flowers of summer continued to be stained with warlike blood Gaelic impetuosity mounts ever higher with victory. Spirit of Jacobinism weds itself to national vanity. The soldiers of the Republic are becoming, as we prophesied, very sons of fire. Barefooted, barebacked, but with bread and iron, you can get to China. It is one nation against the whole world, but the nation has that within her which the whole world will not conquer. Samaria, astonished, recoils faster or slower. All round the Republic there rises, fiery as it were, a magic ring of musket volleying and sar Majesty of Prussia as Majesty of Spain will by and by acknowledge his sins and the Republic and make a peace of Baal. Foreign commerce, colonies, factories in the East and in the West are fallen or falling into the hands of sea-ruling Pitt, enemy of human nature. Nevertheless, what sound is this that we hear on the 1st of June, 1794? Sound of as war thunder born from the ocean, too, of tone most piercing. War thunder from off the breast waters. Viare joyeuse and English howe, after long manoeuvring, have ranked themselves there and are belching fire. The enemies of human nature are on their own element, cannot be conquered, cannot be kept from conquering. Twelve hours of raging cannonade, sun now sinking westward through the battle smoke, six French ships taken, the battle lost. What ships, however, can still sail making off? But how is it, then, with that vengeur ship? She neither strikes nor makes off. She is lamed, she cannot make off. Strike, she will not. Fire rakes her fore and aft. From victorious enemies, the vengeur is sinking. Strong are ye tyrants of the sea, yet we also are we weak? Lo, all flags, streamers, jacks, every rag of trickler that will yet run on rope, fly rustling aloft, the whole crew crowds to the upper deck, and with universal soul-maddening yell shouts, Viva la République! Sinking, sinking. She staggers, she lurches, her last drunk whirl, ocean yawns abysmal. Down rushes the vengeur, carrying Viva la République along with her, unconquerable, into eternity. Let foreign despots think of that. There is an unconquerable in man when he stands on his rights of man. Let despots and slaves and all people know this, and only them that stand on the wrongs of man tremble to know it. So has history written nothing doubting of the sunk vengeur. Reader, Mende Pinto, Munchausen, Cagliostro, Salmanazer have been great, but they are not the greatest. O oh, Barrer, Barrer, Anacreon of the Guillotine, must inquisitive pictorial history in a new edition ask again, how is it with the vengeur in this its glorious suicidal sinking, and with resentful brush dash a bend sinister of contumelious lamp black through thee and it? Alas, alas, the vengeur, after fighting bravely, did sink altogether as other ships do, her captain and above two hundred of her crew escaping gladly in British boats, and this same enormous inspiring feat and rumour of sound most piercing turns out to be an enormous inspiring non-entity, extant nowhere save as falsehood in the brain of Barre. Actually so. Founded like the world itself on nothing, proved by convention report, by solemn convention decree and decrees and wooden model of the vengeur, believed, bewept, besung by the whole French people to this hour, it may be regarded as Barrère's masterpiece, the largest, most inspiring piece of blague manufactured for some centuries by any man or nation. As such and not otherwise, be it henceforth memorable. End of Book 5, Chapter 6
The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 5, Terror, The Order of the Day, Chapter 7, Flame Picture. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 5, Chapter 7, Flame Picture. In this manner, mad, blazing with flame of all imaginable tints, from the red of Toffer to the stellar bright, blazes off this consummation of sans calotism. But the hundredth part of the things that were done, and the thousandth part of the things that were projected and decreed to be done, would tire the tongue of history. Statue of the purple sovereign, high as Strasbourg's steeple, which shall fling its shadow from the Pont Neuf over Jardin National and Convention Hall, enormous in painter David's head. With other, the like enormous statues, not a few, realised in paper decree. For indeed, the Statue of Liberty herself is still but plaster in the Place de la Révolution. Then equalisation of weights and measures with decimal division, institutions of music and of much else, institute in general, school of art, school of Mars, élève de la patrie, normal schools. Amid such gun-boring, altar-burning, saltpetre-digging and miraculous improvements in tannery. What, for example, is this that engineer Schapp is doing in the Parc of Vincennes? In the Parc of Vincennes, and onwards, they say, is the Parc of Le Palettier saint vargo the assassinated deputy, and still onwards to the heights of Ecoen and further. He has scaffolding set up, has posts driven in. Wooden arms with elbow joints are jerking and fugling in the air in the most rapid, mysterious manner. Citoyens run up suspicious. Yes, O oh citoyen, we are signalling. It is a device, this worthy of the Republic, a thing for what we will call far writing, without the aid of post bags. In Greek, it shall be named telegraph. Telegraph sacre, answers citoyenism, for writing to traitors, to Austria, and tears it down. Sharp had to escape and get a new legislative decree. Nevertheless, he has accomplished it, the indefatigable chap. This his far writer, with its wooden arms and elbow joints, can intelligibly signal, and lines of them are set up to the north frontiers and elsewhere. On an autumn evening of the year two, far writers, having just written that Condé Town has surrendered to us, we send from Tuileries Convention Hall this response in the shape of decree. The name of Condé is changed to Nord Libre, North Free. The army of the North ceases not to merit well of the country. To the admiration of men, for lo, in some half hour while the convention yet debates, there arrives this new answer. I inform thee, je t'annonce, citizen president, that the decree of convention ordering change of the name Condé into North Free, and the other declaring that the army of the North ceases not to merit well of the country, are transmitted and acknowledged by telegraph. I have instructed my officer at Lee to forward them to North Free by express. Signed, Sharp. Or see, over Fleurus in the Netherlands, where General Jourdan, having now swept the soil of liberty and advanced thus far, is just about to fight and sweep or be swept things there not in the heaven's vault. Some prodigy seen by Austrian eyes and spyglasses in the similitude of an enormous wind bag with netting and enormous saucer depending from it. A Jove's balance, O ye Austrian spyglasses. One saucer hole of a Jove's balance, you poor Austrian scale, having kicked itself quite aloft out of sight. By heaven, answer the spyglasses, it is a Montgolfier, a balloon, and they are making signals. Austrian cannon battery barks at this Montgolfier, harmless as dog at the moon. The Montgolfier makes its signals, detects what Austrian ambuscade they may be, and descends at its ease. What will not these devils incarnate contrive? On the whole, is it not, O oh reader, one of the strangest flame pictures that ever painted itself, flaming off there on its ground of guillotine black and the nightly theatres are twenty-three, and the salon de danse are sixty, full of mere égalité, fraternité, and carmagnole. 
and section committee rooms are forty-eight, redolent of tobacco and brandy, vigorous with twenty pence a day, coercing the suspect. And the houses of arrest are twelve for Paris alone, crowded and even crammed. And at all turns you need your certificate of civism, be it for going out or for coming in. Nay, without it you cannot, for money, get your daily ounces of bread. Dusky red-capped bakers' queues wagging themselves not in silence. For we still live by maximum in all things, waited on by these two, scarcity and confusion. The faces of men are darkened with suspicion, with suspecting or being suspect. The streets lie unswept, the ways unmended. Law, as shut of books, speaks little save impromptu through the throat of Tanville. Crimes go unpunished, not crimes against the revolution. The number of foundling children, as some compute, is doubled. How silent now, sits royalism, sits all aristocratism, respectability that kept its geek. The honour now and the safety is to poverty, not to wealth. Your citizen, who would be fashionable, walks abroad with his wife on his arm in red wool nightcap, black shag spencer and carmagnol complet. Aristocratism crouches low in what shelter is still left, submitting to all requisitions, vexations, too happy to escape with life. Ghastly chateaux stare on you by the wayside, disroofed, diswindowed, which the national housebroker is peeling for the lead and ashlar. The old tenants hover disconsolate over the Rhine with Condé, a spectacle to men. Ci devant seigneur, exquisite in pallet, will become an exquisite restaurateur cook in Hamburg. Ci devant madame, exquisite in dress, a successful marchand des modes in London. In Newgate Street you meet Monsieur le Marquis with a rough deal on his shoulder, ads and jackplane under arm. He has taken to the joiner trade, it being necessary to live for vivre. Higher than all Frenchmen, the domestic stock jobber flourishes in a day of paper money. The farmer also flourishes. Farmers' houses, says Mercier, have become like pawnbrokers' shops. All manner of furniture, apparel, vessels of gold and silver accumulate themselves there. Bread is precious. The farmer's rent is paper money, and he alone of men has bread. Farmer is better than landlord, and will himself become landlord. And daily, we say, like a black spectre, Silently through that life tumult passes the revolution cart, writing on the walls its menne menne, thou art weighed and found wanting. A spectre with which one has grown familiar. Men have adjusted themselves. Complaint issues not from that death tumbrel. Weak women and ci devant, their plumage and finery all tarnished, sit there with a silent gaze as if looking into the infinite black. The once light lip wears a curl of irony, uttering no word, and the tumbrel fares along. They may be guilty before heaven, or not. They are guilty, we suppose, before the revolution. Then does not the Republic coin money of them with its great axe? Red nightcaps howl dire reproval. The rest of Paris looks on, if with a sigh, that is much. Fellow creatures whom sighing cannot help, whom black necessity and ten via have clutched. One other thing, or rather two other things, we will still mention and no more. The blonde perukes, the tannery at Meudon. Great talk is of these peruque blonde. O oh, reader, they are made from the heads of guillotined women. The locks of a duchess in this way may come to cover the scalp of a cordwainer. Her blonde German Frankism, his black Gaelic pole, if it be bald. Or they may be worn affectionately as relics, rendering one suspect. Citizens use them, not without mockery, of a rather cannibal sort. Still deeper into one's heart goes that tannery at Meudon, not mentioned among the other miracles of tanning. At Meudon, says Montgaillard with considerable calmness, there was a tannery of human skins, such of the guillotined as seemed worth flaying, of which perfectly good wash leather was made, for breeches and other uses. 
The skin of the men, he remarks, was superior in toughness, consistance, and quality to chamois. That of women was good for almost nothing, being so soft in texture. History looking back over cannibalism, through Perchard's pilgrims and all early and late records, will perhaps find no terrestrial cannibalism of a sort on the whole so detestable. It is a manufactured, soft-feeling, quietly elegant sort, a sort perfide. Alas, then, is man's civilization only a rapage, through which the savage nature of him can still burst, infernal as ever. Nature still makes him, and has an infernal in her as well as a celestial. End of Book 5, Chapter 7《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine. Book 6, Thermidor. Chapter 1, The Gods Are a Thirst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 6, Chapter 1, The Gods Are a Thirst. What then is this thing called La Révolution, which, like an angel of death, hangs over France, Noyarding, fusillading, fighting, gun-boring, tanning human skins. La Révolution is but so many alphabetic letters, a thing nowhere to be laid hands on, to be clapped under lock and key. Where is it? What is it? It is the madness that dwells in the hearts of men. In this man it is, and in that man, as a rage or as a terror, it is in all men. Invisible, impalpable. And yet no black Azrael, with wings spread over half a continent, with swords sweeping from sea to sea, could be a truer reality. To explain, what is called explaining, the march of this revolutionary government, be no task of ours. Men cannot explain it. A paralytic couton asking in the Jacobins, What hast thou done to be hanged if the counter-revolution should arrive? A sombre Saint-Just, not yet six-and-twenty, declaring that, for revolutionists, there is no rest but in the tomb. A sea-green Robespierre, converted into vinegar and gall. Much more, an Amar and Vadir, a Colo and Biur. To inquire what thoughts, predetermination or prevision might be in the head of these men. Record of their thought remains not. Death and darkness have swept it out utterly. Nay, if we even had their thought, all they could have articulately spoken to us, how insignificant a fraction were that of the thing which realises itself, which decreed itself, on signal given by them. As has been said more than once, this revolutionary government is not a self-conscious, but a blind, fatal one. Each man, enveloped in his ambient atmosphere of revolutionary fanatic madness, rushes on, impelled and impelling, and has become a blind brute force, no rest for him but in the grave. Darkness and the mystery of horrid cruelty cover it for us in history, as they did in nature. The chaotic thundercloud, with its pitchy black and its tumult of dazzling jagged fire, in a world all electric, thou wilt not undertake to show how that comported itself, what the secrets of its dark womb were, from what sources, from what specialities the lightning it held did, in confused brightness of terror, strike forth, destructive and self-destructive, till it ended? like a blackness, naturally of Erebus, which by will of providence had for once mounted itself in dominion and the azure. Is not this properly the nature of Sanscolotism consummating itself? Of which Erebus blackness, be it enough to discern that this and the other dazzling firebolt, dazzling fire torrent, does by small volition and great necessity verily issue in such and such succession, destructive so and so, self destructive so and so, till it end. Royalism is extinct, sunk as they say in the mud of the Loire. Republicanism dominates without and within. What, therefore, on the 15th day of March, 1794, is this? A restaurant, suddenly really as a bolt out of the blue, has hit strange victims. Hébert Père Duchesne, Bibliopolist Mamoro, 
Clark Vincent, General Rancin, High Cordelier patriots, red-capped magistrates of Paris, worshippers of reason, commanders of revolutionary army. Eight short days ago, their Cordelier club was loud and louder than ever with patriot denunciations. Hébert Pay Duchesne had held his tongue and his heart these two months at sight of moderates, crypto-aristocrats, Camilla, Scalera in the convention itself, but could not do it any longer, would, if other remedy were not, invoke the sacred right of insurrection. So spake Hébert in Cordelia session, with vivats till the roofs rang again, eight short days ago, and now, already... They rub their eyes. It is no dream. They find themselves in the Luxembourg. Guscobel, too, and they that burnt churches. Chomet himself, potent procureur, agent national, as they now call it, who could recognise the suspect by the very face of them. He lingers but three days. On the third day, he, too, is hurled in. Most chop-fallen blue enters the national agent this limbo, whither he has sent so many. Prisoners crowd round, jibing and jeering. Sublime national agent, says one, in virtue of thy immortal proclamation, lo there, I am suspect, thou art suspect, he is suspect, we are suspect, ye are suspect, they are suspect. The meaning of these things? Meaning? It is a plot, plot of the most extensive ramifications, which, however, Barère holds the threads of. Such church-burning and scandalous masquerades of atheism fit to make the revolution odious. Where, indeed, could they originate but in the gold of Pitt? Pitt, indubitably, as preternatural insight will teach one, did hire this faction of enrage to play their fantastic tricks, to roar in their Cordelia's club about moderatism, to print their Père Duchesne, worship sky-blue reason in red nightcap, rob all altars, and bring the spoil to us. Still more indubitable, visible to the mere bodily sight, is this, that the Cordelia's club sits pale with anger and terror, and has veiled the rights of man without effect. Likewise, that the Jacobins are in considerable confusion, busy purging themselves, c'est spurant, as in times of plot and public calamity they have repeatedly had to do. Not even Camille de Moulin but has given offence. Nay, there have risen murmurs against Danton himself, though he bellowed them down, and Robespierre finished the matter by embracing him in the tribune. Whom shall the Republic and a jealous mother society trust? In these times of temptation, of preternatural insight. For there are factions of the stranger, de l'étranger, factions of moderates, of enraged, all manner of factions. We walk in a world of plots, strings universally spread of deadly gins and fall traps baited by the gold of pit. Klutz, speaker of mankind, so called, with his evidences of Mohammedan religion and babble of universal republic. Him, an incorruptible Robespierre, has purged away. Baron Klutz and Payne, rebellious needlemen, lie these two months in the Luxembourg, limbs of the faction de l'étranger. Representative Felipeau is purged out. He came back from La Vendée with an ill report in his mouth against rogue Rossignol and our method of warfare there. Recant it, O oh Felipeau, we entreat thee. Felipeau will not recant, and is purged out. Representative Fabre d'Eglantine, faved nomenclator of Rome's calendar, is purged out. Nay, is cast into the Luxembourg, accused of legislative swindling in regard to monies of the India Company. There, with his Chabot, Bazir, guilty of the like, let Fabre wait his destiny. And Vesterman, friend of Danton, he who led the Marseillaise on the 10th of August and fought well in La Vendée, but spoke not well of Rogue Rossignol, is purged out. Lucky if he do go not to the Luxembourg. And your prolis, goodsmans of the faction of the stranger, they have gone. Pereira, though he fled, is gone, taken in the disguise of a tavern cook. I am suspect, thou art suspect, he is suspect. The great heart of Danton is weary of it. 
Danton has gone to native Arcus for a little breathing time of peace. Away, black Arachne web, thou world of fury, terror and suspicion. Welcome, thou everlasting mother, with thy spring greenness, thy kind household loves and memories. True art thou, were all else untrue. The great titan walks silent by the banks of the murmuring orb in young native haunts that knew him when a boy, wonders what the end of these things may be. But, strangest of all, Camille de Moulin is purged out. Couton gave as a test in regard to Jacobin purgation the question, What hast thou done to be hanged if counter-revolution should arrive? Yet Camille, who could so well answer this question, is purged out. The truth is, Camille, early in December last, began publishing a new journal or series of pamphlets entitled The Vieux Cordelier, Old Cordelier. Camille, not afraid at one time to embrace liberty on a heap of dead bodies, begins to ask now whether among so many arresting and punishing committees there ought not to be a committee of mercy. St. Just, he observes, is an extremely solemn young Republican who carries his head as if it were a Saint Sacrament, adorable hostie or divine real presence. Sharply enough, this old Cordelier, Danton and he were of the earliest primary Cordeliers, shoots his glittering war shafts into your new Cordeliers, your Herbert Mormoreaux with their brawling brutalities and despicabilities, say, as the sun god, for poor Camille is a poet, shot into that python serpent sprung of mud. Whereat, as was natural, the Abertus python did hiss and writhe amazingly, and threaten sacred right of insurrection, and, as we saw, get cast into prison. Nay, with all the old wit, dexterity, and light, graceful poignancy, Camille, translating out of Tacitus from the reign of Tiberius, pricks into the law of suspect itself, making it odious. Twice in the decade his wild leaves issue, full of wit, nay, of humour, of harmonious ingenuity and insight, one of the strangest phenomena of that dark time and smite in their wild, sparkling way at various monstrosities, St. Sacrament heads and juggernaut idols in a rather reckless manner. To the great joy of Josephine Beauharnais and the other five thousand and odd suspect who fill the twelve houses of arrest, on whom a ray of hope dawns. Robespierre, at first approbatory, knew not at last what to think, then thought with his Jacobins that Camille must be expelled. A man of true revolutionary spirit, this Camille, but with the unwisest sallies, whom aristocrats and moderates have the art to corrupt. Jacobinism is in uttermost crisis and struggle, enmeshed wholly in plots, corruptibilities, neck gins and baited fall traps of Pit, enemy de genre humain. Camille's first number begins with O oh, Pit. His last is dated 15 Pluvios, year 2, 3rd February 1794, and ends with these words of Montezuma's Les dieux ont soif, the gods are athirst. Be this as it may, the Abertists lie in prison only some nine days. On the 24th of March, therefore, the revolution tumbrils carry through that life tumult a new cargo. Hébert, Vincent, Momoro, Rancin, nineteen of them in all, with whom, curious enough, sits Clutes, speaker of mankind. They have been massed swiftly into a lump, this miscellany of nondescripts, and travel now their last road. No help. They too must look through the little window. They too must sneeze into the sack. Et tenez dans le sac. As they have done to others, so it is done to them. Saint Guillotine, meseems, is worse than the old saints of superstition. A man-devouring saint? Clute, still with an air of polished sarcasm, endeavours to jest, to offer cheering arguments of materialism he requested to be executed last, in order to establish certain principles which philosophy has not retained. General Rancin, too, he still looks forth with some air of defiance, eye of command, 
the rest are sunk in a stony paleness of despair. Mamoro, poor bibliopolist, no agrarian law yet realised, they might as well have hanged the year Devereux twenty months ago when Durand in Buzo hindered them. Hébert Père Duchesne shall never in this world rise in sacred right of insurrection. He sits there low enough, head sunk on breast, red nightcaps shouting round him in frightful parody of his newspaper articles, Grand Colère of the Père Duchesne. Thus perish they, the sack receives all their heads. Through some section of history, nineteen spectre chimeras shall flit, speaking and gibbering, till oblivion swallow them. In the course of a week, the revolutionary army itself is disbanded, the general having become spectral. This faction of rabids, therefore, is also purged from the republican soil. Here also the baited fall traps of that pit have been wrenched up harmless, and anew there is joy over a plot discovered. The revolution, then, is verily devouring its own children. All anarchy by the nature of it is not only destructive, but self-destructive. End of Book 6, Chapter 1《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine. Book 6, Thermidor. Chapter 2, Danton, No Weakness. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 6, Chapter 2, Danton, No Weakness. Danton, meanwhile, has been pressingly sent for from Arcas. He must return instantly, cried Camilla cried Felipo and friends, who scented danger in the wind. Danger enough. A Danton, a Robespierre, chief products of a victorious revolution, are now arrived in immediate front of one another. Must ascertain how they will live together, rule together. One conceives easily the deep mutual incompatibility that divided these two, with what terror of feminine hatred the poor sea-green formula looked at the monstrous colossal reality and grew greener to behold him. The reality again struggling to think no ill of a chief product of the revolution, yet feeling at bottom that such chief product was little other than a chief wind-bag, blown large by popular air. Not a man with a heart of a man, but a poor, spasmodic, incorruptible pedant with a logic formula instead of heart, of Jesuit or Methodist parson nature, full of sincere cant, incorruptibility, of virulence, poltroonery, barren as the east wind. Two such chief products are too much for one revolution. Friends, trembling at the results of a quarrel on their part, brought them to meet, it is right, said Danton, swallowing much indignation, to repress the royalists, but we should not strike except where it is useful to the republic. We should not confound the innocent and the guilty. And who told you, replied Robespierre with a poisonous look, that one innocent person had perished? Qua, said Danton, turning round to friend Paris, self-named Fabricus, juryman in the revolutionary tribunal. Qua, not one innocent... What sayest thou of it, Fabricus? Friends, Vestemann, this Paris and others, urged him to show himself, to ascend the tribune and act. The man Danton was not prone to show himself, to act or uproar for his own safety. A man of careless, large, hoping nature, a large nature that could rest. He would sit whole hours, they say, hearing Camilla talk, and like nothing so well. Friends urged him to fly. His wife urged him. With a fly, answered he. If freed France cast me out, there are only dungeons for me elsewhere. One carries not his country with him at the sole of his shoe. The man, Danton, sat still. Not even the arrestment of friend Hérault, a member of Salou, yet arrested by Salou, can rouse Danton. On the night of the 30th of March, juryman Paris came rushing in, haste looking through his eyes. A clerk of the Salut Committee had told him Danton's warrant was made out. He is to be arrested this very night. Entreaties there are, 
and trepidation, of poor wife, of Paris and friends. Danton sat silent for a while, then answered, Il ne sait rien. They dare not, and would take no measures. Murmuring, they dare not, he goes to sleep as usual. And yet, on the morrow morning, strange rumour spreads over Paris city. Danton, Camille, Felipeau, Lacroix have been arrested overnight. It is verily so. The corridors of the Luxembourg were all crowded, prisoners crowding forth to see this giant of the revolution among them. Monsieur, said Danton politely, I hoped soon to have got you all out of this, but here I am myself, and one sees not where it will end. Rumour may spread over Paris. The convention clusters itself into groups, wide-eyed, whispering, Danton arrested? Who then is safe? Legendre, mounting the tribune, utters at his own peril a feeble word for him, moving that he be heard at that bar before indictment. But Robespierre frowns him down. Did you hear Chabot or Bazir? Would you have two weights and measures? Legendre cowers low. Danton, like the others, must take his doom. Danton's prison thoughts were curious to have, but are not given in any quantity. Indeed, few such remarkable men have been left so obscure to us as this titan of the revolution. He was heard to ejaculate, This time twelve months I was moving the creation of that same revolutionary tribunal. I crave pardon for it of God and man. They are all brothers Cain. Brissot would have had me guillotined as Robespierre now will. I leave the whole business in a frightful welter, caché épouvantable. Not one of them understands anything of government. Robespierre will follow me. I'd drag down Robespierre. Oh, it were better to be a poor fisherman than to meddle with governing of men. Camille's young beautiful wife, who had made him rich not in money alone, hovers round the Luxembourg like a disembodied spirit day and night. Camille's stolen letters to her still exist, stained with the mark of his tears. I carry my head like a saint sacrament, so Saint Just was heard to mutter. Perhaps he will carry his like a Saint Denis. Unhappy Danton, thou still unhappier light Camille, once light procureur de la lanterne, ye also have arrived then at the bourne of creation, where, like Ulysses Politeless, at the limit and utmost gaieties of his voyage, gazing into that dim waste beyond creation, a man does see the shade of his mother, pale, ineffectual, and days when his mother nursed and wrapped him are all too sternly contrasted with this day. Danton, Camille, Hérault, Vesterman and the others, very strangely massed up with Bazir, Swindler Chabot, Fabre d'Eglantine, Banker Frey, a most motley batch, Fournay, as such things will be called, stand ranked at the bar of Tenville. It is the 2nd of April, 1794. Danton has had but three days to lie in prison, for the time presses. What is your name? Place of abode? And the like, Fouquier asks according to formality. My name is Danton, answers he, a name tolerably known in the revolution. My abode will soon be annihilation, dans le néant, but I shall live in the pantheon of history. A man will endeavour to say something forcible, be it by nature or not. Hero mentions epigrammatically that he sat in this hall and was detested of parliamentiers. Camille makes answer, My age is that of the bon sans culotte Jésus, an age fatal to revolutionists. Oh, Camille, Camille, and yet in that divine transaction, let us say, there did lie, amongst other things, the fatalist reproof ever uttered here below to worldly right honourableness, the highest fact, so devout, Novalis calls it, in the rights of man. Camille's real age, it would seem, is thirty-four. Danton is one year older. Some five months ago, the trial of the twenty-two Girondins was the greatest that Fouquier had then done. But here is a still greater to do, a thing which takes the whole faculty of Fouquier, which makes the very heart of him waver. For it is the voice of Danton that reverberates now from these domes, impassionate words, piercing with their wild sincerity, winged with wrath. 
your best witnesses he shivers into ruin at one stroke. He demands that the committee men themselves come as witnesses, as accusers. He will cover them with ignominy. He raises his huge stature. He shakes his huge black head. Fire flashes from the eyes of him, piercing to all Republican hearts, so that the very galleries, though we filled them by ticket, murmur sympathy and are like to burst down and raise the people and deliver him. He complains loudly that he is classed with Chabot, with swindling stock jobbers, that his indictment is a list of platitudes and horrors. Danton hidden on the 10th of August, reverberates he with the roar of a lion in the toils. Where are the men that had to press Danton to show himself that day? Where are these high gifted souls of whom he borrowed energy? Let them appear, these accusers of mine. I have all the clearness of my self-possession when I demand them. I will unmask the three shallow scoundrels, les trois plaques coquins. Saint-Just, Couton, Le Bas, who fawn on Robespierre and lead him towards his destruction. Let them produce themselves here. I will plunge them into nothingness, out of which they ought never to have risen. The agitated president agitates his bell, enjoins calmness in a vehement manner. What is it to thee how I defend myself, cries the other? The right of dooming me is thine always. The voice of a man speaking for his honour and his life may well drown the jingling of thy bell. Thus stand on, higher and higher, till the lion voice of him dies away in his throat. Speech will not utter what is in that man. The galleries murmur ominously. The first day's session is over. Oh, Tanville, President Herman, what will ye do? They have two days more of it by strictest revolutionary law. The galleries already murmur. If this Danton were to burst your meshwork, very curious indeed to consider. It turns on a hair. And what a hoity-toity were there, justice and culprit changing places, and the whole history of France running changed. For in France there is this Danton only that could still try to govern France. He only, the wild amorphous Titan, and perhaps that other olive-complexioned individual, the artillery officer at Toulon, whom we left pushing his fortune in the south. On the evening of the second day, matters looking not better, but worse and worse, Fouquier and Hermont, distracted in their aspect, rush over to Salut Public. What is to be done? Salut Public rapidly concocts a new decree, whereby if men insult justice, they may be thrown out of the debates. For indeed, with all, is there not a plot in the Luxembourg prison? See devant General Dillon and others of the suspect plotting with Camille's wife to distribute assignats to force the prisons overset the Republic. Citizen La Flotte, himself suspect, but desiring enfranchisement, has reported said plot for us, a report that may bear fruit. Enough, on the morrow morning, an obedient convention passes this decree. Salut rushes off with it to the aid of Tanville, reduced now almost to extremities. And so, hors des débats, out of the debates, ye insolence, policemen do your duty. In such manner, with a deadlift effort, Salut, Tanville, Hermann, Loire, Dizahou, and all staunch jurymen setting heart and shoulder to it, the jury becomes sufficiently instructed. Sentence is passed, is sent by an official, and torn and trampled on. Death this day. It is the 5th of April, 1794. Camille's poor wife may cease hovering about this prison. Nay, let her kiss her poor children, and prepare to enter it, and to follow. Danton carried a high look in the death cart. Not so, Camille. It is but one week, and all is so topsy-turvied. Angel, wife left weeping, love, riches, revolutionary fame, left all at the prison gate, carnivorous rabble now howling round. Palpable and yet incredible, like a madman's dream. Camille struggles and writhes, his shoulders ruffle the loose coat off them, which hangs knotted, the hands tied. 
Calm, my friend, said Danton. He'd not that vile canaille. laissez la cette vile canaille. At the foot of the scaffold, Danton was heard to ejaculate, Oh, my wife, my well-beloved, I shall never see thee more then. But interrupting himself, Danton, no weakness. He said to her, Oh, Seychelles, stepping forward to embrace him, Our heads will meet there, in the headsman's sack. His last words were to Samson, the headsman himself. Thou wilt show my head to the people. It is worth showing. So passes like a gigantic mass of valour, ostentation, fury, affectation and wild revolutionary manhood, this Danton to his unknown home. He was of Arcis sur Orb, born of good farmer people there. He had many sins. But one worst sin he had not, that of Kant. No hollow formalist, deceptive and self-deceptive, ghastly to the natural sense was this, but a very man. With all his dross he was a man, fiery real from the great far bosom of nature herself. He saved France from Brunswick. He walked straight his own wild road whither it led him. He may live for some generations in the memory of men. End of Book 6, Chapter 2《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 6, Thermidor Chapter 3, The Tumbrils This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 6, Chapter 3, The Tumbrils Next week, it is still but the 10th of April, there comes a new 19. Chaumette, Gobel, Hébert's widow, the widow of Camille. These also roll their fated journey. Black death devours them. Mean Hébert's widow was weeping. Camille's widow tried to speak comfort to her. Oh, ye kind heavens, azure, beautiful eternal behind your tempests and time clouds. Is there not pity for all? Gobel, it seems, was repentant. He begged absolution of a priest, did as a Gobel best could. For Anaxagoras sure met, the sleek head now stripped of its bonnet rouge, what hope is there? Unless death were an eternal sleep. Wretched Anaxagoras, God shall judge thee, not I. Hébert, therefore, is gone, and the Herbertists, they that robbed churches and adored blue reason in red nightcap. Great Danton and the Dantonists, they also are gone, down to the catacombs. They are become silent men. Let no Paris municipality, no sect or party of this hue or that, resist the well of Robespierre and Salou. May Apache, not prompt enough in denouncing these pits plots, may congratulate about them now. Never so heartily, it skills not. His course likewise is to the Luxembourg. We appoint one Fleurio Lesco, interim mayor, in his stead. An architect from Belgium, they say, this Fleurio. He is a man one can depend on. Our new agent national is Payan, lately juryman, whose sinister also is Robespierre. Thus, then, we perceive this confusedly electric Erebus cloud of revolutionary government has altered its shape somewhat. Two masses or wings belonging to it, an over-electric mass of Cordelio Rabids, and an under-electric of Dantonist moderates and clemency men, these two masses, shooting bolts at one another, so to speak, have annihilated one another. For the Erebus cloud, as we often remark, is of suicidal nature, and in jagged irregularity darts its lightning withal into itself. But now, these two discrepant masses being mutually annihilated, it is as if the Erebus cloud had got to internal composure, and did only pour its hellfire lightning on the world that lay under it. In plain words, terror of the guillotine was never terrible till now. Systole, diastole, swift and ever swifter goes the axe of Samson. Indictments cease by degrees to have so much as plausibility. 
Fouquier chooses from the twelve houses of arrest what he calls batches, fournays, a score or more at a time. His jurymen are charged to make feu de fille, fire filing, till the ground be clear. Citizen Laflotte's report of plot in the Luxembourg is verily bearing fruit. If no speakable charge exists against a man, or batch of men, Fouquier has always this, a plot in the prison. Swift and ever swifter goes Samson, up finally to three score and more at a batch. It is the high day of death, none but the dead return not. Oh, dusky Despremanil, what a day is this, the 22nd of April, thy last day. The Palais Hall here is the same stone hall where thou five years ago stoodst perorating amid endless pathos of rebellious parliament in the grey of the morning, bound to march with Dagoos to the Isle of Hier. The stones are the same stones, but the rest, men, rebellion, pathos, peroration, see, it has all fled like a gibbering troop of ghosts, like the phantasms of a dying brain. With this Bremenil in the same line of tumbrils goes the mournfullest medley. Chapelier goes, ci devant popular president of the constituent, whom the Menads and Maillard met in his carriage on the Versailles road. Touré likewise, ci devant president, father of constitutional law acts, he whom we heard saying long since with a loud voice, the constituent assembly has fulfilled its mission the notable old Malesherbe, who defended Louis and could not speak, like a grey old rock dissolving into sudden water. He journeys here now with his kindred, daughters, sons and grandsons, his Le Moignons, Chateaubriand, silent towards death. One young Chateaubriand alone is wandering amid the Natchez by the roar of Niagara Falls, the moan of endless forest. Welcome thou, great nature, savage but not false, not unkind, unmotherly, no formula thou, or rapid jangle of hypothesis, parliamentary eloquence, constitution, building, and the guillotine. Speak thou to me, O mother, and sing my sick heart thy mystic everlasting lullaby song, and let all the rest be far. Another row of tumbrils we must notice, that which holds Elizabeth, the sister of Louis, her trial was like the rest, for plots, for plots. She was among the kindliest, most innocent of women. There sat with her, amid four and twenty others, a once timorous Marchioness de Crusol, courageous now, expressing towards her the liveliest loyalty. At the foot of the scaffold, Elizabeth, with tears in her eyes, thanked this Marchioness, said she was grieved she could not reward her. Ah, madame, would your royal highness deign to embrace me? My wishes were complete. Right willingly, Marquise de Crusol, and with my whole heart. Thus they, at the foot of the scaffold. The royal family is now reduced to two, a girl and a little boy. The boy, once named Dauphin, was taken from his mother while she yet lived, and given to one Simon, by trader Cordwainer, on service then about the temple prison, to bring him up in principles of Sanscolotism. Simon taught him to drink, to swear, to sing the Carmagnol. Simon has now gone to the municipality, and the poor boy, hidden in a tower of the temple, from which in his fright and bewilderment and early decrepitude he wishes not to stir out, lies perishing his shirt not changed for six months amid squalor and darkness, lamentably, so as none but poor factory children and the like are wont to perish and not be lamented. The spring sends its green leaves and bright weather, bright May, brighter than ever, death pauses not. Lavoisier, famed chemist, shall die and not live. Chemist Lavoisier was farmer-general Lavoisier too, and now all the farmers-general are arrested, all, and shall give an account of their monies and incomings, and die for putting water in the tobacco they sold. Lavoisier begged a fortnight more of life to finish some experiments, but the Republic does not need such. The axe must do its work. Cynic Chamfort, reading these inscriptions of brotherhood or death, says it is a brotherhood of Cain. Arrested, then liberated, and then about to be arrested again, 
This chamfor cuts and slashes himself with frantic, uncertain hand, gains, not without difficulty, the refuge of death. Condorcet has lurked deep these many months, Argus eyes watching and searching for him. His concealment has become dangerous to others and himself. He has to fly again, to skulk round Paris in thickets and stone quarries. And so at the village of Clamart, one bleared May morning, there enters a figure, ragged, rough-bearded, hunger-stricken, asks breakfast in the tavern there. Suspect by the look of him. Servant out of place, sayest thou. Committee president of forty sous finds a Latin Horace on him. Art thou not one of those ci devants that were wont to keep servants? Suspect! He is hailed forthwith, breakfast unfinished, towards bourg la Reine, on foot. He faints with exhaustion, is set on a peasant's horse, is flung into his damp prison cell. On the morrow, recollecting him, you enter. Condorcet lies dead on the floor. They die fast and disappear. The notabilities of France disappear, one after one, like lights in a theatre which you are snuffing out. Under which circumstances is it not singular and almost touching to see Paris City drawn out in the meek May nights in civic ceremony which they call Super Fraternel, brotherly supper. Spontaneous or partially spontaneous in the twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth nights of this May month it is seen. Along the Rue Saint Honore and main streets and spaces, each citoyen brings forth what of supper the stingy maximum has yielded him to the open air, joins it to his neighbour's supper, and with common table, cheerful light burning frequent, and what due modicum of cut glasses and other garnish and relish is convenient, they eat frugally together under the kind stars. See it, O oh night! with cheerfully pledged wine-cup, hobnobbing to the reign of liberty, equality, brotherhood, with their wives in best ribbons, with their little ones romping round, the citoyen in frugal love-feast sit there. Night in her wide empire sees nothing similar. Oh, my brothers, why is the reign of brotherhood not come? It is come, it shall come, say the citoyen, frugally hobnobbing. Ah, me! These everlasting stars, do they not look down like glistening eyes bright with immortal pity over the lot of man? One lamentable thing, however, is that individuals will attempt assassination of representatives of the people. Representative Collo, member even of Salou, returning home about one in the morning, probably touched with liquor, as he is apt to be, meets on the stairs, the cry, Scalera, and also the snap of a pistol, which latter flashes in the pan, disclosing to him momentarily a pair of trustulent saucer eyes, swart, grim-clenched countenance, recognisable as that of our little fellow lodger, citoyen Amiral, formerly a clerk in the lotteries. Collo shouts murder with lungs fit to awaken all the Rue Favard. Amiral snaps a second time. A second time flashes in the pan, then darts up into his apartment, and after their firing, still with inadequate effect, one musket at himself and another at his captor, is clutched and locked in prison. An indignant little man, this Amiral, of southern temper and complexion, of considerable muscular force. He denies not that he meant to purge France of a tyrant, nay, avows that he had an eye to the incorruptible himself, but took Collo as more convenient. Rumour enough hereupon, heaven-high congratulation of Collo, fraternal embracing at the Jacobins and elsewhere. And yet it would seem the assassin mood proves catching. Two days more, it is still but the 23rd of May, and towards nine in the evening, Cécile Renault, paper dealer's daughter, a young woman of soft blooming look, presents herself at the cabinet-makers in the Rue Saint-Honoré, desires to see Robespierre. Robespierre cannot be seen. She grumbles irreverently. They lay hold of her. She has left a basket in a shop hard by. In the basket a female change of raiment and two knives. Poor Cecile, examined by committee, declares she wanted to see what a tyrant was like, the change of raiment was for my own use in the place I am surely going to. What place? Prison, and then the guillotine, answered she. 
Such things come of Charlotte Corday, in a people prone to imitation and monomania. Swart choleric men try Charlotte's feet, and their pistols misfire. Soft blooming young women try it, and only half resolute leave their knives in a shop. O oh, pit and ye faction of the stranger, shall the Republic never have rest, but be torn continually by baited springs, by wires of explosive spring guns? Swart Damiral, fair young Cecile, and all that knew them, and many that did not know them, lie locked, waiting the scrutiny of Tanville. End of Book 6, Chapter 3《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume Three, The Guillotine, Book Six, Thermidor, Chapter Four, Mumbo Jumbo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan, Book Six, Chapter Four, Mumbo Jumbo. But on the day they called Decadi, New Sabbath, twenty prairial, eighth June by old style. What thing is this going forward in the Jardin National, while I'm Tuileries Garden? All the world is there in holy day clothes. Foul linen went out with the herbertists. Nay, Robespierre, for one would never once countenance that, but went always elegant and frizzled, not without vanity even, and had his room hung round with sea-green portraits and busts. In holiday clothes, we say, are the innumerable citoyen and citoyenne. The weather is of the brightest. Cheerful expectation lights all countenances. Juryman Villat gives breakfast to many a deputy in his official apartment in the pavilion ci devant the flora. Rejoices in the bright-looking multitudes, in the brightness of leafy June, in the auspicious decadi or new Sabbath. This day, if it please heaven, we are to have, on improved anti shawmet principles, a new religion. Catholicism being burned out and reason worship guillotined, was there not need of one? Incorruptible Robespierre, not unlike the ancients, as legislator of a free people, will now also be priest and prophet. He has donned his sky-blue coat made for the occasion, white silk waistcoat broidered with silver, black silk breeches, white stockings, shoe buckles of gold. He is president of the convention. He has made the convention decree, so they name it, decrete there the existence of the supreme being, and likewise the principe consolateur of the immortality of the soul. These consolatory principles, the basis of rational republican religion, are getting decreed. And here, on this blessed Descartes, by help of heaven and painter David, is to be our first act of worship. See, accordingly, how, after decree passed, and what has been called the scraggiest prophetic discourse ever uttered by man, Mohammed robes Pierre in sky-blue coat and black breeches, frizzled and powdered to perfection, bearing in his hand a bouquet of flowers and wheat ears, issues proudly from the convention hall, convention following him, yet, as is remarked, with an interval. Amphitheatre has been raised, or at least monticule or elevation. Hideous statues of atheism, anarchy and such like, thanks to heaven and painter David, strike abhorrence into the heart. Unluckily, however, our monticule is too small. On the top of it, not half of us can stand, wherefore there arises indecent shoving, nay, treasonous irreverent growling. Peace, thou bourdon de loise, peace, or it may be worse for thee. The sea-green pontiff takes a torch, painter David handing it, mouths some other froth rant of vocables which happily one cannot hear, strides resolutely forward in sight of expectant France, sets his torch to atheism and company, which are but made of pasteboards steeped in turpentine. They burn up rapidly, and from within there rises, by machinery, an incombustible statue of wisdom, which by ill hap gets besmoked a little, but does stand there visible in as serene attitude as it can. And then? 
Why, then there is other processioning, scraggy discoursing, and this is our feast of the Etre Supreme, our new religion, better or worse, is come. Look at it one moment, O oh reader, not two. The shabbiest page of human annals, or is there that thou wottest of one shabbier? Mumbo-jumbo of the African woods to me seems venerable besides this new deity of Robespierre, for this is a conscious mumbo-jumbo and knows that he is machinery. Oh, sea-green prophet, unhappiest of windbags, blown night to bursting, what distracted chimera among realities art thou growing to? This, then, this common pitch link for artificial fireworks of turpentine and pasteboard, this is the miraculous Aaron's rod thou wilt stretch over a hag-ridden, hell-ridden France and bid her plague cease. Vanish, thou and it, avec ton être suprême, said Bio, tu commences à m'embête. With a être suprême thou beginnest to be a bore to me. Catherine Tao, on the other hand, an ancient serving maid, seventy-nine years of age, inured to prophecy in the Bastille from of old, sits in an upper room in the Rue de Contrescarpe, poring over the Book of Revelations with an eye to Robespierre, finds that this astonishing thrice-potent Maximilian really is the man spoken of by prophets who is to make the earth young again. With her sit devout old marchionesses, See devant honourable women, among whom old constituent Dom Girl with his addle head cannot be wanting. They sit there in the Rue de Contrescarpe in mysterious adoration. Mumbo is Mumbo, and Robespierre is his prophet. A conspicuous man, this Robespierre. He has his volunteer bodyguard of tapdur, let us say, strike sharps, fierce patriots with feruled sticks and Jacobins kissing the hem of his garment. He enjoys the admiration of many, the worship of some, and is well worth the wonder of one and all. The grand question and hope, however, is, will not this feast of the Tuileries mumbo-jumbo be a sign, perhaps, that the guillotine is to abate? Far enough from that. Precisely on the second day after it, Couton, one of the three shallow scoundrels, gets himself lifted into the tribune, produces a bundle of papers. Couton proposes that, as plots still abound, the law of the suspect shall have extension and arrestment, new vigour and facility. Further that, as in such case business is like to be heavy, our revolutionary tribunal too shall have extension, be divided, say, into four tribunals, each with its president, each with its fouquier, or substitute of fouquier, all labouring at once, and any remnant of shackle or dilatory formality to be struck off. In this way it may perhaps still overtake the work. Such is Couton's decree of the 22nd Prairial, famed in those times. At hearing of which decree, the very mountain gasped, awestruck, and Juan Rouen ventured to say that if it passed without adjournment and discussion, he, as one representative, would blow his brains out. Vain saying. The incorruptible knit his brows, spoke a prophetic fateful word or two. The law of Prairial is law. Rouamp, glad to leave his rash brains where they are. Death, then, and always death. Even so. Fouquier is enlarging his borders, making room for batches of a hundred and fifty at once, getting a guillotine set up of improved velocity and to work under cover in the apartment close by, so that salute itself has to intervene and forbid him. Wilt thou demoralise the guillotine? asks Colo reproachfully. Demoralise le supplice? There is indeed danger of that. Were not the Republican faith great, it were already done. See, for example, on the 17th of June, what a batch, 54 at once. Swart d'Amiral is here, he of the pistol that missed fire. Young Cecile Renault with her father, family, entire kith and kin, the widow of Despremenil, old Monsieur de Sombray of the Invalide with his son. Poor old Sombray, seventy-three years old, his daughter saved him in September and it was but for this. Faction of the stranger, fifty-four of them. 
In red shirts and smocks, as assassins and faction of the stranger, they flit along their red, baleful phantasmagory towards the land of phantoms. Meanwhile, will not the people of the Place de la Révolution, the inhabitants along the Rue Saint Honoré, as these continual tumbrils pass, begin to look gloomy? Republicans, too, have bowels. The guillotine is shifted, then again shifted, finally set up at the remote extremity of the south-east. Suburb Saint-Antoine and Saint-Marceau, it is to be hoped, if they have bowels, have very tough ones. End of Book 6 Chapter 4The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 6, Thermidor, Chapter 5, The Prisons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 6, Chapter 5, The Prisons. It is time now, however, to cast a glance into the prisons. When Desmoulins moved for his Committee of Mercy, these twelve houses of arrest held five thousand persons. Continually arriving since then, there have now accumulated twelve thousand. They are ci devant royalists. In far greater part, they are republicans of various Girondin, Fayettish, and Jacobin colour. Perhaps no human habitation or prison ever equalled in squalor, in noisome horror, these twelve houses of arrest. There exist records of personal experience in them, Memoir sur les prisons, one of the strangest chapters in the biography of man. Very singular to look into it, how a kind of order rises up in all conditions of human existence. And wherever two or three are gathered together, there are formed modes of existing together, habitudes, observances, nay, gracefulnesses, joys. Citoyen Quaiton will explain fully how our lean dinner of herbs and carrion was consumed not without politeness and place aux dames. A seigneur and shoeblack, duchess and doll tear sheet, flung pell-mell into a heap, ranked themselves according to method. At what hour the citoyenne took to their needlework, and we, yielding the chairs to them, endeavoured to talk gallantly in a standing posture, or even to sing and harp, more or less. Jealousies, enmities are not wanting, nor flirtations of an effective character. Alas, by degrees, even needlework must cease. Plot in the prison rises by citoyen la flotte and preternatural suspicion, Suspicious municipality snatches from us all implements. All money and possession of means or metal is ruthlessly searched for in pocket, in pillow and palace and snatched away. Red-capped commissaries entering every cell. Indignation, temporary desperation at robbery of its very thimble fills the gentle heart. Old nuns shriek shrill discord, demand to be killed forthwith. No help from shrieking. Better was that of the two shifty male citizens who, eager to preserve an implement or two, were it but a pipe picker or needle to darn hose with, determined to defend themselves by tobacco. Swift then, as your fell red caps are heard in the corridor rummaging and slamming, the two citoyens light their pipes and begin smoking. Thick darkness envelops them. The red nightcaps, opening the cell, breathe but one mouthful, burst forth into chorus of barking and coughing. Quoi, monsieur, cry the two citoyens, you don't smoke? Is the pipe disagreeable? Est-ce que vous ne fumez pas? But the red nightcaps have fled with slight search. Vous n'aimez pas la pipe, cry the citoyen, as the doors slam to again. My poor brother citoyen. Oh, surely, in a reign of brotherhood, you are not the two I would guillotine. Rigour grows, stiffens into horrid tyranny, plopped in the prison, getting ever riper. This plopped in the prison, as we said, is now the stereotype formula of Tamvia, against whomsoever he knows no crime, this is a ready-made crime. His judgment bar has become unspeakable, a recognised mockery, known only as the wicked one passes through towards death. His indictments are drawn out in blank, you insert the names after. 
He has his moutons, detestable traitor jackals who report and bear witness that they themselves may be allowed to live for a time. His fournay, says the reproachful Collo, shall in no case exceed three score. That is his maximum. Nightly come his tumbrils to the Luxembourg with the fatal roll call. Lists of the fournay of tomorrow. Men rush towards the great. Listen if their name be on it. One deep-drawn breath when the name is not in. We live still one day. And yet some score or scores of names were in. Quick these, they clasp their loved ones to their heart one last time with brief adieu, wet-eyed or dry-eyed, they mount and are away. This night to the conciergerie through the palais, misnamed of Justice, to the guillotine tomorrow. Recklessness, defiant levity, the stoicism, if not of strength, yet of weakness, has possessed all hearts. Weak women and si devant, their locks not yet made into blonde perukes, their skins not yet tanned into breeches, are accustomed to act the guillotine by way of pastime. In fantastic mummery, with towel turbans, blanket ermine, a mock Sanhedrin of judges sits, a mock Tanvia pleads, a culprit is doomed, is guillotined by the oversetting of two chairs. Sometimes we carry it farther. Tanvia himself in his turn is doomed and not to the guillotine alone. With blackened face, hirsute, horned, a shaggy Satan snatches him, not unshrieking, shows him with outstretched arm and voice the fire that is not quenched, the worm that dies not, the monotony of hell pain and the what hour answered by it is eternity. And still the prisons fill fuller and still the guillotine goes faster. On all high roads march flights of prisoners wending towards Paris. Not ci devant now. They, the noisy of them, are mown down. It is Republicans now. Chained two and two they march, in exasperated moments, singing their Marseillaise. A hundred and thirty-two men of Nantes, for instance, march towards Paris in these same days. Republicans or say even Jacobins to the marrow of the bones, but Jacobins who had not approved Noyarding. Viva la République rises from them in all streets of towns. They rest by night in unutterable noisome dens, crowded to choking, one or two dead on the morrow. They are wayworn, weary of heart, can only shout, Live the Republic! We, as under horrid enchantment, dying in this way for it. Some four hundred priests of whom also there is record, ride at anchor in the roads of the Isle of A, long months, looking out on misery, vacuity, waste sands of Oleron and the ever-moaning brine. Ragged, sordid, hungry, wasted to shadows, eating their unclean ration on deck, circularly in parties of a dozen, with finger and thumb, beating their scandalous clothes between two stones, choked in horrible miasmata, closed under hatches, seventy of them in a berth through night, so that the aged priest is found lying dead in the morning in the attitude of prayer. How long, O Lord? Not forever, no. All anarchy, all evil, injustice is, by the nature of it, dragon's teeth, suicidal, and cannot endure. End of Book 6, Chapter 5《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 6, Thermidor Chapter 6, To Finish the Terror this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 6, Chapter 6 To Finish the Terror It is very remarkable indeed that since the Etre Supreme feast and the sublime continued harangues on it, which Biot feared would become a bore to him, Robespierre has gone little to committee, but held himself apart as if in a kind of pet. Nay, they have made a report on that old Catherine Theo and her regenerative man spoken of by the prophets, not in the best spirit. This Theo mystery they affect to regard as a plot, but have evidently introduced a vein of satire, 
of irreverent banter, not against the spinster alone, but obliquely against her regenerative man. Barère's light pen was perhaps at the bottom of it, read through the solemn snuffling organs of old Vadier of the Surete Générale. The Théo report had its effect, wrinkling the general republican visage into an iron grin. Ought these things to be? We note, Father, that among the prisoners in the twelve houses of arrest there is one whom we have seen before. Signora Fontenay, born Cabarou, the fair Proserpine, whom Representative Talion Pluto like, did gather at Bordeaux, not without effect on himself. Talion is home, by recall, long since from Bordeaux, and in the most alarming position. Vain that he sounded, louder even than ever, the note of Jacobinism to hide past shortcomings. The Jacobins purged him out. Two times has Robespierre growled at him words of omen from the Convention Tribune. And now his fair Carberu, hit by denunciation, lies arrested, suspect, in spite of all he could do. Shut in horrid pinfold of death, the Signora smuggles out to her red gloomy Talian the most pressing entreaties and conjurings. Save me, save thyself. Seest thou not that thy own head is doomed, thou with a too fiery audacity, a Dantonist withal, against whom lie grudges? Are ye not all doomed, as in the polyphemous cavern? The fawningest slave of you will but be eaten last. Talian feels with a shudder that it is true. Talian has had words of omen. Baudon has had words. Freron is hated and barah. Each man feels his head, if it yet stick on his shoulders. Meanwhile, Robespierre, we still observe, goes little to convention, not at all to committee, speaks nothing except to his Jacobin House of Lords amid his bodyguard of tap -dours. These forty days, for we are now far in July, he has not showed face in committee, could only work there by his three shallow scoundrels and the terror there was of him. The incorruptible himself sits apart, or is seen stalking in solitary places in the field with an intensely meditative air, some say with eyes red-spotted, fruit of extreme bile, the lamentablest sea-green chimera that walks the earth that July. O oh, hapless chimera, for thou too hadst a life and a heart of flesh. What is this the stern gods, seeming to smile all the way, have led and let thee to? Art not thou he who, few years ago, was a young advocate of promise, and gave up the arras judgeship rather than sentence one man to die? What his thoughts might be, his plans for finishing the terror, one knows not. Dim vestiges there flit of agrarian law, of victorious sanscalotism become landed proprietor, Old soldiers sitting in national mansions, in hospital palaces of Chambord and Châtillis, peace bought by victory, breaches healed by feast of Etre Supreme, and so through seas of blood to equality, frugality, worksome blessedness, fraternity, and republic of the virtues. Blessed shore of such a sea of aristocrat blood, but how to land on it? Through one last wave, blood of corrupt sans calottists, traitorous or semi-traitorous conventionals, rebellious Talian, Bio, to whom with my atra supreme I have become a bore, with my apocalyptic old woman a laughing stock, so stalks he, this poor Robespierre, like a sea green ghost through the blooming July. Vestiges of schemes flit dim. But what his schemes or his thought were will never be known to man. New catacombs, some say, are digging for a huge simultaneous butchery. Convention to be butchered, down to the right pitch, by General Henriot and company, Jacobin House of Lords made dominant, and Robespierre dictator. There is actually, or else there is not actually, a list made out, which the hairdresser has got eye on as he frizzled the incorruptible locks. Each man asks himself, is it I? Nay, as tradition and rumour of anecdotes still convey it, there was a remarkable bachelor's dinner one hot day at Barres. 
For doubt not, O reader, this Barrere and others of them gave dinners, had country house at Clichy with elegant enough sumptuosities and pleasures high rouged. But at this dinner we speak of, the day being so hot, it is said, the guests all stripped their coats and left them in the drawing-room, whereupon Carnot glided out, driven by a necessity, needing of all things paper, groped in Robespierre's pocket, found a list of forty, his own name among them, and tarried not at the wine-cup that day. Ye must bestir yourselves, O friends, ye dull frogs of the marsh, mute ever since your ondism sank under, even ye now must croak or die. Councils are held with word and beck, nocturnal, mysterious as death. Does not a feline Maximilian stalk there, voiceless as yet, his green eyes red-spotted, back bent and hair up? Rash Talien, with his rash temper and audacity of tongue, he shall bell the cat. Fix a day, and be it soon, lest never. Lo, before the fixed day, on the day which they call 8th of Thermidor, 26th July, 1794, Robespierre himself reappears in convention, mounts to the tribune. The biliary face seems clouded with new gloom. Judge whether your talion, Bourdon, listened with interest. It is a voice bodeful of death or of life. Long-winded, unmelodious as the screech-owls sounds that prophetic voice. Degenerate condition of republican spirit, corrupt moderatism, surete, salut, committees themselves infected, backsliding on this hand and on that, I, Maximilian, alone left incorruptible, ready to die at a moment's warning. For all which, what remedy is there? The guillotine, new vigour to the all-healing guillotine, death to traitors of every hue. So sings the prophetic voice into its convention-sounding board. The old song this, but today, oh heavens, has the sounding board ceased to act? There is not resonance in this convention. There is, so to speak, a gasp of silence, nay, a certain grating of one knows not what. Le Cointre, our old draper of Versailles in these questionable circumstances, sees nothing he can do so safe as rise insidiously, or not insidiously, and move, according to established want, that the Robespierre speech be printed and sent to the departments. Hark! Gratings, even of dissonance! Honourable members hint dissonance. Committee members, inculpated in the speech, utter dissonance. Demand delay in printing. Ever higher rises the note of dissonance. Inquiry is even made by editor Freron. What has become of the liberty of opinions in this convention? The order to print and transmit, which had got passed, is rescinded. Robespierre, greener than ever before, has to retire. Foiled, discerning that it is mutiny, that evil is nigh. Mutiny is a thing of the fatalist nature in all enterprises whatsoever, a thing so incalculable, swift, frightful, not to be dealt with in fright. But mutiny in a Robespierre convention, above all, it is like fire seen sputtering in the ship's powder room. One death-defiant plunge at it, this moment, and you may still tread it out. Hesitate till next moment. Ship and ship's captain, crew and cargo are shivered far. The ship's voyage is suddenly ended between sea and sky. If Robespierre can, tonight, produce his Henriot and company and get his work done by them, he and sans calottism may still subsist some time. If not, probably not. Oliver Cromwell, when that agitator sergeant stepped forth from the ranks with plea of grievances and began gesticulating and demonstrating as the mouthpiece of thousands expectant there discerned with those truculent eyes of his how the matter lay, plucked a pistol from his holsters, blew agitator and agitation instantly out. Noel was a man fit for such things. Robespierre, for his part, glides over at evening to his Jacobin House of Lords unfolds there, instead of some adequate resolution, his woes, his uncommon virtues, incorruptibilities. Then, secondly, his rejected screech oration reads this latter over again and declares that he is ready to die at a moment's warning. 
Thou shalt not die, shouts Jacobinism from its thousand throats. Robespierre, I will drink the hemlock with thee, cries painter David. Je boirai la cigue avec toi. A thing not essential to do, but which, in the fire of the moment, can be said. Our Jacobin sounding board, therefore, does act. Applause, heaven high, cover the rejected oration. Fire-eyed fury lights all Jacobin features. Insurrection, a sacred duty. The convention to be purged. Sovereign people under Henriot oh, and municipality, we will make a new June 2nd of it. To your tents, O oh Israel. In this key pipes Jacobinism in sheer tumult of revolt. Let Talion and all opposition men make off. Collot de Bois, though of the supreme salut and so lately near shot, is elbowed, bullied, is glad to escape alive. Entering committee room of salut, all dishevelled, he finds sleek, sombre Saint-Just there among the rest, who in his sleek way asks, What is passing at the Jacobins? What is passing, repeats Collot in the unhistoric Cambyses vein. What is passing? Nothing but revolt and horrors are passing. Ye want our lives, ye shall not have them. St. Jus stutters at such Cambyses oratory, takes his hat to withdraw. That report he had been speaking of, report on Republican things in general, we may say, which is to be read in convention on the morrow, he cannot show at them this moment. A friend has it. He, St. Just, will get it and send it where he wants home. Once home, he sends it not, but an answer that he will not send it, that they will hear it from the tribune tomorrow. Let every man, therefore, according to a well-known good advice, pray to heaven and keep his powder dry. Paris on the morrow will see a thing. Swift scouts fly dim or invisible all night from Surete and Salou, from conclave to conclave, from mother society to town hall. Sleep can it fall on the eyes of Talien, Freron, Collot, Puissant, Henriot, Mayor, Flurio, Judge Coffinol, Procureur Payen, Robespierre and all the Jacobins are getting ready. End of Book 6, Chapter 6「The French Revolution, A History » by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 6, Thermidor Chapter 7, Go Down To This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 6, Chapter 7, Go Down To Talion's eyes beamed bright on the morrow, ninth of Thermidor, or about nine o'clock, to see that the convention had actually met. Paris is in rumour, but at least we are met in legal convention here. We have not been snatched seriatim, treated with a pride's purge at the door. Allons, brave men of the plain, late frogs of the marsh, cried Talien with a squeeze of the hand as he passed in. St. Just's sonorous organ being now audible from the tribune, and the game of games begun. St. Just is verily reading that report of his green vengeance in the shape of Robespierre, watching nigh. Behold, however, St. Just has read but few sentences when interruption rises, rapid crescendo, when Talion starts to his feet, and Billot, and this man starts, and that, and Talion a second time with his Citoyen, at the Jacobins last night I trembled for the Republic. I said to myself, if the Convention dares not strike the tyrant, then I myself dare, and with this I will do it, if need be, said he, whisking out a clear gleaming dagger, and brandishing it there, the steel of Brutus, as we call it whereat we all bellow and brandish impetuous acclaim. Tyranny! Dictatorship! Triumvirate! And the Salut committee men accuse, and all men accuse, and uproar, and impetuously acclaim. And St. Just is standing motionless, pale of face, Couton ejaculating triumvir, with a look at his paralytic legs. 
and Robespierre is struggling to speak, but President Turio is jingling the bell against him, but the hall is sounding against him like an Aeolus hall, and Robespierre is mounting the tribune steps and descending again, going and coming like to choke with rage, terror, desperation, and mutiny is the order of the day. Oh, President Turio, thou that wert elector Turio, and from the Bastille a battlement saw a Saint Antoine rising like the ocean tide, and hast seen much since, sawest thou ever the like of this? Jingle of bell which thou jinglest against Robespierre is hardly audible amid the bedlam storm, and men rage for life. President of assassins, shrieks Robespierre, I demand speech of thee for the last time. It cannot be had. To you, O virtuous men of the plain, cries he, finding audience one moment, I appeal to you. The virtuous men of the plain sit silent as stones, and Thurio's bell jingles, and the hall sounds like Aeolus Hall. Robespierre's frothing lips are grown blue, his tongue dry, cleaving to the roof of his mouth. The blood of Danton chokes him, cry they. Accusation! Decree of accusation! Thurio swiftly puts that question. Accusation passes. The incorruptible Maximilian is decreed accused. I demand to share my brother's fate as I have striven to share his virtues, cries Augustin, the younger Robespierre. Augustin also is decreed. And Couton, and Saint-Just, and Le Bar, they are all decreed and packed forth, not without difficulty, the ushers almost trembling to obey. Triumvirate and company are packed forth into Salut Committee Room, their tongue cleaving to the roof of their mouth. You have but to summon the municipality, to cashier Commandant Enrio, and launch arrest at him, to regular formalities, hand tam via his victims. It is noon. The Iolus Hall has delivered itself, blows now victorious, harmonious, as one irresistible wind. And so the work is finished? One thinks so, and yet it is not so. Alas, there is yet but the first act finished, three or four other acts still to come, and an uncertain catastrophe. A huge city holds in it so many confusions, seven hundred thousand human heads, not one of which knows what its neighbour is doing, nay, not what itself is doing. See, accordingly, about three in the afternoon, Commandant Onrio, how, instead of sitting cashiered, arrested, he gallops along the quay, followed by municipal gendarmes, trampling down several persons. For the town hall sits deliberating, openly insurgent, barriers to be shut, no jailer to admit any prisoner this day, and Onrio is galloping towards the Tuileries to deliver Robespierre. On the Quai de la Ferraillerie, a long citoyen, walking with his wife, says aloud, Gendarmes, that man is not your commandant, he is under arrest. And gendarmes strike down the young citoyen with a flat of their swords. Representatives themselves, says Merlin, the Thionville, who accost him, this puissant Henriot flings into guard houses. He bursts towards the Tuileries committee room to speak with Robespierre with difficulty, the ushers and Tuileries gendarmes earnestly pleading and drawing sabre. Seize this Henriot, get the Henriot gendarmes persuaded not to fight, get Robespierre and company packed into hackney coaches, sent off under escort to the Luxembourg and other prisons. This, then, is the end? May not an exhausted convention adjourn now for a little repose and sustenance at five o'clock? An exhausted convention did it, and repented it. The end was not come, only the end of the second act. Hark, while exhausted representatives sit at victuals, toxin bursting from all steeples, drums rolling in the summer evening, Judge Coffinall is galloping with new gendarmes to deliver Henriot from Tuileries committee room, and does deliver him. Puissant Henriot vaults on horseback, sets to haranguing the Tuileries gendarmes, corrupts the Tuileries gendarmes too, trots off with them to town hall. 
Alas, and Robespierre is not in prison. The jailer showed his municipal order, durst not on pain of his life admit any prisoner. The Robespierre hackney coaches, in confused jangle and whirl of uncertain gendarmes, have floated safe into the town hall. There sits Robespierre and company, embraced by municipals and Jacobins in sacred rite of insurrection, redacting proclamations, sounding toxins, corresponding with sections and mother society. Is not here a pretty enough third act of a natural Greek drama, catastrophe more uncertain than ever? The hasty convention rushes together again in the ominous nightfall. President Collot, for the chair is his, enters with long strides, paleness on his face, claps on his hat, says with solemn tone, Citoyen, armed villains have beset the committee rooms and got possession of them. The hour is come to die at our post. We, oui, answers one and all, we swear it. It is no rodomontade this time, but a sad fact and necessity. Unless we do at our post, we must verily die. Swift, therefore, Robespierre, Henriot, the municipality, are declared rebels. Put hors la loi, out of law. Better still, we appoint Barra, commandant of what armed force is to be had, send missionary representatives to all sections and quarters to preach and raise force. We'll die at least with harness on our back. What a distracted city. Men riding and running, reporting and hearsaying. The hour clearly in travail, child not to be named till born. The poor prisoners in the Luxembourg hear the rumour tremble for a new September. They see men making signals to them on skylights and roofs. Apparently, signals of hope cannot in the least make out what it is. We observe, however, in the eventide, as usual, the death tumbrils faring southeastward through Saint-Antoine towards their barrier du Tron. Saint-Antoine's tough bowels melt. Saint-Antoine surrounds the tumbrils, says, It shall not be. Oh, heavens, why should it? Henriot and gendarmes scouring the streets that way bellow with waved sabres that it must. Quit hope, ye poor doomed, the tumbrils move on. But in this set of tumbrils there are two other things notable. One notable person and one want of a notable person. The notable person is Lieutenant General Loisserol, a nobleman by birth and by nature laying down his life here for his son. In the prison of Saint-Lazare, the night before last, hurrying to the grate to hear the death list read, he caught the name of his son. The son was asleep at the moment. I am Loisereau, cried the old man. At Tanvier's bar, an error in the Christian name is little. Small objection was made. The want of the notable person, again, is that of Deputy Payne. Payne has sat in the Luxembourg since January and seemed forgotten, but Fouquier had pricked him at last. The turnkey, list in hand, is marking with chalk the outer doors of tomorrow's fourney. Payne's outer door happened to be open, turned back on the wall. The turnkey marked it on the side next him and hurried on. Another turnkey came and shut it. No chalk mark now visible, the fourney went without Payne. Payne's life lay not there. Our fifth act of this natural Greek drama with its natural unities can only be painted in gross, somewhat as that antique painter driven desperate did the foam. For through this blessed July night there is clangour, confusion very great, of marching troops, of sections going this way, sections going that, of missionary representatives reading proclamations by torchlight, missionary Legendre, who has raised force somewhere, emptying out the Jacobins and flinging their key on the convention table. I have locked their door, it shall be virtue that reopens it. Paris, we say, is set against itself, rushing confused as ocean currents do, a huge maelstrom sounding there under cloud of night. Convention sits permanent on this hand, municipality most permanent on that. The poor prisoners hear toxin and rumour, strive to bethink them of the signals apparently of hope. 
meek continual twilight streaming up, which will be dawn and a tomorrow silvers the northern hem of night. It wends and wends there with that meek brightness like a silent prophecy along the great ring dial of the heaven. So still, eternal, and on earth all is confused shadow and conflict, dissidence, tumultuous gloom and glare, and destiny as yet shakes her doubtful urn. About three in the morning the dissident armed forces have met. Henriot's armed force stood ranked in the Place de Grève, and now Barras, which he has recruited, arrives there, and they front each other, cannon bristling against cannon. Citoyen, cries the voice of discretion loudly enough, before coming to bloodshed, to endless civil war, hear the convention decree read, Robespierre and all rebels out of law. Out of law? There is terror in the sound. Unarmed citoyens disperse rapidly home. Municipal cannoneers range themselves on the convention side with shouting. At which shout Henriot descends from his upper room, far gone in drink, as some say, finds his place de grave empty, the cannon's mouth turned towards him, and on the whole, that is now the catastrophe. Stumbling in again, the wretched, drunk, sobered Henriot announces, All is lost, miserable, it is thou that has lost it, cry they, and fling him, or else he flings himself out of the window, far enough down into masonwork and horror of cesspool, not into death, but worse. Augustin Robespierre follows him with the like fate. Saint Just called on Lebar to kill him, who would not. Couton crept under a table, attempting to kill himself, not doing it. On entering that Sanhedrin of insurrection, we find all as good as extinct, undone, ready for seizure. Robespierre was sitting on a chair, with pistol shot blown through, not his head, but under his jaw. The suicidal hand had failed. With prompt zeal, not without trouble, we gather these wretched conspirators, fish up even Henriot and Augustin, bleeding and foul, pack them all, rudely enough, into carts, and shall, before sunrise, have them safe under lock and key, amid shoutings and embracings. Robespierre lay in the anteroom of the convention hall, while his prison escort was getting ready the mangled jaw bound up rudely with bloody linen, a spectacle to men. He lies stretched on a table, a deal box, his pillow, the sheath of the pistol is still clenched convulsively in his hand. Men bully him, insult him, his eyes still indicate intelligence, he speaks no word. He had on the sky-blue coat he had got made for the feast of the Etre Supreme. O oh, reader, can thy hard heart hold out against that? His trousers were nankeen, the stockings had fallen down over the ankles. He spake no word more in this world. And so at six in the morning, a victorious convention adjourns. Report flies over Paris as on golden wings, penetrates the prisons, irradiates the faces of those that were ready to perish, Turnkeys and moutons, fallen from their high estate, look mute and blue. It is the 28th day of July, called 10th of Thermidor, year 1794. Fouquier had but to identify, his prisoners being already out of law. At four in the afternoon, never before were the streets of Paris seen so crowded. From the Palais de Justice to the Place de la Révolution, for thither again go the tumbrils this time, it is one dense, stirring mass, all the windows crammed, the very roofs and ridge tiles budding forth human curiosity in strange gladness. The death tumbrils with their motley batch of outlaws, some twenty-three or so, from Maximilian to Mayor Fleurio and Simon the Cordwainer, roll on. All eyes are on Robespierre's tumbrel, where he, his jaw bound in dirty linen with his half-dead brother and half-dead Henriot, lie shattered, their seventeen hours of agony about to end. 
The gendarmes point their sword at him to show the people which is he. A woman springs on the tumbrel, clutching the side of it with one hand, waving the other, sibyl-like, and exclaims, The death of thee gladdens my very heart, mon ivre de joie. Robespierre opened his eyes. Skellera, go down to hell with the curse of all wives and mothers. At the foot of the scaffold they stretched him on the ground till his turn came. Lifted aloft, his eyes again opened, caught the bloody axe. Samson wrenched the coat off him, wrenched the dirty linen from his jaw. The jaw fell powerless, and there burst from him a cry, hideous to hear and see. Samson, thou canst not be too quick. Samson's work done, there burst forth shout on shout of applause. Shout which prolongs itself not only over Paris, but over France, but over Europe, and down to this generation. Deservedly, and also undeservedly. O unhappiest advocate of Ara, wert thou worse than other advocates? Strict a man, according to his formula, to his credo and his cant, of probities, benevolences, pleasure of virtue, and such like, lived not in that age. A man fitted in some luckier, settled age to have become one of those incorruptible barren pattern figures, and have had marble tablets and funeral sermons. His poor landlord, the cabinet maker in the Rue Saint Honore, loved him. His brother died for him. May God be merciful to him and to us. This is the end of the reign of terror. New glorious revolution named of Thermidor, of Thermidor Ninth, Year Two, which being interpreted into old slave style means 27th of July, 1794. Terror is ended, and death in the Place de la Révolution were the tale of Robespierre once executed which service Fouquier, in large batches, is swiftly managing. End of Book 6, Chapter 7《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 7, Vendémier Chapter 1, Decadent this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 1. Decadent. How little did anyone suppose that here was the end not of Robespierre only, but of the revolution system itself. Least of all did the mutinying committee men suppose it, who had mutinied with no view whatever except to continue the national regeneration with their own heads on their shoulders. And yet, so it verily was. The insignificant stone they had struck out, so insignificant anywhere else, proved to be the keystone. The whole archwork and edifice of Sanscalottism began to loosen, to crack, to yawn, and tumbled piecemeal with considerable rapidity, plunge after plunge, till the abyss had swallowed it all, and in this upper world Sanscalottism was no more. For, despicable as Robespierre himself might be, the death of Robespierre was a signal at which great multitudes of men, struck dumb with terror heretofore, rose out of their hiding places and, as it were, saw one another how multitudinous they were, and began speaking and complaining. They are countable by the thousand and the million who have suffered cruel wrong. Ever louder rises the plaint of such a multitude into a universal sound, into a universal continuous peal of what they call public opinion. Camilla had demanded a committee of mercy and could not get it, but now the whole nation resolves itself into a committee of mercy. The nation has tried Sanscalottism and is weary of it. Force of public opinion. What king or convention can withstand it? You in vain struggle. The thing that is rejected as calumnious today must pass as voracious with triumph another day. Gods and men have declared that Sanscalottism cannot be. 
Sanskalotism, on that ninth night of Theramidor, suicidally fractured its underjaw and lies writhing, never to rise more. Through the next fifteen months, it is what we may call the death agony of Sanskalotism. Sanskalotism, anarchy of the Jean-Jacques Evangel, having now got deep enough, is to perish in a new singular system of colotism and arrangement. For arrangement is indispensable to man. Arrangement, were it grounded only on that old primary evangel of force, with sceptre in the shape of hammer, be their method, be their order, cry all men, were it that of the drill sergeant. More tolerable is the drilled bayonet rank than that undrilled guillotine, incalculable as the wind. How Sanskalotism, writhing in death throes, strove some twice or even three times to get on its feet again, but fell always and was flung re-supine the next instant, and finally breathed out the life of it and stirred no more. This we are now, from a due distance, with due brevity, to glance at. And then, O oh reader, courage, I see land. Two of the first acts of the convention, very natural for it after this thermidor, are to be specified here. The first is renewal of the governing committees. Both Sûreté Générale and Salut Public, thinned by the guillotine, need filling up. We, naturally, fill them up with Talian, Freron, victorious Thermidorian men. Still more to the purpose, we appoint that they shall, as law directs, not in name only, but in deed, be renewed and changed from period to period, a fourth part of them going out monthly. The convention will no more lie under bondage of committees, under terror of death, but be a free convention, free to follow its own judgment and the force of public opinion. Not less natural is it to enact that prisoners and persons under accusation shall have right to demand some writ of accusation and see clearly what they are accused of. Very natural act, the harbingers of hundreds not less so. For now, Fuchia's trade, shackled by writ of accusation and legal proof, is as good as gone, effectual only against Robespierre's tale. The prisons give up their suspects, emit them faster and faster. The committees see themselves besieged with prisoners' friends, complain that they are hindered in their work. It is as with men rushing out of a crowded place and obstructing one another. Turned are the tables, prisoners pouring out in floods, jailers, moutons and the tail of Robespierre going now whither they were wont to send. The 132 Nantes Republicans, whom we saw marching in irons, have arrived, shrunk to 94, the fifth man of them choked by the road. They arrive and suddenly find themselves not pleaders for life, but denouncers to death. Their trial is for acquittal and more. As the voice of a trumpet, their testimony sounds far and wide, mere atrocities of a reign of terror. For a space of nineteen days, with all solemnity and publicity, Representative Carrier, Company of Marat, Noyardings, Loire marriages, things done in darkness, come forth into light. Clear is the voice of these poor resuscitated Nantes, and journals and speech and universal committee of mercy reverberate it loud enough into all ears and hearts. Deputation arrives from Arras, denouncing the atrocities of Representative Le Bon. A tamed convention loves its own life, yet what help? Representative Le Bon, Representative Carrier must wend towards the Revolutionary Tribunal, struggle and delay as we will, the cry of a nation pursues them louder and louder. Them also Tenville must abolish, if indeed Tenville himself be not abolished. We must note, moreover, the decrepit condition into which a once omnipotent mother society has fallen. Legendre flung her keys on the convention table that Thermidor night. Her president was guillotined with Robespierre. The once mighty mother came some time after with a subdued countenance, begging back her keys. The keys were restored her, but the strength could not be restored her. The strength had departed forever. 
Alas, one's day is done. Vain that the tribune in mid-air sounds as of old. To the general ear it has become a horror and even a weariness. By and by affiliation is prohibited. The mighty mother sees herself suddenly childless, mourns as so hoarse a Rachel may. The revolutionary committees, without suspects to prey upon, perish fast, as it were, of famine. In Paris, the whole forty-eight of them are reduced to twelve. Their forty sous are abolished. Yet a little while, and revolutionary committees are no more. Maximum will be abolished. Let sansculottism find food where it can. Neither is there now any municipality, any centre at the town hall. Mere Fleurio and company perished, whom we shall not be in haste to replace. The town hall remains in a broken, submissive state, knows not well what it is growing to, knows only that it is grown weak and must obey. What if we should split Paris into, say, a dozen separate municipalities, incapable of concert? The sections were thus rendered safe to act with, or indeed might not the sections themselves be abolished? You had then merely your twelve manageable Pacific townships without centre or subdivision, and sacred right of insurrection fell into abeyance. So much is getting abolished, fleeting swiftly into the inane. For the press speaks, and the human tongue, journals heavy and light in Philippic and burlesque, a renegade Freron, a renegade Prudhomme, loud they as ever, only the contrary way. And ci devant show themselves, almost parade themselves, resuscitated as from death sleep, publish what death pains they have had. The very frogs of the marsh croak with emphasis. Your protesting seventy-three shall, with a struggle, be omitted out of prison, back to their seats. Your Louvets, Inas, Langevinet, and wrecks of Girondism, recalled from their haylofts and caves in Switzerland, will resume their places in the convention, natural foes of terror. Thermidorian Talien and mere foes of terror rule in this convention and out of it. The compressed mountain shrinks silent more and more. Moderatism rises louder and louder, not as a tempest with threatenings, say, rather, as the rushing of a mighty organ blast and melodious deafening force of public opinion from the twenty-five million windpipes of a nation all in committee of mercy, which how shall any detached body of individuals withstand? End of Book 7, Chapter 1《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 7, Von Damier, Chapter 2, La Cabaru. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 2, La Cabaru. How, above all, shall a poor national convention withstand it? In this poor national convention broken, bewildered by long terror, perturbations and guillotinement. There is no pilot, there is not even a Danton who could undertake to steer you anywhither in such press of weather. The utmost a bewildered convention can do is to veer and trim and try to keep itself steady and rush undrowned before the wind. Needless to struggle to fling helm a lee and make bout ship, a bewildered convention sails not in the teeth of the wind, but is rapidly blown round again. So strong is the wind, we say, and so changed, blowing fresher and fresher as from the sweet south-west, your devastating north-easters and wild tornado gusts of terror blown utterly out. All sanscolotic things are passing away, all things are becoming calotic. Do but look at the cut of clothes, that light visible result, significant of a thousand things which are not so visible. In winter, 1793, men went in red nightcaps, municipals themselves in sabots, the very citoyenne had to petition against such headgear. But now, in this winter, 1794, where is the red nightcap? With the thing beyond the flood... 
Your moneyed citoyen ponders in what elegantest style he shall dress himself, whether he shall not even dress himself as the free peoples of antiquity. The more adventurous citoyen has already done it. Behold her, that beautiful adventurous citoyen, in costume of the ancient Greeks, such Greek as painted David could teach, her sweeping tresses snooded by glittering antique fillet, bright-eyed tunic of the Greek women, her little feet naked as in antique statues, with mere sandals and winding strings of ribbon, defying the frost. There is such an effervescence of luxury. For your emigrancy devants carried not their mansions and furniture out of the country with them, but left them standing here. And in the swift changes of property, what with money coined on the Place de la Révolution, what with army furnishings, sales of emigrant domain and church lands and king's lands, and then with the Aladdin's lamp of agio in a time of paper money, such mansions have found new occupants. Old wine drawn from C. Devon bottles descends new throats. Paris has swept herself, relighted herself. Salons, supers not fraternal, beam once more with suitable effulgence, very singular in colour. The fair Cabarou is come out of prison, wedded to her red gloomy dis, whom they say she treats too loftily. Fair Cabarou gives the most brilliant soirees. Round her is gathered a new republican army of citoyennes in sandals, si devant or other, what remnants, however, of the old grace survive, are rallied there. At her right hand in this cause labours fair Josephine, the widow Bohane, though in straitened circumstances, intent, both of them, to blandish down the grimness of republican austerity and re-civilise mankind. Re-civilise, as of old they were civilised, by witchery of the Orphic fiddle-bow and Euterpian rhythm, by the graces, by the smiles. Thermidorian deputies are there in those soirees, editor Freyron, orator de Peuple, Barra, who has known other dancers than the Carmagnol. Grim generals of the Republic are there in enormous horse-collar neckcloth, good against sabre-cuts, the hair gathered all into one knot, flowing down behind, fixed with a comb. Among which latter do we not recognise once more the little bronzed-complexioned artillery officer of Toulon, home from the Italian wars? Grim enough, of lean, almost cruel aspect, for he has been in trouble, in ill health, also in ill favour as a man promoted, deservingly or not, by the terrorists and Robespierre Jr. But does not Barra know him? Will not Barra speak a word for him? Yes, if at any time it will serve Barra so to do. Somewhat forlorn of fortune for the present stands that artillery officer, looks with those deep earnest eyes of his into a future as waste as the most. Taciturn, yet with the strangest utterances in him, if you awaken him, which smite home like light or lightning. On the whole, rather dangerous? A dissociable man? Dissociable enough, a natural terror and horror to all phantasms being himself of the genus reality. He stands here, without work or outlook in this forsaken manner, glances nevertheless, it would seem, at the kind glance of Josephine Beauharnais, and for the rest with severe countenance, with open eyes and closed lips, waits what will betide. That the balls, therefore, have a new figure this winter, we can see. Not Carmagnols, rude whirlblasts of rage, as Mercier called them, precursors of storm and destruction. No, soft ionic motions, fit for the light sandal and antique Grecian tunic. Efflorescence of luxury has come out, for men have wealth. Nay, you got wealth, and under the terror you durst not dance except in rags. Among the innumerable kinds of balls, let the hasty reader mark only this single one, the kind they call victim balls, baths à victime. The dancers in choice costume have all crepe round the left arm. To be admitted, it needs that you be a victim, that you have lost a relative under the terror. Peace to the dead. Let us dance to their memory. For in all ways one must dance. 
It is very remarkable, according to Mercier, under what varieties of figure this great business of dancing goes on. The women, says he, are nymphs, sultanas, sometimes Minervas, Junos, even Dianas. In light, unerring gyrations they swim there with such earnestness of purpose, with perfect silence, so absorbed are they. What is singular, continues he, the onlookers are, as it were, mingled with the dancers, form, as it were, a circumambient element round the different contra-dancers, yet without deranging them. It is rare, in fact, that a sultana in such circumstances experience the smallest collision. Her pretty foot darts down an inch from mine, she is off again, she is as a flash of light, but soon the measure recalls her to the point she set out from. Like a glittering comet she travels her eclipse, revolving on herself as by double effect of gravitation and attraction. Looking forward a little way into time, the same Mercier discerns merveilleuses in flesh-coloured drawers with gold circlets, mere dancing houris of an artificial Mahomet's paradise, much too Mahomedan. Montgaillard, with his splenetic eye, notes a no less strange thing, that every fashionable citoyenne you meet is in an interesting situation. Good heavens, every... Mere pillows and stuffing, adds the acrid man, such in a time of depopulation by war and guillotine being the fashion. No further seek its merits to disclose. Behold also, instead of the old grim tap doers of Robespierre, what new street groups are these? Young men habited not in black shag Carmagnol Spencer, but in superfine habit carré or Spencer with rectangular tail appended to it, square-tailed coat with elegant anti guillotinish specialty of collar, the hair plaited at the temples and knotted back, long flowing in military wise. Young men of what they call the muscadin or dandy species. Freron in his fondness names them jeunesse dorée, golden or gilt youth. They have come out, these gilt youths, in a kind of resuscitated state. They wear crepe round the left arm, such of them as were victims. More, they carry clubs loaded with lead. In an angry manner, any tapdur or remnant of Jacobinism they may fall out with shall fare the worse. They have suffered much, their friends guillotined, their pleasures, frolics, superfine collars ruthlessly repressed. Where now the base red nightcaps who did it? Fair Cabarou and the army of Greek sandals smile approval. In the Théâtre Fédo, young valour in square-tailed coat eyes beauty in Greek sandals and kindles by her glances. Down with Jacobinism. No Jacobin hymn or demonstration, only Thermidorian ones shall be permitted here. We beat down Jacobinism with clubs loaded with lead. But let anyone who has examined the dandy nature, how petulant it is, especially in the gregarious state, think what an element in sacred rite of insurrection this guilt youth was. Broils and battery, war without truce or measure. Hateful is sanscalotism as death and night. For indeed, is not the dandy calotic habilitary by law of existence a cloth animal, one that lives, moves, and has his being in cloth? So goes it, waltzing, bickering, fair cabaru by orphic witchery struggling to re-civilise mankind. Not unsuccessfully, we hear. What utmost republican grimness can resist Greek sandals in ionic motion, the very toes covered with gold rings? By degrees the indisputablest new politeness rises, grows with vigour. And yet, whether even to this day that inexpressible tone of society known under the old kings, when sin had lost all its deformity, with or without advantage to us, and airy nothing had obtained such a local habitation and establishment as she never had, be recovered? Or even whether it be not lost beyond recovery? Either way, the world must contrive to struggle on. End of Book 7 Chapter 2
The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 7, Vendémia, Chapter 3, Quiberon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 3, Quiberon. But indeed, do not these long flowing hair cues of a jeunesse dorée in semi-military costume betoken, unconsciously, another still more important tendency? The Republic, abhorrent of her guillotine, loves her army. And with cause. For surely, if good fighting be a kind of honour, as it is in its season, and be with the vulgar of men even the chief kind of honour, then here is good fighting, in good season, if there ever was. These sons of the Republic, they rose in mad wrath to deliver her from slavery in Samaria. And have they not done it? Through maritime Alps, through gorges of Pyrenees, through low countries, northward along the Rhine Valley, far is Samaria hurled back from the sacred motherland. Fierce as fire, they have carried her trickler over the faces of all her enemies, over scarped heights, over cannon batteries, down as with the vengeur into the dead deep sea. She has eleven hundred thousand fighters on foot, this republic. At one particular moment she had, or supposed she had, seventeen hundred thousand. Like a ring of lightning, they, volleying and sa-erraring, begirdle her from shore to shore. Sumerian coalition of despots recoils, smitten with astonishment and strange pangs. Such a fire is in these Gaelic Republican men, high-blazing, which no coalition can withstand. Not scutcheons with four degrees of nobility, but seat of all sergeants who have had to clutch generalship out of the cannon's throat. A Pichagru, a Jourdain, a Hoche, lead them on. They have bread, they have iron. With bread and iron you can get to China. See Pichagru's soldiers this hard winter in their looped and windowed destitution, in their straw-rope shoes and cloaks of bass mat, how they overrun Holland like a demon host, the ice having bridged all waters, and rush shouting from victory to victory. Ships in the Texel are taken by hussars on horseback, fled is York, fled is the Stadtholder, glad to escape to England and leave Holland to fraternise. Such a Gaelic fire, we say, blazes in this people, like the conflagration of grass and dry jungle, which no mortal can withstand, for the moment. And even so it will blaze and run, scorching all things, and from Cardiz to Archangel, mad sanscalotism, drilled now into soldiership, led on by some armed soldier of democracy, say that monosyllabic artillery officer, will set its foot cruelly on the neck of its enemies, and its shouting and their shrieking shall fill the world. Rash, coalized king, such a fire ye have kindled, yourselves fireless, your fighters animated only by drill sergeants, messroom moralities, and the drummer's cat. However, it is begun, and will not end, not for a matter of twenty years. So long this Gaelic fire, through its successive changes of colour and character, will blaze over the face of Europe and afflict and scorch all men, till it provoke all men, till it kindle another kind of fire, the Teutonic kind, namely, and be swallowed up, so to speak, in a day. For there is a fire comparable to the burning of dry jungle and grass, most sudden, high blazing, and another fire which we liken to the burning of coal, or even of anthracite coal, difficult to kindle, but then which nothing will put out. The ready Gaelic fire we can remark further, and remark not in Pichagru only, but in innumerable Voltaire, Racine, Laplace, no less for a man whether he fight or sing or think, will remain the same unity of a man, is admirable for roasting eggs in every conceivable sense. The Teutonic anthracite, again, as we see in Luther's, Leibniz's, Shakespeare's, is preferable for smelting metals. How happy is our Europe that has both kinds. But, be this as it may, the Republic is clearly triumphing. 
In the spring of the year, Mint's town again sees itself besieged, will again change master. Did not Merlin the Tionville with wild beard and look say it was not for the last time they saw him there? The elector of Ment circulates amongst his brother potentates this pertinent query. Were it not advisable to treat of peace? Yes, answered many an elector from the bottom of his heart. But on the other hand, Austria hesitates, finally refuses, being subsidied by Pitt. As for Pitt, whoever hesitate, he, suspending his habeas corpus, suspending his cash payments, stands inflexible spite of foreign reverses, spite of domestic obstacles, of Scotch national conventions and English friends of the people, whom he is obliged to arraign, to hang, or even to see acquitted with jubilee, a lean, inflexible man. The majesty of Spain, as we predicted, makes peace. Also the majesty of Prussia, and there is a treaty of Baal. Treaty with black anarchists and regicides. Alas, what help! You cannot hang this anarchy. It is like to hang you. You must needs treat with it. Likewise, General Hoche has even succeeded in pacificating La Vendée. Rogue Rossignol and his infernal columns have vanished. By firmness and justice, by sagacity and industry, General Hoche has done it taking movable columns, not infernal, girdling in the country, pardoning the submissive, cutting down the resistive, limb after limb of the revolt is brought under. La Roche-Jacqueline, last of our nobles, fell in battle. Stoffle himself makes terms. Georges Cadoudal is back to Brittany among his shewens. The frightful gangrene of La Vendée seems veritably extirpated. It has cost, as they reckon in round numbers, the lives of a hundred thousand fellow mortals, with noyardings, conflagratings by infernal column, which defy arithmetic. This is the La Vendée War. Nay, in few months it does burst up once more, but once only, blown upon by Pitt, by our ci devant puisse of Calvados and others. In the month of July, 1795, English ships will ride in Quiberon roads. There will be debarkation of chivalrous sea de vent, of volunteer prisoners of war eager to desert, of firearms, proclamations, clothes chests, royalists and specie. Whereupon also on the Republican side there will be rapid stand to arms with ambuscade marchings by Quiberon beach at midnight, storming of Fort Pontievre, War thunder mingling with the roar of the nightly main and such a morning light as has seldom dawned. Debarkation hurled back into its boats or into the devouring billows with wreck and wail. In one word, a seat of empuisse as totally ineffectual here as he was in Calvados when he rode from Vernon Castle without boots. Again, therefore, it has cost the lives of many a brave man among whom the whole world laments the brave son of Sombroy, ill-fated family. The father and the younger son went to the guillotine. The heroic daughter languishes, reduced to want, hides her woes from history. The elder son perishes here, shot by military tribunal as an emigrant. Hosh himself cannot save him. If all wars, civil and other, are misunderstandings, What a thing must right understanding be. End of Book 7, Chapter 3《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 7, Vendemier Chapter 4, Lion Not Dead This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 7, Chapter 4. Lion Not Dead The convention, born on the tide of fortune towards foreign victory, and driven by the strong wind of public opinion towards clemency and luxury, is rushing fast. All skill of pilotage is needed, and more than all in such a velocity. Curious to see how we veer and whirl, yet must ever whirl round again and scud before the wind. If, on the one hand, we readmit the protesting 73, we, on the other hand, agree to consummate the apotheosis of Marat, 
lift his body from the Cordelia's church and transport it to the pantheon of great men, flinging out Mirabeau to make room for him. To no purpose, so strong blows public opinion. A gilt youthhood in plaited hair tresses tears down his bust from the Théâtre Fédeau, tramples them underfoot, scatters them with vociferation into the cesspool of Montmartre. Swept is his chapel from the Place du Carousel, the cesspool of Montmartre will receive his very dust. Short a godhood had no divine man. Some four months in this pantheon, temple of all the immortals, then to the cesspool, grand cloaca of Paris and the world. His bust at one time amounted to four thousand. Between temple of all the immortals and cloaca of the world, how are poor human creatures world? Furthermore, the question arises, when will the Constitution of 93, of 1793, come into action? Consider it head surmise in all privacy that the Constitution of 93 will never come into action. Let them busy themselves to get ready a better. Or again, where now are the Jacobins? Childless, most decrepit as we saw, sat the mighty mother, gnashing not teeth but empty gums against a traitorous Thermidorian convention and the current of things. Twice were Billot, Collot and company accused in convention by a Lacointre, by a Legendre, and the second time it was not voted calumnious. Billot from the Jacobin Tribune says, The lion is not dead, he is only sleeping. They ask him in convention what he means by the awakening of the lion. And bickerings of an extensive sort arose in the Palais Egalité between Tapdur and the gilt youthhood, cries of down with the Jacobins, the Jacoquin, coquin meaning scoundrel. The tribune in mid-air gave battle sound, answered only by silence and uncertain gasps. Talk was in government committees of suspending the Jacobin sessions. Hark, there, it is in All Hallows' time, or on the Hallow Eve itself, month ci devant November, year once named of grace, 1794, sad eve for Jacobinism, volley of stones dashing through our windows with jingle and execration. The female Jacobins, famed tricoteurses with knitting needles, take flight, are met at the doors by a gilt youthhood and mob of four thousand persons are hooted, flouted, hustled, fustigated in a scandalous manner, cotillons, retrousse, and vanish in mere hysterics. Sally out, ye male Jacobins! The male Jacobins sally out, but only to battle, disaster, and confusion. So that armed authority has to intervene, and again on the morrow to intervene, and suspend the Jacobin sessions forever and a day. Gone are the Jacobins, into invisibility, in a storm of laughter and howls. Their place is made a normal school, the first of the kind seen. It then vanishes into a market of Thermidor Ninth, into a market of Saint Honore, where is now peaceable chaffering for poultry and greens. The solemn temples, the great globe itself, the baseless fabric. Are not we such stuff, we in this world of ours, as dreams are made of? Maximum being abrogated, trade was to take its own free course. Alas, trade, shackled, topsy-turvied in the way we saw, and now suddenly let go again, can for the present take no course at all, but only reel and stagger. There is, so to speak, no trade whatever for the time being. Assignats, long sinking, emitted in such quantities, sink now with an alacrity beyond parallel. Combien, said one to a hackney coachman, what fare? Six thousand livres, answered he, some three hundred pounds sterling in paper money. Pressure of maximum withdrawn, the things it compressed likewise withdraw. Two ounces of bread per day in the modicum allotted, wide waving, doleful are the baker's queues. Farmers' houses are becoming pawnbrokers' shops. One can imagine in these circumstances with what humour sanscalotism growled in its throat, la cabaru, beheld Cidavon returned dancing, the thermidor effulgence of re-civilisation and balls in flesh-coloured drawers. 
Greek tunics and sandals, hosts of muscadans parading with their clubs loaded with lead, and we here, cast out, abhorred, picking offal from the street, agitating in baker's queue for our two ounces of bread? Will the Jacobin lion, which they say is meeting secretly at the Archevêche in Bonnet Rouge with loaded pistols, not awaken? Seemingly not. Our Colo, our Biu, Barrer, Vadier, in these last days of March 1795, are found worthy of deportation, of banishment beyond seas, and shall for the present be trundled off to the castle of Ham. The lion is dead, or writhing in death throes. Behold, accordingly, on the day they call 12th of Germinal, which is also called 1st of April, not a lucky day, how lively are these streets of Paris once more? Floods of hungry women, of squalid hungry men, ejaculating, Bread! Bread! And the Constitution of 93! Paris has risen, once again, like the ocean tide, is flowing towards the Tuileries for bread and a Constitution. Tuileries sentries do their best, but it serves not. The ocean tide sweeps them away, inundates the convention hall itself, howling bread and the constitution. Unhappy senators, unhappy people, there is yet, after all toils and broils, no bread, no constitution. Du pain, partant de long discours, bread, not bursts of parliamentary eloquence, so wailed the menads of my yard five years ago and more, so wail ye to this hour. The convention, with unalterable countenance, with what thought one knows not, keeps its seat in this waste-howling chaos, rings its storm-bell from the pavilion of unity, section Le Pelletier, old fille Saint-Thomas, who are of the money-changing species. These and guilt youthhood fly to the rescue, sweep chaos forth again with levelled bayonets. Paris is declared in a state of siege. Pichegru conqueror of Holland, who happens to be here, is named Commandant till the disturbance end. He, in one day, so to speak, ends it. He accomplishes the transfer of Billot, Collot and company, dissipating all opposition by two cannon shots, blank cannon shots, and the terror of his name, and thereupon announcing, with a laconicism which should be imitated, Representatives, your decrees are executed, lays down his commandantship. This revolt of germinal, therefore, has passed like a vain cry. The prisoners rest safe in ham, waiting for ships. Some 900 chief terrorists of Paris are disarmed. Sans calotism, swept forth with bayonets, has vanished with its misery to the bottom of Saint-Antoine and saint marceau Time was when Ashamayad with menades could alter the course of legislation, but that time is not. Legislation seems to have got bayonets. Section Le Pelletier takes its firelock, not for us. We retire to our dark dens. Our cry of hunger is called a plot of pit. The saloons glitter, the flesh-coloured drawers gyrate as before. It was for the Cabaru then and her muscadans and money changes that we fought? It was for balls in flesh-coloured drawers that we took feudalism by the beard and did and dared shedding our blood like water. Expressive silence, muse thou their praise. End of Book 7, Chapter 4《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine Book 7. Von Damier. Chapter 5. Lion Sprawling Its Last. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7. Chapter 5. Lion Sprawling Its Last. Representative Carrier went to the guillotine in December last, protesting that he acted by orders. The revolutionary tribunal, after all it has devoured, has now only, as anarchic things do, to devour itself. In the early days of May, men see a remarkable thing. Fouquier Tanville pleading at the bar once his own. He and his chief juryman, Loire, August 10th, juryman Villat, a batch of sixteen, pleading hard, protesting that they acted by orders. 
but pleading in vain. Thus men break the axe with which they have done hateful things, the axe itself having grown hateful. For the rest, Fouquier died hard enough. Where are thy batches? howled the people. Hungry can I, asked Fouquier, is thy bread cheaper, wanting them? Remarkable Fouquier, once but as other attorneys and law beagles which hunt ravenous on this earth, a well-known faces of human nature, and now thou art and remainest the most remarkable attorney that ever lived and hunted in the upper air. For in this terrestrial course of time there was to be an avatar of attorneyism, the heavens had said, let there be an incarnation, not divine, of the venetry attorney spirit which keeps its eye on the bond only. And lo, this was it, and they have attorneyed it in its turn. Vanish then, thou rat-eyed incarnation of attorneyism, who at bottom wert but as other attorneys and two hungry sons of Adam. Juryman Vallat had striven hard for life and published from his prison an ingenious book not unknown to us, but it would not stead. He also had to vanish, and this his book of the secret causes of Thermidor, full of lies with particles of truth in it undiscoverable otherwise, is all that remains of him. Revolutionary Tribunal has done, but vengeance has not done. Representative Le Bon, after long struggling, is handed over to the ordinary law courts and by them guillotined. Nay, at Lyon and elsewhere, resuscitated moderatism in its vengeance will not wait the slow process of law, but bursts into the prisons, sets fire to the prisons, burns some three score imprisoned Jacobins to dire death, or chokes them with the smoke of straw. There go vengeful, truculent companies of Jesus, companies of the sun, slaying Jacobinism wherever they meet with it flinging it into the Rhone stream, which once more bears seaward a horrid cargo. Whereupon, at Toulon, Jacobinism rises in revolt, and is like to hang the national representatives. With such action and reaction, is not a poor national convention hard bested? It is like the settlement of winds and waters, of seas long tornado beaten, and goes on with jumble and with jangle. Now flung aloft, now sunk in trough of the sea, your vessel of the Republic has need of all pilotage and more. What Parliament that ever sat under the moon had such a series of destinies as this National Convention of France? It came together to make the Constitution, and instead of that it has had to make nothing but destruction and confusion, to burn up Catholicisms, aristocratisms, to worship reason and dig salt Peter, to fight titanically with itself and with the whole world. A convention decimated by the guillotine, above the tenth man has bowed his neck to the axe, which has seen Carmagnols danced before it, and patriotic strophes sung amid church spoils, the wounded of the 10th of August defile in handbarrows, and in the pandemonial midnight, Egalite's dams of tricolor drink lemonade, and spectrum of C.A. Mount saying, Death sans phrase. A convention which has effervesced and which has congealed, which has been red with rage and also pale with rage, sitting with pistols in its pocket, drawing sword in a moment of effervescence, now storming to the four winds through a Danton voice, Awake, O France, and smite the tyrants, now frozen mute under its robes Pierre, and answering his dirge voice by a dubious gasp, assassinated, decimated, stabbed at, shot at, in baths, on streets and staircases, which has been the nucleus of chaos, has it not heard the chimes at midnight? It has deliberated, beset by a hundred thousand armed men with artillery furnaces and provision carts. It has been betoxened, bestormed, overflooded by black deluges of sanscalotism, and has heard the shrill cry, Bread and soap! For as we say, it's the nucleus of chaos. It sat as the centre of sanscalotism and had spread its pavilion on the waist deep where is neither path nor landmark, neither bottom nor shore. In intrinsic valour, 
ingenuity, fidelity and general force and manhood, it has perhaps not far surpassed the average of parliaments, but in frankness of purpose, in singularity of position, it seeks its fellow. One other sanscalotic submersion, or at most two, and this wearied vessel of a convention reaches land. Revolt of Germinal Twelfth ended as a vain cry. Moribund sanscalotism was swept back into invisibility. There it has lain moaning these six weeks, moaning and also scheming. Jacobins disarmed, flung forth from their tribune in mid-air, must needs try to help themselves in secret conclave underground. Lo, therefore, on the first day of the month prairial, 20th of May, 1795, sound of the general once more, beating sharp or antan, to arms, to arms. Since galottism has risen yet again from its death lair, waste wild flowing as the unfruitful sea. Saint Antoine is afoot, bred in the constitution of 93, so sounds it, so stands it written with chalk on the hats of men. They have their pikes, their firelocks, paper of grievances, standards, printed proclamation, drawn up in quite official manner, considering this and also considering that they, a much enduring sovereign people, are in insurrection, will have bread in the constitution of 93. And so the barriers are seized and the general beats and the toxins discourse discord. Black deluges overflow the Tuileries. Spite of centuries, the sanctuary itself is invaded. Enter to our order of the day a torrent of dishevelled women wailing, Bread! Bread! President may well cover himself and have his own toxin rung in the pavilion of unity. The ship of the state again labours and leaks, overwashed near to swamping with unfruitful brine. What a day once more. Women are driven out, men storm irresistibly in, choke all corridors, thunder at all gates. Deputies putting forth head, obtest, conjure. Saint Antoine rages, bread and constitution. Report has risen that the convention is assassinating the women, crushing and rushing, clangor and furor. The oak doors have become as oak tambourines sounding under the axe of Saint Antoine. Plasterwork crackles, woodwork booms and jingles, doors start up, bursts in Saint Antoine with frenzy and vociferation. Rag standards, printed proclamation, drum music, astonishment to eye and ear. Gendarmes, loyal sectioners, charge through the other door. They are recharged, musketry exploding. Saint Antoine cannot be expelled. Obtesting deputies obtest vainly. Respect the president, approach not the president. Deputy Pharaoh stretching out his hands, bearing his bosom scarred in the Spanish wars, obtests vainly, threatens and resists vainly. Rebellious deputy of the sovereign, if thou have fought, have not we too? We have no bread, no constitution. They wrench poor Pharaoh, they tumble him, trample him, wrath waxing to see itself work. They drag him into the corridor, dead or near it, sever his head and fix it on a pike. Ah, did an unexampled convention want this variety of destiny too, then? Pharaoh's bloody head goes on a pike. Such a game has begun. Paris and the earth may wait how it will end. And so it billows free through all corridors, within and without, far as the eye reaches, nothing but bedlam and the great deep broken loose. President Boissy Danglars sits like a rock. The rest of the convention is floated to the upper benches, sectioners and gendarmes still ranking there to form a kind of wall for them. And insurrection rages, rolls its drums, will read its paper of grievances, will have this decreed, will have that. Covered sits President Boissy, unyielding like a rock in the beating of seas. They menace him, level muskets at him. He yields not. They hold up Pharaoh's bloody head to him. With grave, stern air he bows to it and yields not. And the paper of grievances cannot get itself read for uproar and the drums roll and the throats bawl and insurrection like sphere music is inaudible for very noise. 
decree us this, decree us that. One man we discern bawling for the space of an hour at all intervals. Je demande l'arrestation des coquins et des lâches. Really one of the most comprehensive petitions ever put up, which indeed to this hour includes all that you can reasonably ask, constitution of the year one, rotten borough, ballot box or other miraculous political arc of the covenant to do for you to the end of the world. I also demand arrestment of the knaves and dastards and nothing more whatever. National representation, deluged with black sense galottism, glides out for help elsewhere, for safety elsewhere. Here is no help. About four in the afternoon, there remain hardly more than some sixty members, mere friends or even secret leaders, a remnant of the mountain crest, held in silence by Thermidorian thraldom. Now is the time for them, now or never let them descend and speak. They descend, these sixty, invited by Sanscolotism. Rom of the new calendar, rule of the sacred file, Goujon, Dusconoy, Subrani and the rest. Glad Sanscolotism forms a ring for them, Rom takes the president's chair. They begin resolving and decreeing. Fast enough now comes decree after decree in alternate brief strains or strophe and antistrophe. What will cheapen bread? What will awaken the dormant lion? And at every new decree, Sanscolotism shouts, decreed, decreed, and rolls its drums. Fast enough, the work of months in hours, when, see, a figure enters, whom in the lamplight we recognise to be Legendre, and utters words fit to be hissed out. And then C, section Le Pelletier or other Muscadan section enters, and guilt youth with levelled bayonets, countenances screwed to the sticking place. Tramp, tramp, with bayonets gleaming in the lamplight. What can one do, worn down with long riot, grown heartless, dark, hungry, but roll back, but rush back, and escape who can? The very windows need to be thrown up, that sanscolotism may escape fast enough. Money changer sections and guilt youth sweep them forth with steel besom far into the depths of Saint Antoine. Triumph once more. The decrees of that sixty are not so much as rescinded, they are declared null and non extant. Rom, Rule, Goujon, and the ringleaders, some thirteen in all, are decreed accused. Permanent session ends at three in the morning. Saint Scolotism, once more flung resupine, lies sprawling sprawling its last. Such was the first of Prairial, 20th of May, 1795. Second and third of Prairial, during which Sanscolotism still sprawled and unexpectedly rang its toxin and assembled in arms, availed Sanscolotism nothing. What though, with our roms and rules accused but not yet arrested, we make a new, true national convention of our own over in the East, and put the others out of law? What though we rank in arms and march, armed force and musket in section, some 30,000 men, environ that old false convention? We can but bully one another, banding nicknames, muscadins against blood drinkers, buveur de sang. Pharaoh's assassin, taken with the red hand and sentenced and now near to guillotine and plus the grave, is retaken, is carried back into Saint Antoine to no purpose. Convention sectionaries and guilt youth come, according to decree, to seek him, nay, to disarm Saint Antoine. And they do disarm it by rolling of cannon, by springing upon enemies' cannon, by military audacity and terror of the law. Saint Antoine surrenders its arms, Saint even advising it, anxious for life and brew house. Pharaoh's assassin flings himself from a high roof, and all is lost. Discerning which things, old Rule shot a pistol through his old white head, dashed his life in pieces as he had done the sacred file of Reims. Rom, Goujon, and the others stand ranked before a swiftly appointed, swift military tribunal. Hearing the sentence, Goujon drew a knife, struck it into his breast, passed it to his neighbour Rom, and fell dead. Rom did the like, and another all but did it, Roman death rushing on there as an electric chain before your bailiffs could intervene. The guillotine had the rest. 
They were the Ultimi Romanorum. B.O., Colo and company are now ordered to be tried for life, but are found to be already off, shipped for Sinamari and the hot mud of Suriname. There let B.O. surround himself with the flocks of tame parrots. Colo take the yellow fever, and drinking a whole bottle of brandy, burn up his entrails. Sanscalotism sprawls no more. The dormant lion has become a dead one. And now, as we see, any hoof may smite him. End of Book 7, Chapter 5《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 7, Von Damier, Chapter 6, Grilled Herrings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 6, Grilled Herrings. So dies Sanscalotism, the body of Sanscalotism, or is changed, its ragged, Pythian, Carmagnol dance has transformed itself into a pyrrhic, into a dance of Kabaru balls. Sanscalotism is dead, extinguished by new isms of that kind which were its own natural progeny, and is buried, we may say, with such deafening jubilation and disharmony of funeral knell on their part that only after some half-century or so does one begin to learn clearly why it ever was alive. And yet a meaning lay in it. Sanscalotism verily was alive, a new birth of time. Nay, it still lives, and is not dead, but changed. The soul of it still lives, still works, far and wide, through one bodily shape into another, less amorphous, as is the way of cunning time with his new births, till, in some perfected shape, it embraced the whole circuit of the world. For the wise man may now everywhere discern that he must found on his manhood not on the garniture of his manhood. He who, in these epochs of our Europe, founds on garniture, formulas, calotisms of what sort soever, is founding on old cloth and sheepskin, and cannot endure. But as for the body of sans calotism, that is dead and buried, and one hopes need not reappear, in primary amorphous shape, for another thousand years. It was the frightfullest thing ever born of time, one of the frightfullest. This convention, now grown anti-Jacobin, did, with an eye to justify and fortify itself, publish lists of what the reign of terror had perpetrated, lists of persons guillotined. The lists, cries splenetic Abbe Montgaillard, were not complete. They contained the names of how many persons, thinks the reader? Two thousand, all but a few. There were above four thousand, cries Montgaillard. So many were guillotined, fusilladed, noyaded, done to dire death, of whom nine hundred were women. It is a horrible sum of human lives, Monsieur l'Abbé. Some ten times as many shot rightly on a field of battle, and one might have had his glorious victory with T. Diem. It is not far from the two hundredth part of what perished in the entire Seven Years' War by which seven years' war did not the great Fritz wrench Silesia from the great Theresa and a pompadour stung by epigrams satisfy herself that she could not be an Agnes Sorel? The head of man is a strange vacant sounding shell, Monsieur l'Abbé, and studies cocker to small purpose. But what if history, somewhere on this planet, were to hear of a nation, the third soul of whom had not for thirty weeks each year as many third-rate potatoes as would sustain him. History in that case feels bound to consider that starvation is starvation, that starvation from age to age presupposes much. History ventures to assert that the French sans calotte of ninety-three, who, roused from long death sleep, could rush at once to the frontiers and die fighting for an immortal hope and faith of deliverance for him and his, was but the second miserablest of men. The Irish sans potato, had he not senses then, nay, a soul? In his frozen darkness it was bitter for him to die famishing, bitter to see his children famish. 
It was better for him to be a beggar, a liar and a knave. Nay, if that dreary Greenland wind of benighted want, perennial from sire to son, had frozen him into a kind of torpor and numb callosity, so that he saw not, felt not, was not, for a creature with a soul in it, some assuagement, or the cruelest wretchedness of all. Such things were, such things are, and they go on in silence, peaceably, and Sanscolotisms follow them. History looking back over this France through long times, back to Turgot's time, for instance, when dumb drudgery staggered up to its king's palace and in wide expanse of sallow faces, squalor and winged raggedness presented hieroglyphically its petition of grievances and for answer got hanged on a new gallows forty feet high, confesses mournfully that there is no period to be met with in which the general twenty-five millions of France suffered less than in this period which they name Reign of Terror. But it was not the dumb millions that suffered here, it was the speaking thousands and hundreds and units who shrieked and published and made the world ring with their wail as they could and should, that is the grand peculiarity. The frightfullest births of time are never the loud speaking ones, for these soon die. They are the silent ones which can live from century to century. Anarchy, hateful as death, is abhorrent to the whole nature of man and must itself soon die. Wherefore, let all men know what of depth and of height is still revealed in man, and with fear and wonder, with just sympathy and just antipathy, with clear eye and open heart, contemplate it and appropriate it, and draw innumerable inferences from it. This inference, for example, among the first, that if the gods of this lower world will sit on their glittering thrones, indolent as Epicurus as gods, with a living chaos of ignorance and hunger weltering uncared for at their feet, and smooth parasites preaching peace, peace, when there is no peace, then the dark chaos, it would seem, will rise, has risen, And, oh heavens, has it not tanned their skins into breeches for itself? That there be no second Sanscolotism in our earth for a thousand years, let us understand well what the first was, and let rich and poor of us go and do otherwise. But to our tale. The musket in sections greatly rejoice. Garbaroo balls gyrate. The well-nigh insoluble problem, republic without anarchy, have we not solved it? Law of fraternity or death is gone. Chimerical, obtain who need, has become practical, hold who have. To anarchic republic of the poverties, there has succeeded orderly republic of the luxuries, which will continue as long as it can. On the Pont au Change, on the Place de Grève, in long sheds, Mercier, in these summer evenings, saw working men at their repast. One's allotment of daily bread has sunk to an ounce and a half. Plates containing each three grilled herrings, sprinkled with shorn onions, wetted with a little vinegar. To this add some morsel of boiled prunes and lentils swimming in a clear sauce. At these frugal tables, the cook's gridiron hissing nearby and the pot simmering on a fire between two stones, I have seen them ranged by the hundred, consuming without bread their scant messes, far too moderate for the keenness of their appetite and the extent of their stomach. Sane water rushing plenteous by will supply the deficiency. O man of toil! Thy struggling and thy daring, these six long years of insurrection and tribulation, thou hast profited nothing by it then? Thou consumest thy herring and water in the blessed gold-red evening. Oh, why was the earth so beautiful, becrimsoned with dawn and twilight, if man's dealings with man were to make it a veil of scarcity, of tears, not even soft tears? destroying of Bastilles, discomforting of Brunswick's, fronting of principalities and powers, of earth and Tophet, all that thou hast dared and endured, it was for a republic of the Cabaru saloons. Patience, thou must have patience. The end is not yet. End of Book 7, Chapter 6
The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 3, The Guillotine. Book 7, Von Damier. Chapter 7, The Whiff of Grapeshot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 7, The Whiff of Grapeshot. In fact, what can be more natural, one may say inevitable as a post sanscolotic transitionary state, than even this? Confused wreck of a republic of the poverties which ended in reign of terror is arranging itself into such composure as it can. Evangel of Jean Jacques and most other evangels becoming incredible, what is there for it but return to the old evangel of Mammon? Contra social is true or untrue, brotherhood is brotherhood or death, but money always will buy money's worth. In the wreck of human dubitations, this remains indubitable, that pleasure is pleasant. Aristocracy of feudal parchment has passed away with a mighty rushing, and now by a natural course we arrive at aristocracy of the money bag. It is the course through which all European societies are at this hour travelling. Apparently a still baser sort of aristocracy, an infinitely baser, the basest yet known. In which, however, there is this advantage that, like anarchy itself, it cannot continue. Hast thou considered how thought is stronger than artillery parks, and were it fifty years after death and martyrdom, or were it two thousand years, rights and unrights, acts of parliament, removes mountains, models the world like soft clay? Also how the beginning of all thought worth the name is love, and the wise head never yet was without first the generous heart. The heavens cease not their bounty, they send us generous hearts into every generation. And now what generous heart can pretend to itself or be hoodwinked into believing that loyalty to the money bag is a noble loyalty? Mammon, cries the generous heart, out of all ages and countries, is the basest of known gods, even of known devils. In him what glory is there that ye should worship him? No glory discernible, not even terror, at best detestability, ill-matched with despicability. Generous hearts discerning on this hand, widespread wretchedness, dark without and within, moistening its ounce and half of bread with tears, and on that hand mere balls in flesh-coloured drawers, and inane or foul glitter of such sort, cannot but ejaculate, cannot but announce, too much, O divine mammon, somewhat too much. The voice of these, once announcing itself, carries fiat and periat in it, for all things here below. Meanwhile, we will hate anarchy as death, which it is, and the things worse than anarchy should be hated more. Surely peace alone is fruitful. Anarchy is destruction, a burning up, say, of shams and insupportabilities, but which leaves vacancy behind. Know this also, that out of a world of unwise nothing but an unwisdom can be made, Arrange it, constitution, build it, sift it through ballot boxes as thou wilt. It is and remains an unwisdom. The new prey of new quacks and unclean things, the latter end of it slightly better than the beginning. Who can bring a wise thing out of men unwise? Not one. And so, vacancy and general abolition having come for this France, what can anarchy do more? Let there be order. Were it under the soldier's sword, let there be peace, that the bounty of the heavens be not spilt, that what of wisdom they do send us bring fruit in its season. It remains to be seen how the quellers of Sanscolotism were themselves quelled, and sacred right of insurrection was blown away by gunpowder, wherewith this singular eventful history, called French Revolution, ends. The Convention driven such a course by wild wind, wild tide and steerage and non-steerage these three years, has become weary of its own existence, sees all men weary of it, and wishes heartily to finish. 
to the last it has to strive with contradictions. It is now getting fast ready with a constitution, yet knows no peace. C.A., we say, is making the constitution once more, has as good as made it. Warned by experience, the great architect alters much, admits much. Distinction of active and passive citizen, that is, money qualification for electors. Nay, two chambers, Council of the Ancients as well as Council of Five Hundred. To that conclusion have we come. In a like spirit, eschewing that fatal self-denying ordinance of your old constituents, we enact not only that actual convention members are re-eligible, but that two-thirds of them must be re-elected. The active citizen electors shall for this time have free choice of only one-third of their National Assembly. Such enactment of two-thirds to be re-elected, we append to our Constitution, we submit our Constitution to the townships of France and say, accept both or reject both. Unsavoury as this appendix may be, the townships by overwhelming majority accept and ratify with directory of five, with two good chambers, double majority of them nominated by ourselves, one hopes this constitution may prove final. March it will, for the legs of it, the re-elected two-thirds, are already there, able to march. C.A. looks at his paper fabric with just pride. But now see how the contumacious sections, Le Palettier foremost, kick against the pricks, Is it not manifest infraction of one's elective franchise, rights of man and sovereignty of the people, this appendix of re-electing your two-thirds? Greedy tyrants who would perpetuate yourselves. For the truth is, victory over Saint Antoine and long right of insurrection has spoiled these men, nay, spoiled all men. Consider too how each man was free to hope what he liked, and now there is to be no hope. There is to be fruition, fruition of this. In men spoiled by long right of insurrection, what confused ferments will rise, tongues once begun wagging. Journalists declaim, your lacretelles, le harp, orators spout. There is royalism traceable in it, and Jacobinism. On the west frontier, in deep secrecy, Pichegru, durst he trust his army, is treating with Condé. In these sections there spout wolves in sheep's clothing, masked emigrants and royalists. All men, as we say, had hoped each that the election would do something for his own side, and now there is no election, or only the third of one. Black is united with white against this clause of the two-thirds, all the unruly of France who see their trade thereby near ending. Section Le Palettier, after addresses enough, finds that such clause is a manifest infraction, that it, Le Palettier, for one, will simply not conform thereto, and invites all other free sections to join it, in central committee, in resistance to oppression. The sections join it, nearly all, strong with their 40,000 fighting men. The convention, therefore, may look to itself, Le Pelletier, on this twelfth day of Vendémiaire, 4th of October, 1795, is sitting in open contravention in its convent of Fille Saint Thomas, Rue Vivienne, with guns primed. The convention has some 5,000 regular troops at hand, generals in abundance, and a 1,500 of miscellaneous persecuted ultra-Jacobins, whom in this crisis it has hastily got together and armed under the title Patriots of 89. Strong in law, it sends its General Menu to disarm Le Pelletier. General Menu marches accordingly with due summons and demonstration, with no result. General Menu, about eight in the evening, finds that he is standing ranked in the Rue Vivienne, emitting vain summonses, with primed guns pointed out of every window at him, and that he cannot disarm Le Pelletier. He has to return, with whole skin, but without success, and be thrown into arrest as a traitor. Whereupon the whole forty thousand join this Le Palettier, which cannot be vanquished. To what hand shall a quaking convention now turn? Our poor convention, after such voyaging, just entering harbour, so to speak, has struck on the bar. 
and labours there frightfully, with breakers roaring round it, forty thousand of them like to wash it in its sea cargo and the whole future of France into the deep. Yet one last time it struggles ready to perish. Some call for Barard to be made commandant. He conquered in Thermidor. Some, what is more to the purpose, bethink them of the citizen Bonaparte, unemployed artillery officer who took too long. A man of head, a man of action. Barra is named Commandant's cloak. This young artillery officer is named Commandant. He was in the gallery at the moment and heard it. He withdrew some half hour to consider with himself. After a half hour of grim, compressed considering, to be or not to be, he answers yea. And now, a man of head being at the centre of it, the whole matter gets vital. Swift to camp of Sabion to secure the artillery. There are not twenty men guarding it. A swift adjutant, Murat is the name of him, gallops, gets thither some minutes within time, for Le Pelletier was also on march that way. The cannon are ours. And now beset this post and beset that, rapid and firm. That wicket of the Louvre, in cul-de-sac Dauphin, in Rue Saint-Honoré, from Pont Neuf all along the North Quays, southward to Pont C. Devant Royal, rank round the sanctuary of the Tuileries, a ring of steel discipline, let every gunner have his match burning, and all men stand to their arms. Thus there is permanent session through night, and thus at sunrise on the morrow there is seen sacred insurrection once again, vessel of state labouring on the bar, and tumultuous sea all round her, beating general, arming and sounding, not ringing toxin, for we have left no toxin but our own in the pavilion of unity. It is an imminence of shipwreck for the whole world to gaze at. Frightfully she labours that poor ship, within cable length of port, huge peril for her. However, she has a man at the helm. Insurgent messages received and not received, messenger admitted blindfolded, counsel and counter-counsel, the poor ship labours. Von Damier, 13th, year 4. Curious enough, of all days, it is the 5th day of October, anniversary of that Menad march six years ago, by sacred right of insurrection. We are got this far. Le Pelletier has seized the Church of Saint Roche, has seized the Pont Neuf, our picket there retreating without fire. Stray shots fall from Le Pelletier, rattle down on the very Tuileries staircase. On the other hand, women advance dishevelled, shrieking, Peace! Le Pelletier behind them, waving its hat in sign that we shall fraternise. Steady! The artillery officer is steady as bronze, can be quick as lightning. He sends 800 muskets with ball cartridges to the convention itself. Honourable members shall act with these in case of extremity, whereat they look grave enough. Four of the afternoon is struck. Le Pelletier, making nothing by messengers, by fraternity or hat-waving, bursts out along the southern Quai Voltaire, along streets and passages, treble quick, in huge, veritable onslaught. Whereupon, thou bronze artillery officer, fire, say the bronze lips. Roar and again roar, continual, volcano-like, goes his great gun in the cul-de-sac Dauphin against the church of Saint Roche, go his great guns on the Pont Royal, go all his great guns, blow to air some two hundred men, mainly about the church of Saint Roche. Le Pelletier cannot stand such horseplay, no sectioner can stand it, the forty thousand yield on all sides, scour towards covert. Some hundred or so of them gathered by the Théâtre de la République, but, says he, a few shells dislodged them. It was all finished at six. The ship is over the bar then. Free, she bounds shoreward, amid shouting and vivat. Citoyen Bonaparte is named General of the Interior by acclamation. Quelled sections have to disarm in such humour as they may. Sacred right of insurrection is gone forever. The CA constitution can disembark itself and begin marching. The miraculous convention ship has got to land. 
and is there, shall we figuratively say, changed, as epic ships are wont, into a kind of sea nymph, never to sail more, to roam the waste azure, a miracle in history. It is false, says Napoleon, that we fired first with blank charge. It had been a waste of life to do that. Most false. The firing was with sharp and sharpest shot. To all men it was plain that here was no sport. The rabbits and plinths of St. Roche Church show splintered by it to this hour. Singular. In old Brolier's time, six years ago, this whiff of grape-shot was promised, but it could not be given then, could not have profited then. Now, however, the time is come for it, and the man. And behold, you have it. And the thing we specifically call French Revolution is blown into space by it, and become a thing that was. End of Book 7, Chapter 7The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3, The Guillotine, Book 7, Vendemier, Chapter 8, Finis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 7, Chapter 8, Finis. Homer's epos, it is remarked, is like a bas-relief sculpture. It does not conclude, but merely ceases. Such, indeed, is the epos of universal history itself. Directorates, consulates, emperorships, restorations, citizen kingships succeed this business in due series, in due genesis one out of the other. Nevertheless, the first parent of all these may be said to have gone to air in the way we see. A babouf insurrection next year will die in the birth, stifled by the soldiery. A senate, if tinged with royalism, can be purged by the soldiery, and an eighteenth of Fructidor transacted by the mere show of bayonets. Nay, soldiers' bayonets can be used a posteriori on a senate, and make it leap out of windows, still bloodless, and produce an eighteenth of Brumaire. Such changes must happen, but they are managed by intriguings, cabalings, and then by orderly word of command, almost like mere changes of ministry not in general by sacred right of insurrection, but by milder methods, growing ever milder, shall the events of French history be henceforth brought to pass. It is admitted that this directorate, which owned at its starting these three things, an old table, a sheet of paper and an ink bottle, and no visible money or arrangement whatever, did wonders, that France, since the reign of terror, hushed itself, has been a new France, awakened like a giant out of torpor, and has gone on in the internal life of it with continual progress. As for the external form and forms of life, what can we say except that out of the eater there comes strength, out of the unwise there comes not wisdom? Shams are burnt up, nay, what as yet is the peculiarity of France, the very cant of them is burnt up. The new realities are not yet come. I know, only phantasms, paper models, tentative prefigurements of such. In France there are now four million landed properties. That black portent of an agrarian law is, as it were, realised. What is still stranger, we understand all Frenchmen have the right of duel, the hackney coachman with the peer, if insult be given, such is the law of public opinion. Equality, at least in death. The form of government is by citizen king, frequently shot at, not yet shot. On the whole, therefore, has it not been fulfilled what was prophesied, ex post facto indeed, by the archquack Cagliostro or another? He, as he looked in rapt vision and amazement into these things, thus spake, Ah, what is this? Angels, Uriel, Anarchiel, and the other five, Pentagon of rejuvenescence, power that destroyed original sin, earth, heaven, and thou outer limbo which men name hell. Dost the empire of imposture waver? Burst there in starry sheen updarting, light rays from out its dark foundations as it rocks and heaves, not in travail throes, but in death throes. 
Yea, light rays piercing clear that salute the heavens. Lo, they kindle it, their starry clearness becomes as red hellfire. Imposture is in flames, imposture is burnt up. One red sea of fire, wild billowing, enwraps the world. With its fire tongue licks at the very stars. Thrones are hurled into it, and Dubois mitres, and prebendal stalls that drop fatness, and ha, what see I, all the gigs of creation, all, all. Woe is me, never since Pharaoh's chariots in the Red Sea of Water was there wreck of wheel vehicles like this in the Sea of Fire, desolate as ashes, as gases shall they wander in the wind. Higher, higher, yet flames the fire sea, crackling with new dislocated timber, hissing with leather and prunella. The metal images are molten, the marble images become mortar lime, the stone mountains sulkily explode, respectability with all her collected gigs inflamed for funeral pyre, wailing leaves the earth, not to return save under a new avatar. Imposture, how it burns through generations, how it is burnt up for a time. The world is black ashes, which, ah, when will they grow green? The images all run into amorphous Corinthian brass, all dwellings of men destroyed, the very mountains peeled and riven, the valleys black and dead. It is an empty world. Woe to them that shall be born then. A king, a queen, ah me, were hurled in, did rustle once, flew aloft, crackling like paper scroll. Iscariot Egalite was hurled in, thou grim Delaunay with thy grim Bastille. Whole kindreds and peoples, five millions of mutually destroying men. For it is the end of the dominion of imposture, which is darkness and opaque fire damp, and the burning up with unquenchable fire of all the gigs that are in the earth. This prophecy, we say, has it not been fulfilled? Is it not fulfilling? And so here, O oh reader, has the time come for us to depart. Toilsome was our journeying together not without offence, but it is done. To me thou wert as a beloved shade, the disembodied or not yet embodied spirit of a brother. To thee I was but as a voice. It was our relation a kind of sacred one, doubt not that. Whatsoever once sacred things become hollow jargons, yet while the voice of man speaks with man, Hast thou not there the living fountain out of which all sacrednesses sprang and will yet spring? Man, by the nature of him, is definable as an incarnated word. Ill stands it with me if I have spoken falsely. Thine also it was to hear truly. Farewell. End of Book 7, Chapter 8 End of The French Revolution, A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 3